Uh, we're going to begin with the recitation of the Quran, uh, just to remind us about Allah Subhanahu wa Taala's words, uh, and that's how we're going to be starting this event, inshallah. I will be reciting some ayat or some verses from uh, chapter number 31, uh, Surah Luqman, uh, and these verses are going to be talking about the advice that Luqman gave to his son, um, and Luqman. The scholars differ about who he was. Some say that he was a prophet. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about him as a wise person. Uh, so inshallah, I will begin with the Arabic and then translate it in English. A'udhu billahi minash shaytanir rajeem Bismillahir rahmanir rahim وَلَقَدْ آتَيْنَا لُقْمَانَ الْحِكْمَةَ أَنِشْكُرْ لِلَّهِ وَمَنْ يَشْكُرْ فَإِنَّمَا يَشْكُرُ لِنَفْسِهِ وَمَنْ كَفَرَ فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ غَنِيٌّ حَمِيدٌ وَإِذْ قَالَ لُقْمَانُ لِبْنِهِ وَهُوَ يَعِذُهُ يَا بُنَيَّ لَا تُشْرِكْ بِاللَّهِ يَا بُنَيَّ لَا تُشْرِكْ بِاللَّهِ إِنَّ الشِّرْكَ لَظُلْمٌ عَظِيمٌ وَوَصَّيْنَا الْإِنسَانَ بِوَالِدَيْهِ حَمَلَتْهُ أُمُّهُ وَهْنًا عَلَى وَهْنٍ وَفِصَالُهُ فِي عَامَيْنِ أَنِشْكُرْ لِي وَلِوَالِدَيْكَ إِلَيَّ الْمَصِيرِ وَإِنْ جَاهَدَاكَ عَلَىٰ أَنْ تُشْرِكَ بِي مَا لَيْسَ لَكَ بِهِ عِلْمٍ فَلَا تُطِعْهُمَا وَصَاحِبَهُمَا فِي الدُّنْيَا مَعْرُوفًا واتبع سبيل من أناب إلي ثم إلي مرجعكم فأنبئكم بما كنتم تعملون يا بني إنها إن تك مثقال حبة من خردل فتكن في صخرة فتكن في صخرة أو في السماوات أو في الأرض يأتي بها الله إن الله لطيف خبير يا بني أقم الصلاة وأمر بالمعروف وانه عن المنكر واصبر على ما أصابك إن ذلك من عزم الأمور ولا تصعر خدك للناس ولا تمشي في الأرض مرحا إن الله لا يحب كل مختال فخور وقصد في مشيك واغضض من صوتك إِنَّ أَنْكَرَ الْأَصْوَاتِ لَصَوْتُ الْحَمِيرِ So in these verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins by talking about Luqman, mentioning that, and we have certainly given, we referring to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we have certainly given Luqman wisdom and said, be grateful to Allah, and whoever is grateful is grateful for the benefit of himself. And whoever denies Allah's favor, then indeed Allah is free of need and praiseworthy. And mention, O Muhammad, when Luqman said to his son while he was instructing him. So now Luqman begins his advice to his son. He begins by saying, O oh my son, do not associate anything with Allah. Indeed, associating with him is a great injustice. So the first advice that he gives them is that he's already starting off with the fact that associating anything with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one of the greatest atrocities someone can commit. And this is the foundation of, it, of his advice that he begins with before telling him anything else is his belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we have enjoyed upon man care for his parents, 
his mother had carried him, increasing her in weakness upon weakness, and his weaning is in two years. Be grateful to me and to your parents, and to me is the final destination. But if they endeavor to make you associate with me that of which you have no knowledge, do not ob obey them, but accompany them in this world with appropriate kindness and follow the way of those who turn back to me in repentance. Then to me will be your return, and I will inform you about what you used to do. And, so now, Allah, and now Luqman is giving advice to his son about the importance of parents and how after having your belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and understanding that you're not allowed to associate anything with him, the advice he gives them is having kindness towards your parents, regardless of what they tell you to do or how they act towards you, with the exception of them nullifying the first advice that Luqman gave, which was to associate partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Luqman said, O oh my son, indeed if wrong should be the way of a mustard seed and should be within a rock or anywhere in the heaven or in the earth, Allah will bring it forth. Indeed, Allah is subtle and acquainted. O oh my son, establish prayer Enjoin what is right, forbid what is wrong, and be patient over what befalls you. Indeed, all that is of the matters requiring determination. So now he's giving his son the, the importance of our prayer that we have five times a day, and that we need to establish and make sure that we're keeping up with, the, with, our, with, our, with our daily prayers. And the importance of when you see something that is good, that you encourage that good, and that you enjoin and be part of that good, and that when you see something evil, you do everything in your power to stop what that evil action is. And do not turn your cheek in contempt toward people and do not walk through the earth, earth exultantly. Indeed, Allah does not like everyone self-deluded and boastful, essentially warning his son from being arrogant and acting like he is something, when in reality, all we are are the slaves of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And be moderate in your pace and lower your voice. Indeed, the most disagreeable of sounds is the voice of donkeys. And indeed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has spoken the truth. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum. Oh. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Jazakallah khair for coming, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. We really appreciate it. Welcome to the UC Davis uh, Muslim Student Association's very first debate. Um, and we are very excited to be holding it today, um, and we're very honored that you all took the time on a weekday to come out and listen to this beautiful debate. We're extremely excited to be hosting these two amazing debaters um, who are very kind, very knowledgeable, and have spared their time in the middle of the week to come and speak to us. Um, and with that, we are going to be debating, or they're going to be debating the concept or the ex of the existence of God. Um, and before I give them a proper, um, well-due introduction, I will be passing off the microphone to Ali Dawa, who will be talking about Salam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Um, before I start, I want to praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the most merciful, the most just. Uh, all praise, his glory and gratitude belong to him for everything that we do. Uh, salam stands for sharing affection, love and mercy. And that's what we're here to do, inshallah. Um, speci specifically at the time of age that we live, where hate has been, hate has been spread um, by the label given freedom of speech. And this sometimes comes at the cost of innocent people dying. And we saw that at Christchurch. Uh, we saw that in London, where we're from. Um, innocent people getting killed, Muslim or non-Muslim. And we want to put an end to this. And one of our objectives is to deconstruct false narratives and reconstruct pure minds. Um, and that's our main objective. And I just want to thank every single one of you guys for coming. You can check our website, salam.org.uk. Inshallah, we're planning on setting up a team in California. Uh, this is a beautiful country. We absolutely love this. The food, uh, is it the macarons? Yeah, raspberry flavor. Absolutely amazing. And I want to thank Brother Ali and the team. Um, every time I crave it, they um, get it for me. So inshallah, it'll be a successful debate, inshallah. And we want to thank, um, um, I'm not going to say uncle because he looks quite young, mashallah. Um, Brother Edward, yes, um, uh, for coming in the afternoon, inshallah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And Mohammed and Jabir, we want to thank him and we want to thank our teachers who have supported this, supported us along the way, inshallah. Inshallah, it will be a successful debate uh, and all praises belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Thank you for listening. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.
Thank you very much for that. Um, so first we'll be introducing Brother Muhammad Hijab. Muhammad Hijab is a debater and public speaker who engages in discussions and polemics on a wide variety of topics including religion, politics, and society. He completed a politics degree and a master's in, the history, in history from Queen Mary University. He has taught and instructed courses on humanities and languages in many contexts. He has, come, he has numerous ijazas in some Islamic sciences and has studied in numerous Islamic seminaries, including the Shinqiti Institute, which employs a traditional Mauritian style of teaching the sacred sciences. Edward, Eddie, Tabash, is a constitutional lawyer in the Los Angeles area. He graduated from UCLA in 1973, magnum cum laude, with a bachelor's, bachelor's degree in political science. He graduated from Loyola Law School of Los Angeles in 1973. He is the son of an Orthodox rabbi from Lithuania and an Auschwitz surviving mother from Hungary. After decades of spiritual reflection and seeking, he has determined that the universe is natural, with no supernatural being or beings, no god or gods, involved in the creation or perpetuation of our existence. He chairs the board of directors of the Center of Inquiry Transnational, a worldwide organization of secular humanists and scientific skeptics. He is also known for his legal work in separation of church and state cases, in which we seek to preserve the equality before the law of both believers and non-believers. He promotes a secular society based in science, reason, and inquiry. Maintaining strong conviction in this, he's an integral leader to several associations which exist to separate church and state. A part of his work in separation of church and state has specifically been in opposing Trump's Muslim ban. Um, and mashallah, they're both extremely qualified and we're very, very excited to have them both in this debate. Um, and for this reason, we would like to also request a certain level of boundaries and guidelines for the event, inshallah, to make sure that it goes as smooth as possible for both of our speakers. Um, and that we ask that everyone be as, ex as respectful as possible to both of our speakers by doing a number of few things. So we would like everyone to please, if possible, please do not shout, heckle, boo, scream, cause any form of ruckus against either speakers in, to, in order to respect their time, their knowledge, um, and everything that they're doing for us today. Um, if people are causing issues, unfortunately, we will have to have security escort you out in respect for both of our speakers. Also, another request that we have is that if you would like to clap, please feel free to, but only after the speaker is completed with their, what they're saying, simply because there is a time frame that each of them has to be able to get their points across, and we do not want to disadvantage either speaker by limiting the other speaker's amount of time through clapping and waiting for people to stop talking. Um, and with that said, please, Jazakallah khair, thank you so much for coming. Thank you, everyone. We really appreciate it. And then I will be passing off our the microphone to our moderator, um, which is Adnan Perwaz. Hello everyone, thank you for joining us. Uh, as Hasna mentioned, I will be moderating, moderating the debate. Uh, we will start off with opening statements. Each speaker will have 20 minutes to give theirs. And we will begin with Brother Muhammad Hijab. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. First of all, I want to thank every single one of you for coming down here. I want to thank the university, and of course, I want to thank uh, Eddie Tabash, who's a really prolific, you know, formidable opponent, and uh, a very experienced atheist opponent for many years. And so I'm very happy that all of you are here today. To proceed, there's no doubt that there is existence. There is no doubt that there is existence. Existence is divided into two things, possible existence and necessary existence. Possible existence is existence that otherwise doesn't need to exist. And it's existence that could be arranged in any other way. It's existence which is dependent. For example, I'm wearing a blue blazer. This is a possible existence. It doesn't have to exist. It could be arranged in another way. And it's dependent upon materials that were created, um, used to create it. Necessary existence, on the other hand, is existence which is, couldn't be any other way. Existence which could not be any other way is independent 
self-sufficient, and could not be out of existence. Now, the main argument today is this. There cannot be a world with only possible existences. That is the main argument. There cannot be a world with only possible existences. Why? Because if there was only possible existences, I'm going to be using the board a little bit. If there's only possible existences, you would have dependent things depending upon other dependent things. Now, this can be reasoned metaphysically, ontologically, and cosmologically. For example, we have a mathematical set. It's like a series, yes? yes? And you have things within that. Dependent one, dependent two, dependent three. If this series existed in its, by itself, it would require something outside of it an independent thing in order for that series to exist. Now, what if we say if it's an infinite series? It's not really a good sign, but let's say if it was an infinite series. We'll get to that in what follows. Now, let's use a cosmological example. We have a tree. There's very beautiful trees here, by the way, in California. Like a cherry tree. I saw a cherry tree. Very beautiful. That tree requires the sun to photosynthesize in order to exist. I think it's fair to say if the tree didn't exist, or if the sun didn't exist, the tree would not exist. It's fair to say this, yes? So long as the, the sun is required, or so long as the tree exists, the sun will exist. Even if that was for an infinite amount of time. Now the sun itself is part of its own order. And... It's part of its own set. Now, it requires other things in order to exist. At the end of this, what is required, once again, is an independent thing. That, this independent thing can only be one. Wait a minute. Why is that? Because if there was more than one necessary existence, it wouldn't be a necessary existence. Because it could be conceived that it could be arranged in another way. And you can't have two things which are independent, because which one is dependent on which? Therefore, whether you conceptualize this ontologically, cosmologically, on materialism, dualism, idealism, you must conclude that what is required in order for any existence to exist is an independent thing. That is one. That is always in existence. Why? Because if it wasn't in existence, if it could be conceived that this thing is not in existence, it wouldn't be necessary. So it has to be eternal. And it cannot be made up of, of parts. Why? Because anything which is a compound is generated. Anything that's made up of parts is dependent on those parts. That's point number one. And point number two, if it was a possible existence, if it's made up of parts, you can imagine those parts being arranged in a different way. Therefore, it falls into the category of possible existence. To summarize, you require an independent thing outside of the series of dependent things in order for any existence to exist. This thing must be one. It cannot have parts. It must be immaterial, incorporeal. Where else must it be? It must be eternal. Now, this is what the Quran says in its basic definition of God. Say he is God, one and only. Allahu Samad. The one who's independent, self-sufficient. Everything depends upon him, and he depends upon nothing. He begets not, nor is he begotten. He is the eternal one, pre-eternal, post-eternal. And there is nothing like him. He's immaterial. He's not composed of parts. He's incorporeal. So you see, this is the argument. If this argument is cracked, I have lost the debate. This is my main argument. Everything goes back to this argument, which goes back to the basic definition of God. What must be presented is a formulation, whether it's a cosmological one or an ontological one, which shows us how it's possible that only possible existences can exist without the independent. If that's done, I'm ready to be an atheist today.
Now, the Quran says in chapter 52, verse 35, Am khuliqu min ghayri shay'in. Am bal la yuqinun. Were they created from nothing? Or were they themselves the creators of themselves? Did they create the heavens and the earth? Certainly they have no certainty. Saying that the atheistic position is one of mere speculation. You can never achieve certainty with atheism. Why? Because in this logical disjunction you have four options. Either the universe came from nothing, which is impossible. Ontologically, math mathematically and cosmologically. It's not possible. No one has argued this really. It's a weak argument. I don't think my interlocutor with his experience will go there. He's very prominent and very experienced. He won't go there. And, or, is it eternal? Can it be eternal? Well, let's say it is. Wait a minute, what did you say? Did you concede to that? Yes, well, no, no problem. Even if it was eternal for the sake of argument, is it dependent or independent? You still have the problem here. But, my interlocutor is a naturalist, so he believes in the beginning of the universe. So that's not a problem for us. What other option do we have? Is it self-created? Like my friend Hamza Zulsis says, is it possible for something to exist and not exist at the same time? He gives the example of a mother giving birth to herself. Is that possible? No, it's not possible. Come on. It's not possible. So the other thing is, it was put into existence by something which had the ability to do so. Now, the question is, what are the attributes of that thing which had the ability to put the universe into existence, how do we reason this? By inference we say, well, if it had the ability to put the universe into existence, it must have power. Because that is required for that kind of thing. It must have creative capacity. It must have knowledge. It must have knowledge. So you see, we start to, to have a formulation a question now we have to ask is why is the universe one way and not another way? It's conceivable, for example, you see you have celestial spheres in the universe. They're rotating in one direction. We can conceive and imagine of the possibility of all of the celestial spheres in the universe going the other way, for example. We can imagine that. So why is the universe one way rather than another way? I will tell you that the only rational explanation for that is that there is an external particularizer of the universe. Say that one more time. That there must be an external particularizer of the universe to choose between different options, possible options. Because then you have no explanation for why the universe is one way rather than another way. You have to have an external sorting agent you have to have an external what? Sorting agent that decides X rather than Y. Otherwise, the question will be, to the atheist, how can you prove on naturalism? Or how can you explain on naturalism that the universe is one way rather than another way? It's a very straightforward question. Now, here's the thing. If we know that there is an external sorting agent, this implies will of this agent. And if there was more than one will, there would be a chaotic universe. As the Quran says, by the Audubon Lehman Shaitan Rajim, لَوْ كَانَ فِيهِمَا آلِهَةٌ إِلَّا اللَّهُ لَفَسَدَتَا فَسُبْحَانَ اللَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَرْشِ عَمَّا يَصِفُونَ If there was more than one of them, the universe would have been corrupted. The heavens and the earth would have been corrupted. Chapter 21, verse 22. How? Because if there's more than one will, ultimately, which one is steering the ship? There would be chaotic order. The Quran also says, La ala ba'bum ala ba in chapter 23, verse 91. If there was one, more than one Almighty, they would have outstripped one another, attempted to outstrip one another for power. So, in other words, you can't have more than one of those things for those reasons as well. And this brings me to my third point, which is the argument of the physical coherence of the universe, which is a Quranic argument, because today I'm just going to be sticking with the Quran. 
The Quran says, الذي خلق سبع سماوات طباقا ما ترى في خلق الرحمن من تفاوت فرجع البصر هل ترى منه فطور ثم رجع البصر كرتين ينقلب إليك البصر خاسئا وهو حسير That chapter 67 verse 3 Look at the universe Look up in the sky Look at the sky. Look at the coherence of the universe. Do you see any inconsistencies? Look again. The Quran says, wait a minute. Look again. Let me look. Let me see. Is there any inconsistencies? Now, I thought about this verse. And this verse is telling us that there is a uniformity of nature, a consistency of nature, a coherence of nature. The fact that the universe is uniform and coherent is not known by science. It's presupposed by science. Wait a minute, what did you say? Let me say it one more time. If you look, for example, at any introductory guide to the scientific method, like Hugh Gao, he wrote the illustrated uh, guide to the scientific method, he said that the fact that you have rationalizable actors that can see the universe and see its consistency means that there's a presupposition of science. And what is that presupposition? That science is uniform. That the universe is uniform. It's rationalizable. Albert Einstein said in his letters to Solvin, he said, the most incomprehensible thing about the universe is that it is comprehensible. So I'm not making a fine-tuning argument today because we've heard enough of that. Every atheist and every non-atheist has heard this fine-tuning argument. What's this fine-tuning argument? The argument is, look at the constants of nature. Yes? You have these constants which are in a Goldilocks zone of life perm permitting range. If they were any way this way or that way, they would not, the universe would not exist and life would not uh, be in, uh, possible in the universe. Like Martin Rees wrote just six numbers and he says N, which is capital N, a number, talking about, you know, the natural forces. He says a billion, 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 billion. And had any zeros been taken away, yes, then that would have been, the universe would have been completely different. E is another letter that he talks about, the conversion of hydrogen into helium. He says that this conversion is 0 0.007. Had it been 0 0.006 or 0 0.008, we would not exist. This is exactly what he writes. It's not what I'm writing. I'm not a cosmologist. Right? It's what he writes. That's an argument from probability. That's an interesting argument. I think the interesting thing is that many people, theists and non-atheists, accept the fine-tuning of the universe. Stephen Hawkins accepted it. Richard Dawkins accepted it. So it's not really an area of controversy. My argument is about the uniformity of nature, the coherence of nature, which is presupposed by the universe, by the by some scientific method. The question is, therefore, on naturalism. On naturalism. How can you account for the coherence of the universe? You can't say, well, the universe just is, like Bertrand Russell said, because that is a circular argument, frankly. It's a cop-out. I'm asking for an external explanation. We're rational people. We should be able to explain. If, nat if naturalism has the ability to, to give us these answers, then surely we should be entitled to such answers. Now, I've got five minutes left, and I've made my arguments. To reiterate, my main argument today is the argument from contingency. And it's not one that Leibniz formulated. It's a different kind of argument from contingency that many Western people are not familiar with. It's from our tradition. And frankly, the main question is this. The question is, how can you explain a world, either ontologically or cosmologically, naturally, that only has possible existences? That's the question. If you can prove it, you've cracked the argument. Now, I know I've, I've been watching his videos. He's an incredible speaker. And because he's a lawyer, he's got that charisma that if, when he starts speaking, I might have to run away, actually. <laughs> incredible speaker. But I've, I know, I have a feeling of what he's going to talk about. And I think it's going to be the problem of evil. Right? Now, Epicurus, 
an old Hellenistic philosopher. He, he had the logical form of the problem of evil. And the logical form went as follows, that if God is omnipotent and all good, then if he's omnipotent, why does he not stop the evil? If he's all good, then how comes evil exists? The answer to that question is as follows. I'm going to give it to you right now. God is not just those two things. He's also all, all wise. So in order for the problem of evil, from an Islamic traditional perspective, to be unlocked or to make sense from a logical perspective, you have to show logically or naturalistically or cosmologically or mathematically or inductively or abductively, any way possible, how, how evil, the existence of evil, contradicts the divine wisdom. That's how it goes. We don't believe in a God with three attributes, goodness, or two attributes, and, uh, and omnipotence only. That's not the God we believe in. So we have to show, otherwise it's an emotional argument. Now, the other thing he talks about is the divine hidedness. Why is God hidden from us? Now, we believe in the fitrah as Muslims. The immediate knowledge of God, the intuitive knowledge of God. And by the way, this is a Muslim-specific belief. We believe that we are born believing in God. We have the immediate knowledge of God. And that society strays us away from that knowledge of God. So the Quran, for instance, or the prophets come to reinforce what we already knew primordially, if you like. Primordially, from a psycho-spiritual perspective. So God is not hiding. In fact, he's reminding us. And the Quran says, وَمَا كُنَّا مُعَذِّبِينَ حَتَّى نَبْعَثَ رَسُولًا If an atheist dies as an atheist, and according to us, if he dies as an atheist, he's not heard the message of Islam, he does not go to hell straight away. We can't say this. It's not our belief. So God is not hiding according to us. So these are the two things I'm anticipating he's going to be raising up. So I'm preempting it. And finally, what I want to say, and we'll talk about this, by the way, the fitrah. The immediate knowledge of God, because there is empirical evidence of that. By the way, Justin Barrett made an interesting, has many interesting books on this. He says that there, there, is, a, a, there is a divine receptivity to God. And he done, you know, studies with children cross-culturally and found that children naturally believe in God. So atheism on this idea is a social construct. Atheism is a cultural construct. So finally, I want to say that the Quran promises us in chapter number 41 that Allah will show us all the way. In other words, his signs. He says, that we will certainly show them our signs in the horizons and in themselves until it's made patently clear that this is the truth. I hope today we can be as sincere as possible and be open to this. And I hope now that we go back to that question of how there can be only possible existences. I leave it to uh, Edward for the response. Thank you very much. Is there some other mic I'm supposed to be? Okay. Good evening, everybody. I want to thank the Muslim Student Association for putting on this debate, and I want to thank Muhammad for debating me. I will respond to his arguments in my rebuttal, but I will now present my positive arguments for why it is more likely than not that the evidence in our physical universe clearly makes it so that a supernatural, conscious, personal being that is an all-good, all-knowing, and all-powerful deity, the standard issue God of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam does not exist. Argument one, the argument that from the way our world operates, it is much more likely that there is nothing beyond the physical. 
The evidence shows that it is much more likely that the universe is not impacted by any invisible realms or by intentional actions by immaterial beings. The history of scientific discovery has shown that whenever we attributed phenomena to paranormal creatures or gods, further examination showed such beings did not cause what was happening. We learned that lightning is not caused by an angry god or gods, diseases are not caused by evil spirits and by germs, and demonic possession has nothing to do with mental illness. As humanity has gone forward, natural explanations have always evicted previously believed supernatural ones. It has never been the other way around. There's no verifiable evidence of anything supernatural, which there should be if the supernatural existed. Since we have no background information of supernatural beings or events, there is a very low prior probability of them. This means that, for instance, if we were to use Bayes' probability theory, we would be predicting only natural explanations for phenomena. Though we have never seen a quark, we know that the category of subatomic articles, particles do exist. Evidence for the existence of quarks has been steadily increasing. One indication of the soundness of the quark model is its success in predicting the outcome of high energy collisions of an electron and positron. There are no such equivalent empirically verifiable indications of God's existence. So we cannot infer the supernatural from a mere observation of the natural. Number two, the argument from the non-occurrence of miracles. Claims of miracles have the initial problem of bearing witness against themselves, since by their very content they are violations of the laws of nature that are not supposed to be violated. All the supposed miracles that are claimed to verify God's intervention in human affairs allegedly took place in a pre-scientific era. Why don't we moderns have the same opportunity to observe these miracles today? No verifiable events in today's world correspond to the types of miracles that monotheistic religions claim happened in ancient times. Thus, the probability that a miracle happened, regardless of which religion makes the claim, will always be lower than the probability that a miracle has not occurred. Number three, the argument from the dependence of conscious minds on a physical body and brain. There is overwhelming evidence that conscious thought and awareness cannot occur without a functioning physical brain with operative cortical neurons and synapses. Believing in a disembodied superintelligence and in life after death creates a serious dilemma. If even Alzheimer's disease can destroy conscious awareness, how can that very same conscious awareness survive the destruction of the entire body and brain at death? This would entail believing that if certain portions of our physical brains are damaged, we lose the awareness contained in those portions. But if you destroy the entire brain by death, your awareness will somehow reappear fully intact in some immaterial form, highly unlikely. If consciousness could survive independently of the brain, diseases, brain injuries, and anesthetics would not eclipse consciousness like they do. Since the evidence shows there is no conscious self-awareness or thought without a functional brain with operative cortical neurons and synapses, we cannot be expected to believe in any god that is supposed to have a disembodied thinking mind. Number four, the argument from evolution. Though many theists believe in evolution because of its sloppiness and trial and error features, evolution by natural selection is more likely if there is no God. More than 99% of all species that have ever existed are now extinct. This is wasteful. We have useless components in our bodies that indeed do more harm than good, like the appendix known to most of us only when it's about to burst. Evolution by natural selection is established by the weight of the evidence. For instance, there is a 100% match of DNA sequences in the pseudogene region of beta globin that is proof that humans and gorillas had a common ancestor. Number five, as Mohammed predicted in his prophetic wisdom, the argument from evil, the evidential argument from evil. 
God can make whatever he wants happen and prevent anything he doesn't want from occurring. So why are there holocausts, extremely dangerous and violent people, horrible diseases, extreme poverty, and destructive natural disasters? If we humans need discipline, we could benefit from a military-style training camp, not a concentration camp. There was no benefit from my mother's having been in Auschwitz. Another example, malaria is a terrible disease. There is a gene, though, that provides an effective defense against malaria. It works by destroying any red corpuscles that have been occupied by any of the types of parasitic protozoans that cause malaria. But if one has inherited this gene from both parents, it also causes sickle cell anemia. Why did God have to set it up this way or allow it to work this way? To attempt to justify or explain the horrendous evil and suffering in the world, the theist must be able to show that God, even with unlimited power, could not have prevented an even greater evil, but for the horrible evil and suffering he actually created or allowed, or with unlimited power, God could not have brought about a very great good, but for the horrible evil and suffering God actually created or allowed. Here, the theist must also be able to show that the very great good that could not but for this horrible evil and suffering take place was indeed such a great good as to morally justify subjecting the victims to the agonizing pain they have to endure. If we take the concept of God's omnipotence seriously, this is a very high burden for a supposedly omnipotent being to meet. The argument, number six, from divine hiddenness. A God that wants us to know that this God exists and wants a relationship with us would not withhold evidence of the divine existence and would understand just what evidence many of us would need in order to be able to believe. If God exists and created me, God knows my mind and knows that right now I couldn't believe in God regardless how much I wanted to just like I couldn't believe in space alien visitations to Earth because of the absence of any evidence showing these things to be true. God's not being forthcoming with the evidence that would enable me to believe that God exists while knowing that I can't believe in the absence of such evidence is more consistent with God's non-existence than with the existence of a God that wants me to know him, her, or it. If your mother told you that your father, whom you've never met or spoken to, loves you very much and wants a father-child relationship with you, but just has been too busy to ever come to see you ever since you were born, let's say around your 18th birthday, you would probably conclude that your dad really doesn't want a relationship with you. We can actually see the reality of human fathers on a daily basis. So even if the dad in the above scenario is always absent, we can believe he exists. We don't have the same evidence that a God exists. So if we are told there is a God who loves us and wants relationship with us, but that God never provides us with direct evidence that it exists, when such an all-powerful God could easily provide that direct evidence, we are justified in doubting the existence of that God and doubting the desire of any such God to want a relationship with us. Divine hiddenness also furthers the argument from evil. If God exists, such a being would know that unanswered questions about why there is so much evil and suffering prevent many of us from believing in such a God. We have a right to expect that a perfectly good God would not allow such horrendous evil and suffering without morally sufficient reasons. If we are not told what those morally sufficient reasons are, then it is more probable that a perfectly good God that wants to be believed in and worshipped does not exist. 6.1, the argument from religious confusion, a subset of divine hiddenness. There is so much agree disagreement over which religion is true and even if, over which branch of a given religion is true. If God exists and wants us to know its will and follow divine decrees, we are justified in expecting that this deity would not allow so much confusion over who that God is, what that God wants us to believe in, and what that God wants us to do. The presence of such rampant confusion is more likely if a God that wants us to know its will does not exist. So Catholics believe that when the Pope speaks ex cathedra, he's infallible. Protestants reject the concept of a Pope. If only one of these is true, God should make clear to Christians which one it is. Sunni and Shiite Muslims began to disagree 
over whether Mohammed's successor should be chosen by qualifications alone or need to have direct bloodline to Mohammed. Shiites believe that the 12th Imam in the 10th century was taken into hiding by God in a process called occultation and will return at the end of time in a full messianic capacity to facilitate the final and full understanding of the Quran and the Prophet's message. Sunnis do not accept this. Now, even though the Sunnis and Shiites share the Quran, they have different versions of the Hadith, which are very important to Islamic interpretation of the deeds and traditions of the Prophet. So if one of these is true and the other is false, God should make clear to Muslims which one it is. Now, the other also derived from divine hiddenness, argument from unreliable revelations and translations from defects and errors in the Bible and the Quran. If God exists, we are justified in expecting that this God will provide us with a reliable revelation. If there are problems with the revelation, then it's more consistent with a God that is not perfect. Both the Bible and Quran talk clearly about male dominion over women. Genesis 3.16 says, And thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Surah 4.34, Pickthal says, Men are in charge of women, because Allah hath made the one of them excel the other. Well, we modern humans have learned that there is no reason for men to be in charge of women, because women are the intellectual and moral equals of men. So this itself, this itself shows that both the Bible and the Quran are incorrect insofar as they vest the man with more power over the woman than the woman is vested over the man. Also, both the Bible and the Quran talk about hell eternally for those who don't believe in the religion each revelation is promoting. Well, they can't both be true. It can't be true that you'll go to hell forever if you are not a Christian, and you'll go to hell forever if you're not a Muslim. So if, in fact, there is a God that bases our eternity on whether we choose Christianity or Islam, then that God should tell us which one and not let us make the honest and sincere mistake of picking the wrong one and falling through the trap door into eternal horror. So the very fact that God doesn't make this clear to us and give us a clear choice is more consistent with there not being a God that wants us to find the truth. Now also, if Islam is true, those of us who do not speak Arabic and those of us who can't read the Quran in its original should be given a clear, un ambiguous translation, which is the functional equivalent of Arabic, or God should have revealed the Quran in every major language. Mohammed Pickthall was one of the most prominent translators of the Quran into English in the 20th century, and in his translator's foreword, it's a direct quote, the Quran cannot be translated. Every effort has been made to choose befitting language, but the result is not the glorious Quran. It can never take the place of the Quran in Arabic. But then, if God wants me to be a Muslim, God should provide me with the proper translation so I don't make any errors. Now, another argument from divine hiddenness, a subset, is the argument for moral confusion. So many people acting in good faith even members of the same religion disagree about what is right and what is wrong in a bewildering variety of situations. Both the Bible and the Quran condemn gay sex, but most of us know gay couples, and our reason and experience tell us that same-sex relationships are no worse than heterosexual relationships, just like our reason and experience tell us there's no reason for men to be in charge of women or rule over women, as opposed to women being in charge of men and ruling over men. So if either or both the Quran and the Bible were infallibly true and inerrant, they wouldn't say these things. 
Argument seven, argument from scale or the argument from human insignificance. 68% of the universe is dark energy. 27% is dark matter. So a scant 5% of the universe is even conceptually accessible by us. Of that 5%, virtually all of it is comprised of empty space, which is instantly lethal to human beings. So 99.359s of the universe is basically off limits to humans. Our galaxy contains around 300 billion stars. Our galaxy is one of 100 billion galaxies in the observable universe, and we have no access to any of this. Mathematically, we are just one part in 100 followed by 39 zeros of the universe. There are 20 septillion planets in the universe. That's 20 followed by 24 zeros. Why would God need such a literally astronomical number of excess planets if we are the core of God's creation and concern? The universe is 13.7 billion years old. The Earth is 4.6 billion years old. We humans have been around for maybe 200,000 years. If we are at the center of creation and of God's concern, why did God wait 13.7 billion years for us to appear? An all-powerful engineer would not have needed uh, to suffer this kind of inefficiency. Remember, we are speaking of a God that's supposed to be all-powerful. Argument number eight, the argument against the existence of a transcendent person. A person is by very definition a being who thinks and performs actions, and that in turn requires being in time. So how could God have deliberately created anything if there wasn't an environment of time and space in which to operate sequentially so A could cause B? If the theist says that God exists in and functions in some unknowable metaphysical time, for which, of course, there's no proof, then the theist is conceding that God is not completely transcendent since God operates in some nebulous context which corresponds to time. A being out that is outside space and time is not working within a framework in which anything can be caused by anything else. So we can see that the overwhelming weight of the evidence in our physical universe makes the predictive power of atheism much stronger than that of theism. We see, for instance, that the universe is not perfect. Most of it is lethal. We also see that within five billion years, the sun will burn out, which means the earth will seek to exist. I don't see much perfection in that. So probabilistically, taking the totality of the evidence, it's far more likely than not that we live in a natural, not a supernatural universe, and that an all-powerful, all-good, all-knowing, self-conscious God does not exist. Thank you. Thank you so much for both of our speakers. The next section will be the rebuttal section. Each speaker will have 10 minutes to counter the other speaker's argument that was presented during the open state, opening statement. Uh, we will begin with Mohammed Hijab and then Edward Tabash. So, Mohammed Hijab. I'll begin when everyone is quiet. All right, so Edward made eight um, points, eight arguments. I'm going to respond to each and every single one of them. The first one, the verifiable evidence of something which is supernatural, which links to his second point, which is the non-evidence of miracles. I'm going to prove today that Edward believes in miracles. What did you say? Let me say it again. Edward believes in miracles. What is a miracle? According to Edward and according to David Hume, it's a violation of the laws of nature. It's a violation of the laws of nature. What is a miracle? Something which goes outside the five senses, which can't be really detected by science. Because naturalism, according to the Oxford Concise um, Companion, is, or philosophy, is something which can only be seen by science. The Quran responds. It says, he says, 
They say to us, they say, he, he struck, struck an example and they say, who's going to raise the dead when it becomes dust? The one who gave it life the first time. Now let's think of this. Have we ever seen the transition from chemistry to biology? No. This is referred to as abiogenesis. Yes? When chemistry becomes biology. Every study of biology presupposes this. Because if there's no such thing as a movement from chemistry to biology, there cannot be biology. Therefore, the dead became the living. Have you seen that? No. Have you sensed that? No. Is it scientific? No. Do you believe in it? Yes. It's a miracle. Just like Jesus raising the dead, it's a miracle. Just like the day of resurrection, it's a miracle. So just as all of those things will happen, the Quran says, you can believe in all of that. It's premised on the movement from a non-living chemistry to a biology. You believe in it. We all believe in miracles. If that is how it's defined, and that's how he defined it. Number three, the dependence of conscious minds on the brain, which is a philosophical discussion, frankly. Raymond Tallis, who wrote a book called Aping Mankind, he's a neuroscientist. He asked the question, if consciousness is in the brain, where is it in the brain? What's the natural explanation for where consciousness is in the brain? Really, frankly, the idea that you can lose consciousness through anesthetic and then be in not in a state of consciousness is refuted by dreams, the existence of dreams. I, you know, I close my eyes, you know, but I see. How can you explain dreams? This is the problem of hard consciousness, the hard problem of consciousness. You can't bypass the academics. This is something that philosophers have been talking about since time began. Number four. That the argument from evolution, evolution doesn't contradict theism. But which evolution are we talking about? Darwinian evolution after the 1960s? One thing will refute this. The problem of induction. Science has the problem of theory ladenness, of induction, of interpretation, all of these things. You can't say that it's definite. And he didn't say that. He was careful in his wording. He says, most likely. But that could be reformulated. If new data is found, it could be reinterpreted. It has been reinterpreted. In fact, there's more likelihood that our evolutionary conceptions will change. So you can't really use this as an argument. Um, the argument from evil. What is evil? Here's the thing, ladies and gentlemen. On naturalism, evil does not exist. It's a cultural construct. It's a social construct. Look at the works of Bertrand Russell, of Nietzsche, postmodernists. Even Richard Dawkins in The Blind Watchmaker, he says there's no such thing as good. There's no such thing as evil. It's all pitless indifference. That's what he says. Why? Because on naturalism, you cannot put morality under a microscope. There's no way of ascertaining that there is any morals on naturalism. There is no objective morality. What evil are you talking about? But for the sake of argument, let's say, okay, fine, evil exists. But we said it's not incompatible with wisdom of God. The Quran says again, He's the one who has created life and death to see which one of you is best indeed. If there was no evil, there would be no test. If there would be no evil, there would be no free will. What's the point of life then? What is the purpose of this? Everyone is going to die. Quran says, wait a minute. Everyone's going to die. I'm going to die. Eddie's going to die. You're going to die. And we will test you with good and evil as a, as a test. And then you'll come back to us. It's a test. Without evil, there is no test. Next, divine hiddenness. We've already covered this. The fitrah. We're all born with the predisposition of God. There is evidence for this. Paul Bloom, Justin Barrett. Many people have already said, we have seen, we have analyzed empirical evidence of children. How they, what is their natural instinct? They, it's mentioned, uh, Justin Barrett says, they have a natural receptivity. They have a natural receptivity to the divine, to the divine, a non-anthropomorphic God, not Jesus. 
Not Buddha. They have a na- we have natural inclination to God. And then that's reinforced by the prophets. That's the Islamic narrative. The prophets came to remind us of what we already knew. It's a dhikr. The Quran is a reminder. Just like if you were separated from your parents or your mother and then you're reunited with her, she is by natural instinct. And the same thing with God. So we talked about divine conf- uh, confusion, or sorry, unreliable revelations. I agree with this point. There are unreliable revelations, but I would want to see how that is the case with the Quran. There was no argument there. Chapter 4, verse 34, it's a bad translation. Man in charge of women. There's only one translation, I think, or two. It's men are maintainers and protectors of women. And frankly, if you didn't believe this, you wouldn't draft men to the army in America. Men protect women, and they have done so. It's not saying that they're better than them. The Quran, and the Prophet said, in the al-Rijal, men are equal to women. So, I mean, the Quran says, that God does not let to waste any action of a man or a woman, both of you. But anyways, go back to the idea of natural selection. On natural selection, the patriarchy on feminism is justified. Because if men can dominate women, that's a natural thing. What's the problem on naturalism? How can you justify feminism, second wave feminism, on naturalism? That's an impossibility. You can't do it. Why not third wave feminism? Why not the works of Judas Butler? Why not queer theory? Why not LGBT? Why have to be second wave? Equal? The, the Eurocentric understanding of equality? How is that natural? Naturalistic? I'd want to see how he mechanistically shows us that. Hell, eternity, well, both of us can't be. Um, Muslims and Christians can't be in a both right, you're right about that. But that doesn't solve any issue, it doesn't create any problem. The translation problem, only one way to understand the language. There's a translation problem with mathematics. Is mathematics false therefore? It's a language. If, if that, if that if a translatable thing it becomes false because of its content and it has to be translated, then mathematics is false. Moral confusion. I mean, yes, there's moral confusion, but just because there's controversy of something, it doesn't make it false. That's a fallacy. Argument from scale. He says 99.9% of the universe is not hospitable to human life. He's made the fine-tuning argument for me. And we, we're on the 0.01. <laughs> so what is the possibility of that for real? I agree with you. A transcendent person. A transcendent person. He defines a person in a certain way. He says, well, God controls time and space. Simple as that. I mean, it's not really an argument. And I think... I've got a minute left. Have I got a minute left? Well, 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 well. You know, here's the thing, guys. Don't be swayed by the red herring. The red herring is a moral red herring. The Quran says this about men. That, look, here's the thing. On naturalism, no one is born equal. Yes? Why? Because actually, liberalism is an outgrowth of something which is called the state of nature. It's a fictitious mythological construct which John Locke and Thomas Hobbes wrote in their books. It's not scientific. We came out of the state of nature and we became what? We became connected socially, contractually into the state. This, so the whole of liberalism and human rights by extension is a myth. It's a liberal myth. Show me on naturalism how liberalism is true. How we're all born equal. In fact, I'm told, you know, your average height, we're all different. On naturalism, we're all different. Thank you very much. Mohammed initially said that his main point tonight was the argument from contingency. The problem is to say that there must be a necessary being for everything that is contingent requires that the necessary contingent situation plays out in an environment with cause and effect. And yet Mohammed has always said that the universe had a beginning and there was nothing before and that God created the universe out of nothing. Here is the problem. You cannot analogize from cause and effect and necessary and contingent beings from within time and space 
as opposed to the very coming into being of time and space in the first place. If, in fact, the Big Bang, as is most likely, nothing preceded it, there was no time and space, you can have no cause and effect, and we can't even speak of cause and effect because there was no environment for A to cause B. Now, with respect to the notion of a necessary and contingent being, there's a problem with the concept of a necessary being. The problem is that a necessary fact cannot explain a contingent fact without introducing a new contingent fact in need of explanation. Now, let's see why this is so. If a necessary fact cannot explain a contingent fact except by entailing it, because any fact entailed by a necessary fact must itself be necessary. However, the necessary fact does not entail the contingent fact, then the explanatory connection it has to the contingent fact must be a contingent one, which introduces a new contingent fact in need of explanation. And if the defender of the argument replies that this new contingent fact can also explain by, by the necessary fact, then the same reasoning will apply, introducing yet another new contingent fact in need of explanation, and so ad infinitum, but the whole reason for introducing necessary fact in the first place was to avoid an infinite regress of explanations. Now, Mohammed said that we cannot even call something evil unless we have a moral foundation, implying that objective moral values can only exist with a supernatural being. But he doesn't explain what the connection is. For instance, I've shown you in the Bible and the Quran where, though Muhammad resists it, men are supposed to be in charge of women. I've showed you in both the Bible and the Quran where people are sent to hell forever for not just choosing the right respective religion. To say that we are in no position to judge whether God's doing that is right or wrong totally eclipses human reason. And there's another problem with that. To say objective moral values depend on God, you have to ask, is something good just because God says it is? Then it's arbitrary, and even sending sincere people to hell forever for not believing in the right religion would be okay just because God said it, or does God always tell us to do what is good, but the standard of the good is independent of God, then it means that objective moral values exist without being created by God, by God recognizes them. And you can't get out of it by saying, well, no, the good comes from God's perfect nature because we don't see that perfect nature. Now, as far as the dependence of consciousness on the physical brain is concerned, nothing mental happens without anything physical happening. There is no thought or awareness that comes into the human brain without a physical event in the brain. This is very, very important. Again, if consciousness could exist apart from the brain, then diseases and anesthetics wouldn't eclipse consciousness. Now, he talks about the coherence of the universe, and he thinks the argument from scale is not a problem. But it certainly is if, as a somebody who believes in the Quran, because he quotes the Quran a lot, he believes in a God for whom humans is central in concern, then why all these excess septillions of planets? Also, if in fact the universe is so perfectly put together, why will the star upon which we depend, the sun, burn out in a very short span of time, and then after that, we will die because the earth will no longer have the sun, and there can't be life on earth without the sun. Um, also, with respect to the whole concept of naturalism, Mohammed can't just, like I saw in one of his tapes, he tried to say, that we can infer the existence of God from the functioning of the universe, just like we can infer the existence of gravity from the way gravity operates. But you see, definitionally, gravity is how I drop something, it hits the floor or hits the table. 
but that doesn't show that there is a supernatural source behind it. Um, in terms of the laws of nature, the constants and the fine tuning, as far as that's concerned, well, the laws of physics as they appear cannot be violated, but if they are, and if you change one constant and the other, studies have shown you can still have life. For instance, there was a study that showed that you could eliminate the weak nuclear force, one of the four forces, and stars could still form. If stars could form and explode, becoming supernova, then planets could still come about. Uh, we've also seen that there is a argument from cosmic inflation, which has been demonstrated, the cosmic microwave background, and the way inflation works with quantum mechanics, that there could be a multiverse, numbers and numbers of individual universes, each with their own pockets of different physical laws. This hasn't been established by proof, but yet it is a better argument than theism because it has a basics in physics and it has natural laws that are explainable. The other thing that Mohammed has not yet addressed is he would have to admit that in 99% of all instances in human technological process, when science has looked for an answer, it has found a natural answer. So what would be those instances that differentiate the need for a natural answer to a supernatural one? In other words, if we look at a cell or a bacteria, the way it behaves, natural explanation. But we look at something else, and our answer is only God did it. There's a world of difference between looking at the fact that planets revolve around the sun and that stars don't fall out of the sky, except when they explode as supernova, and going outside right now and seeing the constellations saying, Eddie and Mohammed, you're both wrong. You better become Mormons. There's a world of difference between those two. That would be a supernatural event. Also, Mohammed has never been able to, and I don't blame him because no one can, can show how if in fact consciousness depends on a physical brain, how the greatest intelligence in the universe can exist and think and function without a physical brain. How can there be a God that doesn't have cortical neurons and synapses? How does God think when all the evidence shows that the occurrence of thought requires cortical neurons and synapses? And also, if God is outside of space and time, God cannot be a personal being, because by very definition, a personal being is defined as something within space and time that has limits. So again, naturalism prevails over supernaturalism by the weight of the evidence. And we can see that there has never been any verified supernatural occurrences, and we have seen no evidence of any mental process that can exist in a disembodied state. So the evidence to date makes it more likely than not the universe is natural, not supernatural, and there is no God. Thank you. Thank you very much to both of the debaters, both Brother Muhammad Hijab and Edward Tabash. Um, so the next session would be um, the question and answer between them both. Um, however, just because of the timing and because Maghrib has Hello everyone, thank you for joining us back again. This next section will be the cross-questioning section. The way this will work is both speakers will be at the podium. We will begin with Muhammad Hijab. He will ask a question. He'll have one minute to formulate the question. Edward, you'll have two minutes to answer. This will continue until Muhammad has been able to ask three questions. Then we will alternate. That means Edward will ask three questions. Again, each question will be one minute each. And each answer, this time by Muhammad, will be two minutes each. So if I can ask both Edward and Muhammad to join me at the podium, or go to the podium. Thank you. It would be like a duet into the... Just one mic? Okay. I think I'll go in here as well. Oh, oh, okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me when to start. I mean... 
Frank, Frank Sinatra and Dean Martin from 1950. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the only one old enough to know that joke, okay. <laughs> All right, um, do I have a minute? So let me just get yes. my stopwatch on so I know. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Um, I was going to say that you touched upon morality, and I think it's an important thing uh, to talk about because I have heard lots of your um, debates before, and I'm um, intrigued to hear your answer to the particular, this particular question. On naturalism, what scientific explanation can you provide for the existence or the objectivity of morality? The answer is that I can give a better explanation for morality on atheism than on theism, even if it's not a perfect answer. Because on theism, someone looks into a book and without any proof that God really said it, saying, well, God said it, therefore it must be true regardless of what we think about it, just because God said it, which eclipses human reason. On atheism, what we do is we wrestle it out with our reasoning, and there are a whole avenue of areas by which we can assess morality, and even if they're not perfect, they're more reliable than believing in a deity. For instance, there's consequentialism, the consequences of actions being good or bad. There is the notion that our moral values stem from our biological nature. See, the problem with saying that morality comes from God is circular, because what you're doing is you are positing a God so you can have objective moral values that you can then use to try to show that that God exists. And that is not a valid form of argument. Thank you for that answer, Eddie. Um, I've got a follow-up question, which is not on that morality thing, on something else, on naturalism. Uh, on atheistic naturalism, what scientific experiment would you conduct, for example, or could you refer us to? that tells us about the existence of mathematics. How can you prove mathematics through science? It's very easy. We prove mathematics empirically. For instance, two of one object and two of another object equals four. But what's important about that is that is so axiomatic that it couldn't be altered. For instance, God couldn't appear right now and say by divine fiat, there are three debaters standing at the podium, not two. And so mathematics and logic are actually arguments against the supernatural because they show laws of logic and laws of mathematics that cannot be altered. You see, conceptually, it doesn't even work to say God could make two and two equals five. And so on naturalism, we discover the laws of nature. We don't invent them, and they're not prescribed by anybody. So for instance, we discovered the laws of geometry. Nobody invented them. We discovered the workings of calculus. We discovered the laws of engineering. Nobody invented it that if we put up a building this way, it'll collapse. If we put up a building the other way, it will collapse. We discovered it, just like we discover what medicines work. So therefore, on naturalism, we would expect that these laws could not be altered by anyone, a god, or any other type of being. Um, the issue with that is that you know, mathematics, the mind, and all those things are first-person inquiries, whereas science is a third-person inquiry. So it would be very difficult to bridge the gap. But on this point of, once again, on naturalism, I have another question, because you made mention of some historical events. Now, obviously, we both believe in parts of history. For example, we believe in you know, the slave trade. We believe in the Holocaust. We believe in you know, things that have happened even all the way back to the prehistoric age. If witness testimony, which is what is required for history to take place, for example, uh, your mother's history uh, of what happened to her, or whatever it may be, how can you how can you legitimize witness testimony on naturalism? And if it's not legitimized, does that mean that we can deny things like slavery, the Holocaust, and so on? Well, you see, the answer to that is by empirical evidence, we know that certain things can happen. 
if I said that I flew here on an airplane today, nobody would question it. If I said I just flapped my arms and flew here bodily, you would question it. If I told you that somebody crossed a river to get to the other side, you would accept it. If I told you that somebody was levitated from one side of the river to the other, you wouldn't. This shows that we have an inbuilt already recognition through logic and reason and experience of understanding eyewitness events that are within the realm of what we know to be probable and those which are not. If I said that somebody drove me here tonight for the debate in a car, you would believe me. If I said space aliens picked me up in an interstellar spacecraft and brought me here, you wouldn't believe me. So we shouldn't shy away from the common sense experience that already helps us distinguish the natural from the supernatural. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay. Um, Mohammed, I'm handing you yes. uh, five different translations of Surah 434. Yes. Um, each one talks about men being in charge of women and there's nothing corresponding about women being in charge of men. And each of the seven translations from different respected translators of the Quran speak about husbands having the right to, under circumstances of defiance and arrogance, beat their wives. Do you agree or disagree with both men ruling over women in the surah and the permission to beat them as set forth in the surah? I certainly disagree with the translation because the word qawwamun in Arabic means maintainers and protectors. And this word qama yakumu literally means to stand up. And that's why you'll find that the majority of translators translate it like that. As for the verse that talks about uh, daraba, which is the Arabic word, almost there is a consensus among the scholars of Islam that this is not to be in vengeful or attacking or hurt, harmful or hurtful uh, action. This is talking about something which is Symbolic, and the evidence of that is that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam he said, "La darar wa la duran," that you cannot harm or reciprocate harm. So I think there is a problem here with the understanding of the verse, and also the Prophet said, "La tadribu ima Allah," don't hit the women slaves of Allah, meaning the women. And he said, "The worst of you are those who hit the women," and that's why I think if you look at the totality of evidence, um, then there is a bit more nuance than you think. Okay. Uh, Muhammad, you quoted the Quran a lot tonight. Let me ask you, why is the Quran a more credible final revelation of God, having been dictated to the prophet by the angel Gabriel, than the Book of Mormon as the final revelation of God, having been dictated in the 19th century in upstate New York by the angel Moroni to the prophet Joseph Smith? The reason why is because the Quran has certain parameters and certain challenges that the Book of Mormon doesn't have. For example, it has the inimitability challenge, it has the preservation challenge. The Quran is the only preserved book. It has predictions that predict the future that couldn't have been known at the time. On probability, we find it very difficult. I'll explain that in the conclusion when I'll give you, when I'll give you more expansion of what I'm saying. The Quran has a language that completely descopes or descoped the Arabic language of the people of the time, and it was recognized by those linguists as something which was extraordinary. The Quran has a structural feature that even Orientalist scholars like Raymond Farron have looked at and said that this is something which cannot be possible considering the circumstantial revelation of the Quran. So there's many reasons. And I think the main point is the Quran gives us a falsification challenge. And since you're a fan of science, the fact that it gives us a falsification challenge makes it, in many ways, quite scientific. Okay. Um, Mohammed, you have many times embrace what we would call the Kalam cosmological argument, the first cause argument. If in fact time and space began with the Big Bang, and if something cannot come from nothing, but God created, Allah created the world ex nihilo out of nothing, how did an immaterial being with no physical attributes, no physical brain or body, create everything around us in a context where there was no time and space for A to cause B, how did he do it? How did, what was the mechanism by which this immaterial being without time and space created time and space and matter? 
Well, as the Arabs say, Adam al Dalil lays al al Adam. So it's this argument from ignorance. If we don't know how something works, it doesn't mean it is false. However, having said that, there is no agreement among Muslims that the universe was created ex nihilo. So there were some people, like Al Ghazali and others, who did believe this. But other people, like Ibn Taymiyyah, believed that God perpetually created different things pre eternally. So once again, there is a scope of interpretation in the Islamic text. Either way, the point is. Causation doesn't even factor in here because cause, a cause is something which brings rise to phenomena, whereas dependency is something which is relying on something else. So time or no time, whether you believe in the A theory of time or the B theory of time, you still have to reckon, you have to deal with the fact that you have things which rely upon each other, and if we compile all the things which rely upon each other together, you would have no existence. So you have to have an independence. So the contingency argument does not rely upon causality, which is why, to be frank with you, I didn't make it as a main argument for myself. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. That concludes the cross rapid fire question uh, portion of the debate. The last portion of the debate will be the audience Q&A. Uh, I'll quickly give an overview of how this is supposed to work. I have three questions here for Mohammed, three questions here for Edward, one for both of you. I will ask the question, whoever it is directed towards will have two minutes to respond, and then two minutes will be given to the other person to also respond, presenting their own perspective. So with that, I will begin with the first question. Uh, okay, before I do that, I have a request if people can actually not use the Wi-Fi. I think we have too many people and it's crashing the live stream. <laughs> so if you guys have data, Verizon is great. Um, right, okay. <clears throat> All right, so we'll begin. The first question is directed towards Mohammed. Uh, why would God not show himself when he knows the controversy that goes through everyone's mind? Well, it's a good question. Thank you very much. The question has an empiricist presupposition, which is that, in fact, knowledge should be known through the five senses. Well, as we've discovered today, that's not actually the case. So things like the logic or the, the logic through which science is done is actually based on metaphysical logical principles. Time is not seen. Uh, mathematics is not based on science. There are lots of things which are felt, uh, which, are, which are found out without the empirical method. So the this empirical naturalistic presupposition is rejected, and if we look at the development of philosophy in the 20th century, we'll find that even people like A.J. Ayer, who wrote a book on positivism, he admits to some of these uh, things, and he capitulates intellectually uh, to these points. So, frankly, what I'll say to you is that it, the, 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 answer, the question is flawed, it's based on an empiricist presupposition, which would mean, by extension, that science itself couldn't exist because it's based on presuppositions which are unscientific, otherwise unempirical. Thank you. The issue is there are things like logic and mathematics where the very working out of the theorem show you the truthfulness or falsity. However, the question of whether God exists or not is a factual question and thus makes it subject to an empirical investigation. Whether there is such an all-powerful being in the universe is a factual question akin to whether space aliens have visited us, whether in fact we do live after death or not. When it comes to questions of fact, the empirical method does apply. But there's another problem here in that both the Bible and the Quran unmistakably promise eternal punishment for non-belief. As a matter of fundamental fairness, we can say that it is unfair of God to punish us for not believing in him if he withholds evidence that would enable us to believe in him, and that's the argument from divine hiddenness. So the laws of logic and mathematics don't have causative properties. So you can't say the number seven as an abstraction causes something to happen, but you can say, and they do say, as Muhammad does, God does cause things to happen, and if an agent has causative powers, and can make or break something that's subject to empirical investigation. Thank you both. Uh, second question, this is directed towards you, Edward. Why are atheists focused on a god that would serve us? Any god would not function to offer us what we want. What? 
So the question is basically, if a, if a god exists, why are, why are atheists so focused on the fact that a god like that would serve us because God himself is transcendent and he would not necessarily function to offer us what we want? Okay, the question though has a problem and that's that if you accept an abstract deity that has not claimed to have been revealed to humanity, then it's understandable that God would not tailor the evidence to meet our needs. But if a God has supposedly given us a number of revelations, Bible, Quran, Book of Mormon, whatever else, then we have a right to use our reason to expect that such a God is intending to reveal itself to us and the failure of that God to fill in the gaps of the revelation or the failure of that God to provide us with a reliable revelation makes non-belief reasonable. If non-belief is reasonable, it's inculpable and we are not blameworthy for non-belief because we weren't given sufficient evidence. If we are not blameworthy for non-belief, then it's unfair to punish us for not believing what we didn't have sufficient evidence to believe. And if we are punished for not believing what we didn't have sufficient evidence to believe, then that calls God's moral perfection into question because we are being punished unjustly. Can I add to it? Or? Yeah, yes, yes. Yeah, have one minute. No, two. Oh, okay. Um, to your one. I agree with him, actually. Um, and this is a point of agreement, actually, between me and Edward. And I think the reason why he's using this argument is potentially because he had conversations with Christians before where the theology is a little bit different. But the, the premise is true. What Edward is saying is absolutely correct. In fact, if God doesn't reveal himself to you and then punishes you as a result, this is unjust. And that's why the Quran says, وَمَا كُنَّ مُعَذِّبِينَ حَتَّى نَبْعَثَ رَسُولًا Chapter 17 verse 15, that we were not going to punish them until we sent them a messenger. So scholars of Islam said, even if you die an atheist, or a Hindu, or a Christian, and even though you're born with this fitrah, with this predisposition, which wasn't tackled, hopefully you'll talk about it, this predisposition to believe in God, which we have evidence for now, even though all of that is in place, God will still not punish those individuals until they're given sufficient exposure and that is exactly correct. I think you're right. Thank you. Uh, the next question is directed towards Muhammad. So it's basically the case of bad design. In science, there is a concept of vestigial futures, futures that are a hindrance or otherwise less than perfect in many organisms. If the universe runs without inconsistency, what would explain vestigial futures? And the particular example is that was given is the woman's pelvis, which is far too small and creates a very difficult and painful birthing process. Well, I think this is called the argument of ignorance. Just because you don't know the function of something, it doesn't mean it's functionless. So for example, we don't know what the appendix does. It doesn't mean it has no function. It just means we haven't discovered that yet. We don't know why two electrons can be in one place at the same time on quantum mechanics. It doesn't mean that's a false notion, even though it goes against the rules of logic and it goes against some of the things, conventions that we believe in. So just because you don't know something, it doesn't make it false. So that's the first point. As for the second point of bad design, I mean, who's the judge of bad design? I mean, at least with the fine-tuning argument, you have some kind of probability, mathematical probability that can be attached to this kind of uh, equation. You're saying that the chances of there not being you know, a universe or the universe having a non-life-permitting range is x, which is a mathematical kind of uh, uh, rendering. So, here, we have to be kind of honest here and say that this is an aesthetic value judgment at best. And aesthetic value judgments are not our opinions, frankly. They're your opinion. If you see something that's bad design, that's your opinion. You might think it's bad design, but there might be a reason. Now, there's one more thing I want to add because I've got a minute left. I think people have misunderstood my, under my argument from uniformity. I'll add it to the conclusion. Like my good friend Faraz Zahabi mentioned one time in a podcast that I've done with him. For example, let's take a coin. If we flip a coin, it can either be heads or tails. Today, we can flip it, it's either going to be heads or tails. Tomorrow is going to be either heads or tails. We don't expect the coin to be flipped and turn into a butterfly. Why? Because we accept that there's a kind of coherence that exists, there are kind of constants that exist. So in order to do science, you need to know, or you need to presuppose, that this uniformity exists. Otherwise, your calculations today will be meaningless tomorrow. And that's why Albert Einstein said, 
that a priori we expect a chaotic universe. Meaning, from the mind, you expect there not to be this kind of order. So this underpins, or it's even more undercutting, if you like, than the fine-tuning argument, which is why I presented it. So that's, that's it. Thank you. The problem is that when you posit a god who is supposed to be all-powerful and morally perfect, then defects in our design are not justified based on those attributes of God. For instance, I pointed out how the gene that can help fight malaria can also cause sickle cell anemia. We know that we humans have back problems because we stood up too soon. Uh, we know that there are defects in our bodies. We could be more resistant to cancer. We could be more resistant to viruses. Uh, we could have a better digestive system. So. God cannot get off the hook here because he is presented as an all-powerful being who is morally perfect. An all-powerful being who is morally perfect doesn't make these missteps in design. And we already know our vulnerability to disease. Uh, for instance, we already know that we just have a very few decades to be in good condition, and then as we get older, we begin to decline. And so that's not something that we would expect from a morally perfect God. Uh, we wouldn't expect unnecessary pain. If God wants us to take our hand off the fire so we don't get burned, we would expect pain. But if we're trapped in a burning forest and we burn to death painfully, pain has no value. And we wouldn't expect that unnecessary suffering with no purpose on theism. It's more likely on atheism. So given the claims of God's moral perfection and omnipotence, uh, defects in design are not defensible. Thank you. Next question. This is to you, Edward. Uh, you said there is no evidence to prove the existence of God. What proof do you personally need to believe, and how would you recognize that? You see, this is the difference between me and a religious person. I'm subject to evidence. Religions don't change regardless of the evidence, but an empirically minded atheist like me would. If right now Muhammad and I were levitated to the ceiling, if my father who was dead for 18 years walked in this room right now in his inimitable Yiddish accent, and I recognized him asking me why I'm not in my office working, and then floated <laughs> in the air, and, 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 and said, uh, both of you, Mormonism is the true religion. If Muhammad and I right now were teleported to Mecca and I saw the most amazing astronomical displays telling me to become a Muslim right away, I would. Now you might say, well, this is the result of an advanced space alien, but being an evidentialist, I would believe it's a supernatural being until someone showed me that it was advanced space aliens. So the difference between atheists like me and those who subscribe to religion is we are open to changing if we have direct evidence, whereas there are very few religious people who would say, if this happened, I would not believe in God, whereas atheists like me can clearly say, if the following things happen, I will believe in God, but we all know they won't happen. But if they did, I would. Can I add to it? Yes, yes. we've got two minutes. We both. Yeah. Um, the first point on not being religious, it, dep it depends on how you define religion. Because frankly, if you take a, like an Emil Durkheim approach, who's a sociologist, he defined religion in more broad terms than would be found in vernacular, vernacularly in dictionaries, for example, which has to be through God or whatever. Frankly, you could make the argument that atheist people are very religious, in so much as they have axioms and they have leaps of faith which they believe in. For instance, if we take, for example, science, science and especially something like quantum physics, you don't do the experiments yourself. You rely upon witness testimony. You don't go into the laboratory and ex repeat experiments X amount of times in order to believe it. So in order for you to have an understanding of science, you have to have a leap of faith in trusting those individuals who teach you about science, your teachers, your school books, and so on. I mean, you believe in equality. And once again, these are precepts which, frankly, are axiomatic, meaning they don't have any evidence to substantiate them. Even John Locke, who is the founder of liberalism, 
He, he based it on God, by the way. And that's why in, your, in the, uh, you know, the Declaration of Independence, created beings is being referred to over and over again. So really, you don't have a right, a epistemic right, to, call, to talk about equality without having some kind of leap of faith, frankly, in those things. So atheists have faith all the time. They have faith in things they don't see. They have faith in things they don't interact with. And what I'm going to say is that this is where, as John Gray said, some people can wrap a, you know, a discussion of ideology in sociological format and make it seem as if it's a religious. But in fact, it is actually, in terms of its conventions and epistemic weight, the same as any kind of religious belief. Uh, as for levitating and so on, well, you believe in uh, levitating, but it just has to happen in the quantum physics realm where things do levitate and things do flow. Harry Potter exists in the quantum physics world, but an atheist would never believe it unless a scientist told them. That's belief, that's faith. Thank you. Uh, next question to Mohammed. Would God provide us with autonomy, and does that negate the good and evil argument? Can you, can you be? Yeah. Would God provide us with autonomy, our free will, and does that negate the good and evil argument? Yes, so on Islamic uh, traditionalism, God has endowed us with what you call khayar, or the idea of choice and free will. And in fact, evil is a necessary part of that, because if you don't have evil, you cannot make a decision. There will just be good and good to decide from. You can't decide from good and good. There has to be good and bad. And therefore, you must be tested. A test makes no sense with the, existence, with the non-existence of evil. A test makes no sense with the non-existence of evil. So, sometimes the bad thing can be good for you. The Quran says, you could hate something, but it's actually very good for you. And the thing is, on theism, on Islamic theism, we believe in another domain. It's a metaphysical domain, which is Yawm Al-Qiyamah, the Day of Judgment. Whereby all of those things that we are wronged in the dunya, the worldly life, you'll be recompensed for that. So we don't believe that when a child dies, that's just a random rearrangement of atoms, as would be the case, by the way, on naturalism. It's a random rearrangement of atoms. If I slap a snowman and I knock his head off, it's the same as if I cut a kid's head off. Because it's just on naturalism, frankly, it's just you know, a rearrangement of atoms. And in order for you to make any sense of that, you'd have to impose a subjective value judgment on it, which you'd have to have faith in order to have in the first place. So frankly, I mean, what we believe is that the injustices of this world, Hitler, for example, was a very unjust man, killed six million individuals. He will be punished, hopefully, perpetually, in a domain where in which the punishment is not limited. Justice cannot be done on naturalism. It can only be done on a kind of system, a metaphysical system, which that undoes all of the wrongs that happened in this world. Um, we may not like the implications of a godless world, but that doesn't mean that a god will come into existence just to rescue us from those implications. We may not like the fact that we end at death, but that doesn't mean a god will come about just so that we don't end at death if that God doesn't otherwise exist. Uh, the concept of free will is given more credit than it deserves. If you have two children, you don't let one of your children push the other off a cliff just so as not to interfere in free will. And so the question of free will or even the benefits of it do not justify the extreme pain and the extreme suffering that we undergo. So for instance, if we need to feel pain when we put our hand on a hot stove, that's understandable. But that pain does not serve a useful purpose if we are being innocently burnt by evil people and we have to suffer that agonizing death. So the fact that there is gratuitous, unnecessary, unexplained, horrendous suffering goes way beyond necessary slight evils and suffering which would have a beneficial and corrective purpose. So we can't say that any amount of suffering or any amount of horrible experience is justified because we need that in which to distinguish the good. Even a small amount of evil 
or a bearable amount of evil is enough to distinguish the good. It is the presence of unexplained, gratuitous, horrendous suffering that is incompatible with an all-good and all-powerful God. Thank you. Uh, last question directed towards Edward. I'll just summarize. Um, essentially, Islam provides objective morality. Do you believe there is such a thing as objective morality? And if so, how would you explain why atheists 30 years ago would object to, say, homosexuality? Well, I believe that there are objective moral values, and they're not prescribed by anybody. There is no lawgiver. Now, I was just asked 30 years ago how atheists would have responded to homosexuality. This actually proves my point. 30 years ago, many atheists may not have recognize the importance of allowing such personal freedom. What that means is not that anybody who condemned uh, persons who love those of the same gender were right or wrong then. It meant that we hadn't yet discovered the truth that these are people that deserve equal rights. So for instance, in the 1950s when I was growing up, people would be arrested for being gay. They would be put in prison for being gay. The fact that we don't do that now, and it's been illegal to do so in any state since 2003, shows that the more we evolve, the more we discover these moral truths. Not that somebody invents them and imposes us on them, that by our natural development, we discover these truths. For instance, it used to be that religious people would burn women accused of being witches. But we don't do that anymore because we discovered the moral truth that it's wrong to do that to these women, uh, irrespective of the Bible saying, thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. So the more we get away from religious fundamentalist edicts, the more moral and tolerant we become, which shows that morality cannot be dependent on religious fundamentalist or orthodox edicts because it is our pulling away from them that makes us more moral, more compassionate, and more tolerant. You get two minutes. I get two minutes, okay. But I don't know what religious edicts the American founding fathers had used in order to for at least some period of time, allow slavery, racist slavery, uh, what Stalin used in order to do what he did, what Hitler used, frankly, to do what he did. This is not the work of religion. This is the work of people who use ideological justification in order to commit certain acts. The same way as which some people, it's conceivable to think that some religious people will use religious justification in order to commit certain acts. So I don't think there should be an epistemic preferencing of one uh, one thing over another here. I think we should just realize that uh, epistemology drives us to certain forces, certain things, and you can't really say, well, religion is better than non-religion. Once again, that would de depend on how you define religion in the first place. But having said all of that, I mean, we've talked a lot about gay rights today and all those things, but on the harm principle, which is what John Stuart Mill proposed, part of social, uh, social liberalism, that you can do whatever you want so long as you don't harm anyone else, well, frankly, that would entail that uh, sex between a brother and sister or a brother and a brother, so long as there's contraception used and there's no deformed babies, that should be allowed as well. And I haven't seen anyone doing incest right activism uh, in America for a very long time. And frankly, on liberalism, that's what you should do. You know, just because they're a minority group of people that are still in the closet, in the incest closet, it doesn't mean now that they should be treated any less on liberalism. So I think we have to be we have to be um, completely honest with ourselves in our social analysis, and if what we're doing is selecting certain social things which have become popular in the 21st century to make a case about God's existence, then I think really we're being academically disingenuous. So I think at the end of the day, whatever principle you're gonna have, you have to apply it uh, across the board, and if it is the harm principle on social liberalism, then incest should be allowed in this country, and people should be able to do that. Thank you. Final question. Uh, this is directed to both of you. Uh, Edward, because you began, I'll start with Mohammed. Please address the viability of Pascal's wager. 
Well, I mean, Pascal is kind of like, it's not really an argument, to be honest with you, which is why I didn't kind of make it. Pascal was a famous mathematician who talked about, you know, basically making a wager, you know, betting on the fact that God, God exists because, the, um, because doing otherwise may mean that, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll die and go to hell and so on, and so therefore it makes sense to do that. What we're saying is that, fair enough, there is some truth in that. I mean, if you think about it, the Quran actually affirms some of that, where it says, you know, uh, What if it was from God? What if this was from God? And you are disbelieving in it. So it's a thought experiment, right? It's, it's more of a thought experiment rather than an argument. So I think the maximum we can do with it is use that as a thought experiment, make people think about death, you know, make people think about the fact that they're going to die, and what kind of ideology or what kind of belief system they want to have with them when they are in their graves, frankly, because atheism will not do anything as a matter of fact. Now, I'm not saying therefore God exists, because that's not an argument. I've made that clear. It's not an argument to say, well, the implications of atheism is that, you know, you're going to be in the sick bed, you're going to be maybe 75 years old, one in two people in the United States of America are going to have cancer, just like in the UK, according to cancer research. And what is better for you? I mean, as to be optimistic that there's going to be continuation of that life, or to know that actually you're going to just become bones and dust. Obviously, from an implications perspective, theism, and especially theism with afterlife implications, has better impl optimistic implications for you. Your, your memories will be wiped away, your experiences will be wiped away, and your bodies will be wiped away. That's atheist naturalism. But the implications of, um, of theism is that actually there will be continuation, this is just the beginning. And so this is not an argument, but it is an implication. Well, there is a problem with Pascal's wager. Now, Muhammad just admitted that the Quran does talk about punishment and hell for not believing in Islam as the Bible talks about punishment and hell for not believing in Christianity. What Pascal's wager did was it made the error of automatically assuming that if there is a God, this being will judge us by how we worship this being rather than how good we are to each other. And so the wager actually is false because it presupposes without proof that God is such an evil being if there is a God that regardless of how good we are, unless we adopt the right religion, we will burn in hell forever. Now, I'm sure that Pascal, who was a Christian, would not have accepted that someone is meeting the wager if they were a Muslim. And I think that the defect is whenever we say, without any evidence whatsoever, other than ancient hearsay in ancient books, which we know were written by fallible men, as women weren't even involved in the writing of these books, when we say, we are certain that the ultimate force in the universe will punish you unless you adopt my religion. That is nothing but primitive exclusivism. Well, we, I think we got one more. Yeah. Thank you both. Uh, that concludes our audience Q&A. We will now proceed to the closing statements. Each person will have 15 minutes to give theirs, and we will begin with Muhammad. I have a right to go get your notes. Uh, okay, why not, why not? Yeah. Get my, I have a right to get my notes. Yeah, sure. Do you like a lawyer now? Yeah, no, I don't want to take up your All right, uh, please calm down. 15 minutes left. Nearly finished. I'll start when it's quiet. I'll start when it's quiet. Just to quickly, I'm starting now, just to quickly uh, kind of comment on the last thing that he talked about. 
ancient hearsay and so on. Democracy is an ancient concept. Liberalism is an ancient concept. It's still, it's still adopted by um, you know, mainstream society. That's the genetic fallacy, basically, to criticize something based on where it came from. At any rate, I found it quite interesting in the last um, speech that um, Eddie, Edward had, he actually made an interesting capitulation. He admitted that 99% of things natural science can explain. That means 1% of things are supernatural. That means miracles are possible. So that is very happy. I'm happy to hear that. All right. Secondly now, what he's talked about, about cause and effect. Now, the definition of a cause is something which brings rise to phenomena. I can cause a house to be. For example, I can build a house, yes? I can build a house. But I can die and the house will continue to be, yes? So I don't need to exist in order for the house to continue existing. Dependence, on the other hand, is when you rely on something else. So he made the mistake of saying that contingency, which is dependence, relies upon cause and effect. It doesn't. Which is why I didn't really mention cause and effect to avoid this discussion altogether. Let us agree for the sake of arguments. Okay? Let's agree that there's no such thing as cause and effect. The contingency argument, the way I framed it, is still valid. Because I didn't mention cause and effect at all. Let me tell you why. Bertrand Russell, interesting atheist, when he was commenting on the cosmological argument, the cosmological argument, Ghazali's argument that William Lane Craig and those other guys are making popular now in this country, it's Ghazali's argument, everything that begins to exist has a cause. The universe began to exist, therefore the universe has a cause. Okay. So Bertrand Russell said, but this is the problem of composition. Because you're saying that just because there are causes in the universe, it doesn't mean that that cause will be applied to the universe. So he says, for example, just because we have mothers as part of the human race, it doesn't mean that the human race itself has mother. Imagine a wall, like Trump likes walls. Yeah, you have a wall. Just because, this is Bertrand Russell, it's a very valid argument. He says, just because a wall is made up of small parts, it doesn't mean that the wall itself is small. He's right. Bertrand Russell was right. However, what if the wall is made up of red parts? The wall itself can be red. So the fallacy of composition is a double-edged sword. Because in order for it to be a proper fallacy, it needs to have perfect knowledge of the whole. If you don't have perfect knowledge of the whole, you can't claim it to be a fallacy. So both the theist and the atheist are in a gridlock. Because the atheist is saying, well, it can't be the small part, it can't be the big. But the theist is saying, well, the red part can make, red bricks can make a red wall. And both can be possible, but both both can be argued against. You see? So this is why I use the contingency argument. Let me bring back the argument that I used. Causation. For the sake of argument, no problem. You can have causation. Let's pretend, you know, there's no causation. Let's pretend. No problem. Let's pretend. But it's possible that it can exist and it's possible that it can't outside the universe on a logical basis. However, contingency, dependence, I made an ontological argument, a mathematical argument. You have a set. Things within the set are all dependent. Yes? Now, you can't have the existence of things if everything is dependent on everything else. If existence depends upon dependent things, existence would never exist. You have two options. Either there's an independent outside or this thing itself is the independent. The series is the independent. And what is it? The independent, the necessary independent. However, is it conceivable to think of this series if we take out D2 as different? Yes. And we said a possible existence is something which can be rearranged. Wait a minute now, this is a serious argument. I'm not going to be William Lane Craig here today. I know you're used to this. I use his, his um, debate with William Lane Craig. This is his argument. I know the weaknesses of the argument. I didn't use this argument. I want the most undercutting argument. No one can crack this argument. I've read from Plato to Leibniz all the way through to Russell. And believe me, this is the argument no one can solve. 
This is the uncrackable code. So he tried to crack the code by saying, well, the necessary existence should be, should have the entailment of the dependent things. Well, I'm saying the complete opposite. I'm saying that it's impossible for it to be made up of parts and still be the necessary existence. Because a possible existence is a, an existence that is subject to change. So, to use this phraseology, if we look at the weight of the evidence, the totality of the evidence, where extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence, we have an extraordinary evidence. We have an absolutely extraordinary evidence, which works in the mind mathematically, and works in physical reality cosmologically, and works on first principles. And we get the independent, self-sufficient one entity, which we as Muslims call Allah. That's it. What if there's a multiverse? What if there's a multiverse? No problem. Have a multiple, an infinite amount of universes. Or not even just universes, because why discriminate f towards universes? Creations. You still you need something to depend upon those things. And we said it can't be that because you can envisage taking a, a, a universe in and out. And so it's dependent upon the structure. It's over. You see here, it's important to be honest with ourselves. He's a lawyer. A lot of lawyers are referred to as liars, but he's not one of them. He's a good man. And as a lawyer, when he goes into the, the, the courtroom, he refers to witness testimony. He makes abductive arguments, like CSI, uh, CSI forensics put the evidences together. It's not God of the gaps, just in the same ways if you put food for a dog, and then you go away, and the, and the food is eaten, you're not going to say that's a dog of the gaps argument. It's just an abductive inference, which he does every time. And if it's not that, if, if you don't do an abductive inference, then all of the cases he's represented have been miscarriages of justice, which I'm sure he wouldn't do. And the point here is this. The point is, when we put the totality of evidence, asking for more evidence, you know what it's like? When we've given you ontological, metaphysical, a priori, a posteriori, scientific, physical, mathematic, probabilistic evidences, it's like asking for a torch when you're in the middle of daylight. Give me a torch. But <laughs> why do you need a torch, my friend? Everything around you, you're locked into the arguments. Everywhere you go, there's arguments. There's evidence, there's science, even to the extent whereby, even to the extent whereby you're born with that feeling of believing in God. And then you have to socially construct, according to Justin Barrett and others, your atheism. Just like you use other social constructed ideas, like second wave feminism, liberalism. I don't think people that wrote about liberalism were women, by the way. You were talking about what about these men, they were all men. Liberalism is written by men, John Locke, John Stuart Mill, Rousseau, Montesquieu, <laughs> uh, Thomas Hobbes. I don't, hear, I don't see any women's names there. So frankly, let's not play these games. What I will say is this. What I will say is, as Muslims, we have additional evidence. And this is the evidence from Revelation. The Quran says, that the Romans had been defeated in low land, nearby land, and after that defeat they will become victorious. It makes predictions which materialize. And look at this, just as one piece of evidence, and you can look at my videos for more, but this is just one thing. When someone makes a succession of predictions of the future, what is the probability that some of those predictions will be false. If you add all of those things and you aggregate them in your total probability chart, and you ask the question, if someone makes all of these, if someone makes all of these predictions of the future, like the Quran does, what's the probability that this could have been a guess? Well, there's a way of finding that out through mathematical probability theory, for example, or epistemic probability. So, frankly, we do have an argument. 
It's not, and by the way, there's something else here, very important. He made a good point. He made a very good point. He said that, why is it the case that miracles are confined or time-bound? He's right. For a Christian, that would be a great argument. If you say to a Christian, how comes Jesus rose the dead when we couldn't see it? Absolutely right about that. Where the Quran says, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا كَافَةً لِلنَّاسِ We have not sent you to, except for, to Muhammad, all of humankind. The reason why those prophetic miracles were localized, like Jesus, or Moses splitting the sea, or whatever it may be, is because it appealed, or is meant to appeal, to that time and that people. As for the Quran, itself it claims to be the miracle. It's an auditory miracle, so that you can analyze it in any time and any place. So it's not giving an unfair advantage to the primary audience. You can try and falsify the Quran now. It gives you a way to try and do so. You can try and imitate the Quran now. It challenges you to do, challenges you to do so. And you can try and look at those things in the Quran which claim to be happening in the future and analyze whether they did in hindsight now because we have seen whether that happened or not. For example, these are some examples. Now, in the last two or three minutes, I want to say something important. Putting this discussion to the side. You know, Edward is one of our friends here in America. And the reason why I'm putting this in the end is because I've kind of finished everything and I wanted to say this. He works actively to promote the rights of Muslims in this country. And it's people like Edward that allow for Muslims in this country and in the West to be able to be guaranteed the same kind of freedoms, frankly, that other, every other person should have. And I believe that if you're going to believe in something, be consistent with it. And though maybe not in the field of atheism and God's existence, he might not be fully consistent, but in his morality, he's a man of consistency. He opposes Trump's ban on Muslims. He's a friend of the Muslims. And what I want to end off by saying here is, this is the kind of person who we're happy to have as a friend of the Muslim community here in the USA. We need... <laughs> Honestly, after things like the Christchurch massacre or other terrorist attacks happening on both sides, bad things are happening, we need to be able to build bridges. I believe Edward is the man, or the kind of person Edward is, is the kind of person we need to be friends with, we need to invite to our houses, we need to be kind to, we need to show courtesy to, and we need to respect highly, despite religious or ideological disagreements. We will agree to disagree, but we will also agree to agree where our interests are mutual and where we can oppose a common threat to both of our existences. Edward is consistent because he does not like arbitrariness, which is, a, which is a theme in liberalism, where one community are not treated the same as another community. If there's a law and you believe in liberalism, let that law be applied to everyone. And he's done some great work. He has done some great work opposing arbitrary kinds of judgments that have happened in different states. And he was telling me about that. And really and truly, we take our hat off to him and, his, and people like him. <laughs> finally, finally, I want to say in my last half a minute left, that if I said anything to offend anyone here, that I apologize, that that was not my intention. And that obviously this is a subject which we really feel passionate about. And as a superior to me in knowledge and experience, I want to thank from the bottom of my heart Edward's contribution to today's discussion. It's been edifying, it's been brilliant for me, and I'm sure it's been fantastic for you. You're welcome at any time. I'm sure I can say that on behalf of the university. And hopefully we can meet another day. Thank you very much.
Well, thank you, Mohammed. The issue that Mohammed raises, again, pinning his argument on the concept of a necessary being. Remember the problem with that is the problem is that a necessary fact cannot explain a contingent fact without introducing a new contingent fact in need of explanation. And to see why, notice that a necessary fact cannot explain a contingent fact by entailing it, because then any fact entailed by a necessary fact must itself be necessary, and this sets up the regression uh, all the way back into the past, which Mohammed is trying to avoid. Now, with respect to my comment that 99% of all scientific discoveries will show to be natural, that doesn't mean the 1% will be supernatural. It means the opposite. It means the likelihood of anything being supernatural is very implausible. And the way I said it was that unless something appears miraculous, like the stars rearranging themselves telling us what to do, it is a god of the gaps argument. Uh, as far as the Quran's prediction is concerned, both the Quran and the Bible have failed to make the kinds of pure predictions which would show the supernatural. Now, with respect to the Quran, it was finished in 632, but it was not codified into a final written form until uh, 20, 18 years later in 650 by the Caliph Uthman. And now, the only earliest version we have of a 90% complete Quranic text is from the uh, mid 8th century, which could be almost 80 years after the Quran was initially uh, given to Muhammad. Now, another problem is with respect to translations. Every time I point out something to Muhammad about the translations that I have before me, even eight or nine of them, his response is he disagrees with the translation. I don't necessarily disagree that Muhammad might understand the Quran in the original Arabic far better than all these translations. My argument is from divine hiddenness, if the Quran is God's ultimate revelation to humanity, it is inconsistent with that purpose for us who speak only English not to have a reliable translation. Uh, Muhammad was not able to demonstrate how an immaterial, incorporeal being created time and space. See, what Muhammad was trying to do as a valiant attempt was to rescue, was to rescue some vestige of the supernatural from a purely natural universe, and ultimately it was unsuccessful. He was not able to refute at all my argument from evolution. He did not refute my argument from evil, he was not able to explain how an all-powerful God that can prevent a lot of evil still has to allow so much evil. He did not adequately refute my argument from divine hiddenness because he was not able to give a reason why a God who wants us to know his will would withhold the very evidence that we need to be able to believe in that God. I, as an atheist, gave you clear examples of the type of miraculous occurrences which would make me turn into a believer. In fact, if my dead father appeared right now, transported Muhammad and me to Mecca, and told me, and I knew it was my dad, that since dying he realized that Islam was the perfect religion, I would convert right away. So I'm subject to and open to the evidence. The other thing that Muhammad did not refute was my claim that the Quran, like the Bible, the Quran, like the Bible, demands eternal punishment for choosing the wrong religion. I believe that we human beings have a right to use our reason and sense of justice to say that it is wrong 
for any all-powerful deity to condemn innocent people to eternal suffering because of an honest mistake in choosing the wrong religion. And so I believe to that extent, the Bible and the Quran are equally, uh, equally false. However, I have to say, the Quran did improve on the Bible in one area. If you read Jeremiah 19.9, you see that God threatens to make people eat their sons and daughters. Uh, in the Quran, there's no such vestige of cannibalism. So if God does exist, I thank him for in between the Bible and the Quran taking human flesh off the menu. <laughs> okay. Okay. The, uh, Muhammad was unable to refute the argument against a transcendental person. Because if you are a person, you have to have some boundary, some limit. To say that you are not in time and space and you are in time and space, what are we talking about? It's like some guy standing up waist deep in a hot tub. He's half in and half out. How can you be partially in time? How can God enter time? In order to enter time, you have to have a beginning in time. A timeless being cannot do anything. Either can an immaterial being. Now, I know that the concept that death is the end is very difficult for most people to tolerate. But on atheism, what's true is not what we would like to be true. What's true is what cold hard reality shows is true. There is no example whatsoever of conscious self-awareness being able to exist without a fully functional physical brain. If it were so, then Alzheimer's disease would not be able to eclipse consciousness. Again, Alzheimer's disease eclipses your consciousness, but when you die, you're fully intact in an immaterial form. It can't happen that way. Also, the argument from evolution with the common ancestry that we have with apes. We didn't evolve from apes, but we spun off and had a common ancestor. If you look at the fossil record of the precursors to Homo sapiens, who we are now, you see we evolved from a more primitive life form. Both the Bible and the Quran accept the notion of Adam and Eve. You can't have an Adam and Eve if evolution is true, which it is, because there was no such thing as the first perfect human couple. We evolved like any other creature. So if there was no Adam and Eve, both the Bible and the Quran are wrong in saying that there was, and of course if there was no Adam and Eve, then Christianity is completely wrong in talking about the sin in the Garden of Eden. Now uh, another thing that Muhammad was unable to do was to demonstrate, and I've seen other Muslim apologists try to do this, was to demonstrate that the language or the mode of Arabic itself used in the Quran had to have a divine authorship. You can have advanced language or poetic or useful verse, or you can make innovations in language, but that does not show that there was a supernatural origin. Also, he failed to show us what specific predictions in the Quran took, were made that turned out to be true. On one of his uh, YouTube videos, he talks about a Roman war which the Quran uh, predicted the Romans would lose. Well, I looked it up. That war ended in 628 CE and the Quran was finished in 632 CE. So the Quran did not predict anything in the future. Uh, the other aspect of all of this is the incompatible properties of the concept of God, the very concept of God. God cannot be both omnipotent and omniscient. If God is omnipotent, it means God can do anything, including change his mind. But if God is omniscient, he always knew what he was going to do in the very end, so he cannot change his mind. So therefore, the properties of omniscience and omnipotence are incompatible. Uh, with respect to the 
fine-tuning argument that sort of Mohammed flirted with and then moved away from. If we look at that, on theism, you would not need any kind of fine-tuning because God would be capable of making us live in any environment. So the whole notion of fine-tuning is uh, nonsensical. But yet, if you look at atheism and there is no all-powerful God who could make us live in any environment, then we, uh, wouldn't, then we would need fine-tuning because there is no supernatural being to sustain us any which way, which makes fine-tuning curiously more likely on atheism. Now, I've heard Muslim apologists say that the Quran predicted that the universe is expanding. I looked at four different translations, and the only one that used the uh, term expanding was Mustafa Khattab in 2016. The three other translations, including the classic Pickthall and Abdullah Yusuf Ali, all of them had the vastness of space already existing. So if the Quran did predict that the universe is expanding, which meant that the Quran had divine foreknowledge before science that the Big Bang occurred, then only one out of four translations shouldn't be able to show that. So once again, on divine hiddenness, if the Quran is what God wants me to believe, then the Quran should have been translated into English. True. Also on the argument from evil, and I've touched upon this, is the distribution of pleasure and pain. On theism, we would expect that horrendous pain would only exist if there's a purpose that would aid our survival or our reproduction. So if I put my hand on the hot stove, it hurts, so I take my hand away. But let's say, again, I or some innocent animal are caught in a forest fire and we're unable to pull away from the pain and we suffer a horrible death. Well, the pain of that burning to death did not contribute to my survival or reproduction. And so on atheism, it's understandable. On theism, it's, it's not understandable. Um, I referred earlier to the Bayesian probability analysis. On Bayesian probability analysis, which is widely used, you have to have prior knowledge of something. There's no prior knowledge of the supernatural, so if you use Bayesian confirmation uh, predictive ability, you would not be able to predict the supernatural. If the supernatural existed, there would be evidence of it. If consciousness could exist without a functional physical brain, there'd be evidence of it. If the Bible or the Quran predicted something which could only have been known by miraculous means when it was written, there would be evidence of it. If we humans were specially created, there wouldn't be overwhelming evidence that we evolved from ape-like creatures from a common ancestor with apes. So with all of the evidence, a cumulative case shows the universe is natural, not supernatural, and that God does not exist. Thank you. conclude the debate. Jazakallahu khair everyone for coming out. We really appreciate your company today, this evening. Um, and you know, inshallah we can see you guys again in the future. And may Allah, can you, everyone give them another round of applause? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I would also like to give a big thank you to another key organizer. His name is Abdurrahman. He did a lot of this work and I want to give him a really big, Donations. a really big round of applause as well. And inshallah, before everyone leaves,
is something super important. Again, if anyone is able to, we are really, really asking for donations to help cover costs for the trip um, and for all the events. So if anyone wants to, there is a box for donations outside. There's also the Venmo, which is Davis MSA. Um, and we appreciate anything and everything. Jazakallah, thanks for coming, everyone. Inshallah, have a good night. I'm Farzana Mullah. My question is, with regard to the evolution of Homo sapiens, you have Charles Darwin in science giving an explanation that it's because of the process of natural selection that the human beings have evolved. Now, this is, seems to be in contradiction with the Islamic belief that we, have, we are the children of Adam alayhi salam. Now, how can this be reconciled? It's a very important question. No lecture of mine on this topic of Quran modern science is complete without this question. I've given this talk in various places, in Canada, in USA, in UK, in Saudi. Never is this topic complete, never is the question answer complete without this important question of theory of evolution. Charles Darwin, sister has posed the question, how can you reconcile the Quran with Darwin's theory of evolution? Sister, I have not come across any book which says fact of evolution. All the books say theory of evolution. There's no book I've come across saying fact of evolution. If you read the book by Charles Darwin, The Origin of Species, it says that Charles Darwin went on an island by the name of Calatropis on a ship named as HMS Beagle. And there he found birds pecking at niches. Depending upon the ecological niches they pecked, the beaks kept on becoming long and short. This observation was made in the same species, not in different species. Charles Darwin wrote a letter to his friend Thomas Thompson in 1861, saying, I do not believe in natural selection, the word that you used. I don't believe in theory of evolution because I've got any proof. I only believe in it because it helps me in classification of embryology, in morphology, in rudimentary organs. Charles Darwin himself said that there were missing links. He didn't agree with it. He himself said that there were missing links. Therefore, if I have to insult someone, that if you were present at Darwin's time, this theory would have been proved right, trying to insinuate that he looks like an ape. It's a joke we make. The reason that this theory, in most parts of the world, it is taught as good as fact. You know why? Even when I was in school, I learned about Darwin's theory. And even today, they are taught. You know what the reason is, sister? The reason is because that if you analyze the church, the church was against science previously. And you know the incidents that they sentenced Galileo to death. They sentenced Galileo to death. Why? Because he said certain statements in astronomy, etc., which went against the Bible, so they sentenced him to death, for which the Pope apologized now. So, when Charles Darwin came up with a theory which goes against the Bible, they didn't, they didn't want any sufficient proof. An enemy of my enemy is my friend. So all the scientists, most of them, they support the theory because it went against the Bible, not because it was true. They only supported it because it went against the Bible. All the stages we have mentioned, sister. All the stages. Lucy, there were four hormonites. Science tells us today there's four hormonites. First is Lucy, along with its guide, the Australopithecus, which died about three and a half million years, nice age. Then next came the Homo sapiens, who died about 500,000 years ago. Then came the Neanderthal man, who died 100 to 40,000 years ago. Then came the fourth stage, the Cro-Magnon. There is no link at all between these stages. According to P.P. Grasse, in 1971, who held the chair of evolutionary studies in Paris, in the Shoujo University, he said, it is absurd. We cannot say who are ancestors based on fossils. I can give you a list of hundreds of scientists and Nobel Prize winners who speak against Darwin's theory. Hundreds. If you know of Sir Albert Georgi, who got the Nobel Prize for inventing, for inventing the vitamin C, he wrote a book, The Crazy Ape and Man, against Darwin's theory. Again, if you read Sir Fred Hoyle's work, 
He wrote several works against Darwin's theory. If you know about Rupert Salbert, this person wrote a new theory of evolution against Darwin's theory. It's unthinkable. You cannot think that we are created from the apes. If you know of Sir Frank Salisbury, he was a biologist. He said it is illogical to believe in Darwin's theory. If you know about white meat, Sir White Meat, he wrote a book against Darwin's theory. He was also a biologist. Several, you can give a list of hundreds. Today it is taught in the schools why I told you. Media is in their hand. Otherwise, there's no proof at all. There are certain proofs at lower levels. An amoeba at lower species level, amoeba can change to paramecia. Quran does not say amoeba cannot change to paramecia. Quran does not say. If they have got proof, it can be possible. It's not against the Quran. But there's no proof at all. People talk about molecular biology theory. They talk about genetic coding. According to Hans Craig, who's authority in this field, he said it is unimaginable. Again, if you do that ratio, the probability of one DNA forming from ape to human being is again zero. If I start calculating, I think you'll get bored again. You know the calculation I told you for one protein molecule? It is somewhat similar from one DNA. It is not possible at all. You know, there's a theory recently that homosexuality is genetic. And when I read in the Times of India, I thought, surely, the moment I attend the next lecture on Sunday in IRF, I'll be asked this question. If homosexuality is genetic, how can Allah blame us? Quran speaks against homosexuality. And I said that, see, this is a theory. Wait till it gets established. It's a theory. Don't comment on that. Within the matter of span of this few months, it was proved to be illogical. And the person who propounded this theory that homosexuality is genetic himself was an homosexual. <laughs> Therefore, I said, I'm going to give my talk on scientific facts, not on theories and assumptions. Darwin's theory has not been proven. We have not been created from ape. There are hundreds of scientists who speak against that, and Quran speaks against that also. Quran says the first man was Adam, peace be upon him. Inshallah, they'll discover it 100 years afterwards, or maybe 1,000 years afterwards. Today, there is research showing that human beings have been created from one pair. Again, it's just a theory. It supports the Quranic verse that human beings have been created from one pair, male and female. It's just a theory. Therefore, I don't quote that in my talk. Inshallah, it will be established 50 years afterwards or 100 years afterwards. Then we'll know that Quran conciliates with this part. So far, it's not conflicting. It's not conflicting with established science at all. Hope that answers the question. Next question from the ladies section. Assalamu alaikum, brother. My name is Farida Ansari. I am a laboratory technician. Quran says, Allah is the creator of the human being. Does science agree with it? The sister posed the question that the Quran mentions that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the creator of the human beings. Does science agree with it? And Quran says in several places, including the last verse of the embryological stages, that is Surah Mu'minun, chapter 23, verse number 14, that Allah is the best to create. Can we prove it scientifically that Allah is the creator? Quran gives the answer. Quran gives the answer in Surah Tur, chapter 52, verse number 35. It poses a question that were you created from nothing? See, the Arabic word used for creator in all these verses of the Quran is khalik. It's derived from the Arabic word khalaka. Arabic word khalaka has got four meanings. One meaning is to create something from nothing without any previous example. That's only possible for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Second meaning of khalaka is to create something new from pre-existing material. The third meaning is of khalaka programming or planning. And the last meaning is to make smooth. So Quran poses a question in Surah Tur, chapter 52, verse 35, that were you created from nothing? But naturally the answer is negative, no. Human beings aren't created from nothing. They pose the next question. Were you the creators or we the creators? 
we know very well that man cannot create another man. If he could do that, in the moment he died, he would have created himself back. If his relatives would have died, he would have brought them back to life. Human beings can't even create a living creature such as fly, live outside human being. Neither can you attribute the organs of the body, say the reproductive organs, like testes or ovaries, that they are the cause for a creation. Because if you say that the testes, the uterus, etc., are the cause, then you have to include your ancestors, their reproductive system, their ancestors, their ancestors, all are responsible. So the answer is negative. Quran poses the next question in Surah Waqiyah, chapter 56, verse number 58 and 59, that do you not look at the sperm you have emitted? Were you the creator or we the creator? And but natural, all these questions that Quran poses, the answer is negative. Some people can say it's by chance. By chance you were created. They say nature, nature, natural thing. It happened by chance. Let's analyze scientifically whether the human beings can be created by chance. The protein molecule is a very important structure of the living cell. Very important part in the living structure of the cell. The protein molecule consists of five elements. The carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, hydrogen, and sulfur. And there are tens and thousands of atoms required to make one molecule. One atom has five elements. Carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, hydrogen, and sulfur. There are tens of thousands of atoms which make one protein molecule. And there are approximately 92 free elements. The chances that out of these 92, the five will form an atom, and these atoms will form tens and thousands of atoms to form one protein molecule was calculated by Frank Alien. And he said the chances are one in 10 raised to 160. You know what is the meaning of one in 10 raised to 160? If I say one in 10 raised to two, 10 raised to two means one zero zero, two zeros. One in 100, chances one percent. If I say one in 10 raised to three, it means one in 1,000. That's 0.1 percent. If I say one in 10 raised to four, it means one in 10,000. Means 0.01 percent. So when the calculation was made, one in 10 raised to 160, it means 0 0.00000, 000, 157 zeros, then one. And mathematics tells anything one in raised to 10 raised to 50, it's counted as zero. Furthermore, this is talking about one molecule and the substance required to form this one molecule of protein was calculated by another person, Charles Guy that it will require millions of times of substance as huge as our galaxies. Millions of galaxies will require to form this one molecule of protein. And the time was calculated by Charles Guy. The time taken for one protein molecule to be formed will be 10 raised to 263 years. You know what is that? One zero 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 zero, 263 zeros it will take to form one protein molecule. And do you know? There are how many protein molecules in one cell? And do you know how many other molecules are there in the cell? And how many cells are there in the human being? There are more than six billion molecules when a child is born. That's what doctors tell us today. Six billion. <laughs> one more protein molecule takes one in 10 raised to 160 chances. Time taken is 10 raised to 263 years. To take six billion for one baby, imagine. And how many women are pregnant? There are millions of women pregnant at a time. And it takes only nine months. The chances science tells us is zero, zero, zero. No chance at all. These things cannot take by chance. They have to be programmed by someone. Science tells us there has to be someone some supernatural force. Therefore, science, as I said earlier, is not eliminating God, it is eliminating models of God. La ilaha illallah. Hope that answers the question. <laughs> Regarding biology in the Quran, 
And regarding evolution, two questions the brother asked. I don't know whether I can answer both or not. I don't Which mind. One? one. Which one? First one or second one? Biology or evolution? Evolution will be good. Evolution will ah, be good. Are you choosing or he's choosing? <laughs> because he had the question for evolution, I think it'll be good. Two questions. Biology first, then evolution. evolution. If you give me ten minutes, I'll answer both. No, no. Only in five minutes, whatever you can do. Okay, fine. I agree with the chairperson, Mr. Samuel Noman. I'll answer on evolution. The exact answer you can refer to my video because I said Quran and modern science. Regarding when you talk about evolution, you start thinking about Darwin's theory. And Darwin went on a ship, HMS Bugle, to an island by the name of Calatropis, and he saw birds pecking at niches. Based on that observation that the beaks of the bird became long and short, he propounded the natural selection. But he wrote a letter to his friend Thomas Thompson in 19th century. He said that I do not have proof to propound my natural selection, but because it helps me in classification of embryology of rudimentary organs, I have put forth this. Darwin's theory is not a fact at all. It is only a theory. And I made it very clear in the beginning of my talk, Quran can go against theories. Because theories take you turns, but Quran will not go against any established fact. And in our school, we are taught about Darwin's theory as though it's a fact. It's not a fact. There is no scientific proof at all. There are missing links. Therefore, if someone has to insult his friend, his colleague, he will say, if you were present at Darwin's time, Darwin's theory would have been proved right, insinuating he looks like an ape. <laughs> there are missing links to Darwin's theory. And I know about the four fossils that are present, the hominoids, the Lucy, Australopithecus, with its guide, the Homo erectus, Neanderthal man, cro magnan For details, refer to my video cassette. By molecular biology, according to Hans Craig, he said it is impossible that we can be evolved from apes by DNA coding. It's impossible. You can refer to my video cassette. It gives the detail. Some parts I've got no objection regarding biology. Quran says in Surah Ambiya, chapter 21, verse number 30, that we have created every living thing from water. Will you not then believe? Today we know that every living creature, the basic substance, the cell, contains cytoplasm, which has about 90% water. Every living creature in the world has approximately 50 to 90% water. Imagine, in the deserts of Arabia, who could have imagined that everything is made of water? Quran says that 1400 years ago. Time of the Thank you. Please, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Naik. Go ahead, please. Go ahead. Thank you. To an effort to prove, in an effort to prove, the Quran is so heavily agreeable to modern science. What happens if modern science is wrong? Does the Quran always change to reflect the changes in science? That's a very good question. It's a very important question, and we Muslims, should be very careful while bringing compatibility with the Quran modern science. Therefore, I said in the beginning of my talk, I will only be speaking about those scientific facts which have been established. And a scientific fact which has been established, for example, the earth is spherical. It can never go wrong. Established science can never take U-turns. But unestablished science, like hypotheses and theories, can take U-turns. I know Muslim scholars who have tried to prove Darwin's theory from the Quran. Nonsense. So therefore, we should not go overboard and try and prove everything of modern science. We have to be careful to check up whether it's established or unestablished. If it's established, alhamdulillah, with scientific proof, the Quran will never go against it. If it's a hypothesis, it may be right, it may be wrong. Like Big Bang Theory. It was a hypothesis early. Earlier, it was a hypothesis. Today, after solid proof about the celestial matter, according to Stephen Hawking, etc., it's a fact. So Big Bang Theory, today is a fact. Yesterday it was a hypothesis. Once it becomes a fact, I use it. You know, there are hypotheses saying that human beings have been created from a single pair of genes, Adam and Eve. I don't use it. Because science has established, it goes along with the Quran. It goes along with the Quran that we have been evolved from one pair, Adam and Eve. Peace be upon them. But I don't use it because that is not an established fact. So therefore, while bringing a correlation between Quran and science, etc., see to it that you use only those scientific facts which have been established and not hypothesis because Quran is far superior to modern science. I'm not trying to prove the Quran to be the word of God with the help of science. No, not at all. What I'm trying to do, for us Muslims, Quran is the ultimate criteria. For the atheist, 
and for the non-Muslims, maybe, science may be the ultimate criteria. What I'm doing, I'm using the criteria, the yardstick of the atheist, and comparing with the yardstick of the Muslim, the Quran. I'm not trying to prove the Quran to be the word of God with the help of science. What I'm trying to do, when I'm being a compatibility, and I show the superiority of Quran, that what your science has told us yesterday, Quran has told us 1400 years ago, I'm trying to prove that our yardstick the Muslim yashtik, the Quran, is far superior to your yashtik, the science. Therefore, you should believe in Quran, which is far superior. Hope that answers the question. Thank you, Dr. Ryan. This is Dr. Campbell. This is the last. Good evening again, everyone. Uh, it was amazing to see how much uh, science that the glorious Quran contained after your talk. But in most of the examples from the Quran which you gave, it is very difficult to comprehend what the Quran tells before actually the science discovers or invents that particular phenomenon. For example, you said, in the honey, there is healing of humanity in the Quran. And you mentioned it as it's about if a person is maybe say poisoned with a plant, the honey of the plant should be taken. So what is the use, say, of a almighty holy scripture talking about things which you are only able to comprehend after the real invention is made by science? So can you tell me now something from the Quran which will be invented by science later or yet to be invented? Brother, that's a very good question that I've mentioned many things about science indirectly saying all this was already discovered earlier. And if Quran says something and after science has discovered, so what's the use? Can you tell me something which science hasn't discovered? Brother, that's the reason the Arabs were advanced in the field of astronomy. Why? Because they read the Quran. The Quran has a lot of information on astronomy. So when they read the Quran, they try and do more investigation. They do more research. And that's how they come to know. Quran is a telegraphic message. See, the book of science, only on one subject. In medicine, one subject only requires volumes. So if that way the Quran is, this Quran, most of the human beings, they don't like to read. Oh, such a big book. So if God Almighty wrote in detail, then even a big building, you will require thousands of buildings to contain the message of the Quran. Quran is telegraphic message. So in telegraphic message, many of the Muslims, they read the Quran and they made advances in science. That's the reason we find, if you go back into history, the Muslims advanced in science and technology. But you pose the question, forget about the past. What about today? All what I've mentioned has been discovered earlier, but many of them were discovered by Muslims. Some by non-Muslims, some by Europeans. What about things which science hasn't discovered? Fine. First, I'll tell you those things which science hasn't established, but yet there are high chances, which Quran has testified, and I believe in it. For example, Quran says in Surah Shura, chapter number 42, verse number 29, that it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who has created the creatures in the heavens and the earth and has placed creatures in them. So Quran says there is life beside this earth. Today science hasn't proved there is life beside this earth. Scientists say there are high possibilities that life will be there beside this earth. So they're sending rockets, spaceships, moon, Mars. Quran says there's life beside this earth. I believe in it. Science may discover it tomorrow. After five years, after 10 years, after 100 years, Quran says, I believe in it. Today, there are many hypotheses how the world will end. It says that the sun will become big and the world will end. The mountains will fall down. The mountains will become smooth. The ocean will swell up. The world will enter into a black hole. Many hypotheses. Many of these hypotheses, not all, they match with the Quran. Quran says in Surah Qiyamah, chapter number 75, verse number 8 and 9, that the sun and the moon, they will join together. The sun will be buried in darkness. If it's Surah Takhvir, chapter number 81, verse number 1, 2, and 3, it says that the stars will fall down and lose their luster. The mountain will fall down to utter ruin. The ocean will swell up. It's mentioned in Surah Infitar, chapter number 82, verse number 1 and 2 and 3. Again, the ocean will swell up. The stars will fall down. Similar to many of the hypotheses. But Quran says, I believe in it. Quran further says, in Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 104, we have created this creation, we will destroy it, and create a new creation. Science hasn't discovered that yet. Quran speaks about life after death. 
Science hasn't proved that yet. Quran speaks about heaven and hell. Science hasn't proved about that. Quran speaks about jinn. Today, psychologists say extraterrestrial power. There are some people who get possessed with jinns. Quran speaks about that. Quran speaks the first man on the earth, while Adam, peace be upon him. Science hasn't proved. There are high possibilities science will prove. Now, you may ask me, that brother, Zakir, you gave such a good talk on science and technology, but 100% solid proof. You believe in life after death? You believe in jinn? You believe in heaven and hell? You a doctor? Isn't this unscientific? I said, no, brother. I believe that it is scientific. Suppose whatever the Quran has mentioned, 80% has proved to be 100% correct. I spoke about astronomy, about geology, motorcycle, oceanography, botany, biology, zoology. So just hypothetically, 80% what the Quran has mentioned, suppose, has been proved to be 100% correct. The remaining 20% is ambiguous. Neither right, neither wrong. Not even 0.1% of that 20% which is ambiguous has been proved to be wrong. There is not a single verse of the Quran which can be proved false by established science. Hypothesis. So my logic says when 80% is 100% correct and the remaining 20% is ambiguous, but not even 0.1% of that 20% is proved wrong. So my logic says that even that 20% inshallah will be correct. If not today, tomorrow, after 50 years, after 100 years, after 1000 years, Allah alam, God knows, they will prove there is life after death. They will prove there is jinn. They will prove there is hell. There is proof there is heaven, and so on and so forth. I can give another lecture on things which science hasn't proved, but inshallah will prove. Hope that answers the question. Morning, Mr. Zakir Naik. My name is Jamish Damani. First of all, I want to thank you for what you're doing here. I've really taken a, a, a lot away from here, I'm sure. Um, my question is on your point number three. Actually, I have three questions, if you could be so kind. But on point number three, first of all, I felt that you, it was very evasive, your, your answer. But what I'm going to ask you is very simple. When you talk about terrorism, when you talk about Islam, now this is a very simple, straightforward question. I hope I can get a straightforward answer. With what's happening in Pakistan, Iraq, Afghanistan, just to name a few, I'm not stereotyping, I hope no one takes offense, but when you hear on the news that a woman is cooking food for her kids and then a suicide bomber comes and kills them, I want to ask you a simple question. What is that? Is that Islam or is that people who don't understand what Islam is and they have their own perception of Islam? And please, let me ask you one more thing. Can you give me an answer that is not in World War I or something, there were more people that died or this is all propaganda and these are Americans killing people and that's well, your not man the, said, then you pass yeah, your comment, inshallah. Yeah, I want your just man, sir, that type of answer. Yeah. Your man answer, then you can pass your comment. Huh? The brother asked the question that years in Afghanistan and Pakistan, a woman cooking food, a suicide bomber comes and blows up and kills. As far as Islam, what the media is saying, forget about it. I'll give you ruling of Islam. Whether what the media says is right or wrong. Quran says in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 32, if anyone kills any other human being, unless it be for murder or for spreading corruption in the land, it is as though he has killed the whole of humanity. Any person kills any other human being, whether Muslim or non-Muslim, unless it be for murder, or for spreading corruption in the land, it is as though he has killed the whole of humanity. And if any human being saves other human being, it is as though he has saved the whole nation. So according to the Quran, killing any single innocent human being is prohibited. If a suicide bomber comes and kills a woman who is cooking she innocent, it is 100% prohibited, whether done in Pakistan or Afghanistan or America or Dubai. Is the answer clear? Okay, 100% wrong. Clear Whoever was doing it, Whoever was doing it, Whoever is doing it, whether namesake Muslim or American or propaganda, whoever is doing it, it is totally prohibited. Okay. Fine. So is it clear answer? That is clear. 100% clear? 100%. Whether you do, anyone so does? wrong, yeah? 100% okay. wrong. It now, is as though he has killed the whole of humanity. There is no other scripture that I know of today. Okay. There is no other scripture that I know of today yeah. that gives this statement that if you kill one human being, 
it is as though you killed the holy man except the Quran. There is no other scripture that I know which says that if you save one human being, you have saved the whole of humanity. No other scripture. Perfect. Now can I ask you something? Yes, you, you are told most me this is wrong, yeah? Hundred percent wrong. Fine, fine, fine. Now, why are you here? The way I look at it, all of these are innocent, loving people here. Why isn't this convention somewhere like Afghanistan and Pakistan trying to teach people that what they are doing is not Islam and is just some brainwashed chaos? And that they're going to go to hell and they're not going to go to heaven for killing innocent people, for the 911 attacks, for the London bombings. Innocent people died. If I don't like you and I kill you, it's more justified than if I don't like somebody, if I don't like Jews and I go and kill innocent Americans with families. Why don't you go and educate these people and have a better cause rather than converting four or five people here? Save thousands of lives. Brother has asked a very good question. He's telling me, why don't I go to Pakistan, to Afghanistan and spread this message and prevent this? Brother, I go every day, even now I'm going there. I'm on the satellite. We have Peace TV reaching 100 million people. This is how much? That's what I wanted to hear. This is 20, 30,000 people. The audience here will be 20, 30,000 people, not more than that. You see the recording. Why do we the recording? So that I can go to Pakistan, I can go to Afghanistan, I can go to even America and my lectures on jihad and terrorism, the maximum viewership, it has got more than 100 million people and it is meant for the full world. I am giving here, it is being recorded, being telecast. The thing is, I cannot force anyone at the point of the sort accept my message. Can I force you? Am I forcing you? Yeah. Am I forcing you to accept my message? No, 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 you're not forcing How can I force the people of Pakistan? How can I force the people of Afghanistan? At the same time, at the same time, at the same time, I also tell the innocent people being killed, I agree with you. What's the numbers? You said, you know, four or five people converting here is better than telling that. My job is to deliver the message. Fazakrin naman tamazakir. Mentioned in the Quran, Surah Ghasha, chapter 88, verse number 21, 22. Our job is to deliver the message. We can't convert hearts. Allah told the Prophet, you are not the manager of affairs. It is Allah who gives the hidayah. I can talk. I cannot convert. It is Almighty God who converts. I can talk whether they understand or not in Pakistan. It is Almighty God. Coming to your basic question. According to me, you should see my cassette. Is terrorism Muslim monopoly? Is terrorism Muslim monopoly? If you see that cassette, your mind, your vision of terrorism will improve. Time does not permit me to give a talk here again. But I'll tell you for sure. According to me, the terrorists are mainly the politicians. It is they who create this. You go anywhere. You know in India, all the riots that took place, indirectly or directly, it's the politician. Babri Masjid. Why did Babri Masjid riot take place? Why? Because the politicians. Gujarat riot. Politicians. What happened about 9-11? See my cassette. It was an inside job. According to 72 scientists of America, they say 9-11 cannot be done by 19 Arabs. It's impossible. It was an inside job. 72 scientists of America, not Zakir and Naik. Inside job. Who did it? George Bush. Okay, Afghanistan. Then Wait, let me complete my answer. Afghanistan. Thousands of people being killed. They are sending cluster bombs. Cowards there. Thousands of people. You are talking about suicide bomb? That is haram. I am not condoning it. I am condemning it. But the bigger thing to be condemned is the Americans sending their fighters in Afghanistan, killing thousands of people. In Iraq, killing thousands of people. Saddam Hussein. I am not a fan of Saddam Hussein. He has done mistakes. The people of Iraq, they were fed up of Saddam Hussein. But after America came there, they are more fed up of the American than Saddam Hussein. That does not justify. Just because Saddam Hussein was bad, that does not justify America to come and take over Iraq. Why are they doing it? For the money, for the oil. What is the main interest? Is the oil. Who created Taliban? When Russia came, the Americans supported the Afghans created Taliban. Now they want to take over, they are fighting back. Who is the creation? Americans. The biggest threat is according to me in this history, George Bush. Now he's no longer there. George Bush yeah, number one. I'm with one. you on that. Sorry? I'm with you on that. You're with me on that. So I'm also going to America. I'm even going to America live and on satellite, giving the message to Americans. I was the first person that I know of 
in the public after 9-11. In Australia, I said, I'm a fundamentalist, and I consider George Bush to be the biggest terrorist. This came at headlines. In December, in December 2001, when I gave a talk in Australia, when the Consul General asked me that what do you consider, who's a terrorist, I said George Bush number one. It came as headline, Dr. Zakir and I call themselves the fundamentalists and consider George Bush to be terrorist number one. Now, every Tom, Dick and Harry is calling him a terrorist. At that time, no one had the guts. What we realize, we are speaking the truth. Now, whether George Bush, you know, many people say, when I gave a talk in London on terrorism, very good talk, people enjoyed. A youngster comes and says, death to George Bush, death to George Bush. Full talk of mine gone. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they were two staunchest enemies of Islam. Both were called Umar, Umarain. The Prophet prayed to Allah that give hidayah to one of these two Umar, and Umar bin Khattab. May Allah be pleased with him. Who was the second caliph of Islam. Allah gave hidayah, who was the staunchest enemy of Islam, became the staunchest supporter. Therefore I said, may Allah give hidayah to George Bush. I cannot, I can speak, I cannot give hidayah. I can tell him what he's doing is wrong. I don't want to kill him. I want him to accept Islam. Killing is useless. What's the use of killing? Accepting is better. So that's the reason we are giving the message. Those whose hearts are opening, they're accepting. Inshallah, God will open your heart also one day. So when God opens your heart one day, I cannot do it. I can give the message. I can't force you. Unless God gives you, unless you strive, if you strive, God will help you. If you don't strive, your heart will not be open. Some people ask question only for questioning. Are question pushne ke. But the true gentleman, Marat ka bacha, wo hai. When he gets the answer, he accepts it. You know, people just ask for questioning. Why question pushne ke? You spoke very loudly. I am asking you, I gave a speech. I said so many things. Do you agree with it or not? Yes, I agree with it. Are you a Hindu? I'm actually your favorite. I'm an atheist. Atheist, mashallah. I heard you enjoy. You're atheist. You're my favorite. No, I'm not your friend, but I was told that you like having debates with such. Yes, yes, fav, atheist. Okay, brother, you're an atheist. Fine. I would like to congratulate you. You'd like to what? I would like to congratulate you. You know why? Why? The reason I congratulate you because all the others, all the human beings, they're blindly following. Father is a Christian, so son is a Christian. His parents are Hindu, he's a Hindu. Many of the Muslim parents are Muslims. You are thinking. I don't know their father was atheist. Father was atheist? No. Ah, good. So you're thinking. These are the people they worship, this almighty God who falls down and breaks. So you are thinking. And the reason I congratulate you is because you have said the first part of the Islamic Shahada, La ilaha, there is no God. You have already said half the kalma. But not the second part. They have said the full kalma, you are half Muslim now. Atheist means half kalma, you know, la ilaha. Only thing I have to do is illa Allah, but Allah, which I shall do, inshallah. <laughs> I am congratulating you because you have agreed to the other people who believe in wrong gods. First, I have to spend half my time in trying to convince them the God you are worshipping is wrong. You have already agreed there is no God. Only thing I have to do is prove to you about Allah, which I shall do, inshallah. Brother, suppose there is equipment which is bought. Equipment is bought in front of you. No one in the world has ever seen. No human being has seen is bought in front of you. And if I ask you the question, who is the first person who will be able to tell you the mechanism of that equipment? I've heard this speech and it's the creator. It's the creator. So the creator of that equipment will be the first person who will be able to tell you the mechanism of that object. You may say creator, you may say manufacturer, you may say inventor, you may say maker, whatever it is somewhat similar. Now I'm asking you a question. How did this universe come into existence? How did this universe come into existence? You are going to now mention the Big Bang and all No, I'm that. asking you. Yeah. Don't tell me what I'm going to mention. Well, I want to know what, if, what the... If you want no, to... you are... I'm asking you according to your knowledge. No, the thing is, I've actually heard this speech before. I'm Fine. actually a good fan of yours, you know that. Mashallah, you're a good fan. Good fan, theoretical or practical? If theoretical you're a practical fan, practical. you will follow. If I'm wrong, you correct me. If I'm right, you join me. No, I only learned about you about two weeks back, actually. Fine, so in two weeks, you became a great fan. Mashallah, I'm very happy about it. In two weeks you learn about me, that means you know. 
you know about the creation, the Big Bang, yes, which yes, we came yes, to know yes, recently. Quran yes. mentioned 14 years ago in Surah Ambiya, chapter 21, verse number 30. Well, and I don't the, know the verses, but... Fine, but you know that. <laughs> yeah. Similarly, we did not know that the earth was spherical. We came to know recently. Quran mentioned 14 years ago in Surah Nadia, chapter 7 yes, and verse number 30, it is spherical. We thought first the light of the moon is its own light. Quran mentions 14 years ago, the light of the moon is not its own light, reflected light, which we came to know recently. Who could have mentioned this? There's biology. There is water cycle, which you learned in school. There is embryology. There is genetics. My question is, who could have mentioned all these things in the Quran? So if you have heard this, you also know the answer. Who could have mentioned in the Quran? Same answer. The Creator. The Creator. This Creator, who has mentioned in the Quran, we call as Allah. So that means you believe in the Creator. Who could have mentioned this in the Quran? The Creator. The Creator who created the human beings, the person who created all this universe. It can't be a human being who writes all this. So now do you believe in a Creator? Well, there are different perspectives, you see, a person the has, you can we'll think discuss about later on. science or you can think about God. Now the debate is which to follow. No, we problem. can follow both. I believe but in as both. I, as I, I am said, a, I'm a student of science also, also I'm a believer in God, both. As, as my opening question stated, what I asked about terrorism, I believe you also know, those are certain facts that Brother, we'll come to terrorism later on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wait, wait, brother, we are talking brother, about brother, that, brother, why brother, I don't brother, believe. Brother, brother, wait, brother, wait. You asked me direct question, suicide bombing, killing innocent wrong, I gave direct answer. Now I am asking you a direct question, you give me a direct answer. You asked me, you are happy with my answer. No beating around the bush. I am asking you directly, when you believe in the creator, why don't you accept the creator? I am asking you directly. So you asked me direct question in front of 30,000 people, I gave a direct answer. I am asking you a direct question. You didn't believe in God, I congratulate you. Now I prove to you that the creator wrote the Quran. Now I am asking the question, why don't you believe in the creator? I didn't say that I believe in the Creator. No, I you was said just the mimicking your speech. Oh, I didn't. I Brother, I didn't ask you to come here to mimic me, please. Did I ask you to come and mimic me? I asked you who wrote. You said Creator. I didn't say. Did I say that? No, but that's even what in my you, speech, I don't what, say. That's what you said. Even I didn't say. Speech. The questioner said. That means you haven't seen my speech correctly. Like how you are telling. When I ask and yes, yes, he gives the reply, Creator, not I, not I. That means I haven't seen my speech correctly. It is a person like you, who I might have asked the question to, he gave the reply. Like how you gave the reply now. Did I ask you to mimic or did I ask you to give answer from your heart? So that means you are not a very truthful person, no? You asked me a question, brother. I gave answer directly from my heart, correct? Yeah. I am asking a question, you gave the answer, now you are saying that I'm mimicking. Okay, if I say the creator is what you want to hear, now, not what if, I want to no, hear. No, 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 no. Listen, hypothetically here. Not hypothetically. If, if we say that I agree to the Creator, now, what if I say that I agree to the Creator of what was written, but I don't believe what was written justifies everything? You're giving me six facts. Correct, you're correct, correct. Me, very good, very good. You're wait, 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 me wait. Six things, but there's a lot in life that's not written there. Fine, fine. There's Come, nothing wait, about wait, 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 wait. gravity or. You're just telling me about light on the Correct. moon. Very the good, very flat. good, very good. The brother says he believes in the creator, but everything is not there. Brother, this book, the Quran, is not a book of science. S-C-I-E-N-C-E. -E. It's a book of signs. S-I-G-N-S. -S. It's a book of ayats. There are more than 6,000 signs, 6,000 ayats in the Quran, out of which more than a thousand speak about science. It's not a book of science. Two plus two is equal to four, that's not written there. But the beauty of it is, what is written, we did not know. Human being did not mean the creator wrote. If it had everything of science, it would be a voluminous book as big as the World Trade Center. Or maybe it's Buruj Dubai, tallest yeah. building now. It is not a book of science, brother. Please don't misunderstand. It is to prove to the scientist that this is the word of God, this is the word of creator. What do you have to tell me to disprove it? You have to take out a mistake in the Quran. Quran says in Surah Nisa chapter 4 verse number 82, Afala yadadabburun al-Quran walau kana min indi garilla lawajudu fi iktilafan kasira Do they not consider the Quran with care? Had it been from anyone besides Allah, there would have been contradictions in it, there would have been mistakes in it. So for you to disprove the Quran to be the word of Allah, you have to take out mistakes. That is the reason I said, please come up and take out mistakes in the Quran. Why? If it's wrong, I will leave it. If it's right, you join me. 
it's a two way not one way but uh, how old is the quran i don't exactly know how the old quran is, the is approximately 1400 years old okay and how long have human beings existed in this planet human beings in millions of years millions of years uh, i'm not challenging you don't don't get this wrong i've just no, I, I like people challenging you, me what is i the like reason? people challenging yeah. me yeah okay if you want to challenge then i'll i'll take that step then okay what is the reason that uh, first of all is i believe christianity is older than uh, Islam. It's, no, uh, no, you're wrong. Years, uh, you're wrong. Is Christianity is not older than how, Islam. How, what's the difference? Islam is there since time immemorial, since man set foot on the earth. Okay. From the first human being, it's already there. Prophet Muhammad is the last and final messenger. He came 1400 years ago. He was the last messenger. Quran is the last revelation, not the first revelation. This is the last testament. Hmm. Otherwise, Islam is there since time immemorial. Isa alayhi salam Jesus Christ was a Muslim according to the Quran Abraham was a Muslim according to the Quran peace be upon them all so Islam means peace acquired by submitting our will to almighty god it is there since time immemorial okay so getting to the point i asked you the time scale that the Quran has existed and the time scale of human beings after you not time scale of Quran Islam is there since time immemorial yeah, no no of the Quran the book Quran. No, uh, the holy book uh, not not Islam. We can say Islam existed for forever. But why was the Quran invent uh, placed on Earth afterwards? Very and, good. And, and very good. Very good. And question. Uh, I also wanted to ask you something. I always wanted to know about that is the uh, Darwin's theory of evolution. Um, I know there's a lot of controversy on that, but why do you do you believe in evolution, or you believe man was placed directly? And the whole thing of apes. The science that has proved that human beings emanated from apes. Do you agree with Brothers that? Brothers asked two questions that science... Two questions. Sorry about that. No problem. Two questions. Do you believe in Darwin's theory? Science has proved that human beings have been evaluated from apes. Do you believe in? Do you believe that human beings are placed? And second question. Why was Quran revealed 14 years back? Why not before? Two questions. Regarding a correction in your question. Science hasn't proved that human beings have been evolved from ape. It is Darwin's theory, not Darwin's fact. It's a theory. There is no book today. There is no book today on the face of the earth which says the fact of evolution. It's theory. The fact of the origin of human beings. No, it's theory. And for your information, Darwin himself said that there were missing links in his theory. If you read his book on the origin of species, he writes in this on a ship by the name of HMS Beagle. He goes to an island by the name of Calatropis. And there he sees birds were pecking in niches, in holes. Based on the holes they pecked, the beak of the birds became short and long. Based on that observation, he propounded the theory of natural selection. He wrote a letter to his friend Thomas Thompson in 1861 that I have no proof for my theory of evolution, but because it helps me in giving replies to embryology, to genetics, that's the reason I'm propounding. He had no proof on it. That's the reason in our school, you know, to joke around, we used to say, if you were present at Darwin's time, Darwin would have been proved right. Trying to insinuate, I'm telling my colleague, he's a ape, he's a monkey. There were missing links. Furthermore, all the three stages today, science and advanced, we have come to know that the first stage, the Australopithecus and the Iceman. The next stage that we have, Neanderthal man, Cro-Magnon. All these stages that we have, Today, of the human being that we found, there's no link between them. Certain things what Darwin said, that life is evolved from water, I agree with it. Quran says that, Surah Ambiya, chapter 21, verse number 30, wa ja'alna min al kulla shayin hai. We have created every living thing from water, I believe in that. But saying that we have evolved from one species to the other is a hypothesis. According to molecular biologist, Hanses Craig, he said, it is letting your imagination run too wild to say that we have been evolved from apes. If that was true, today we'll find someone in between man and human being. You only find in mythology. You don't find anywhere in the world a monkey man. Do you find? So what do you think evolution has stopped now? It is a hypothesis and most of the scientists today disagree with it. There is only a small negligible percentage which yet believe in Darwin's theory. Majority of the scientists have already disproved Darwin's theory. I feel your knowledge of science is not up to date, brother. But Dr. Naik. Not about, wait. All right. You're asking me a question, I'm replying. Then we have to give chance to others. You have already asked five, six questions. No, Let's I thought do you were justice. just having fun, that's all. Sorry? I thought you were being entertained with Having fun? Oh, I'm, besides entertaining you, I want to entertain the other 
non-Muslim brothers. If all non-Muslims get over, come back to you. So oh, what yeah. we realize, Darwin's theory, brother, your knowledge on science is weak. We say Adam and Eve were the first human beings. That's what the Quran says. Furthermore, regarding your second question. Okay. I have to answer your question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have not answered the second question, you want to put the third question. That means you are not listening to me. Or you have forgotten you have asked two questions. No, no, I have asked you the first one. That means you are a good questioner, huh? Now you ask me the question, why was Quran revealed 1400 years back? Why not before? You know my son, he wants to become a doctor. He's telling me, Father, Abba, why do you put me in school and college? Why don't you put me in medical college directly? I said, son, first go to nursery, then go to primary, then go to secondary school, then go to college, then go to medical college. I can't put him in medical college directly. Why? He should know the basics. Similarly, Almighty God is our creator. He kept on sending other revelations. Almighty God, our creator, thought 1400 years back was the right time that human beings could absorb this message. He revealed it. He is our creator. He knows better than you and me. 1400 years back, he revealed his last message, the Quran, to the last and final messenger, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And it's mentioned in the Quran in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 3. On this day, have I perfected my religion for you, the perfect form, and have complete my favor on you, you talk to the human beings, and has chosen for you Islam. After this, nothing new can be added into the basics of Islam, nothing can be subtracted. That's it. So Almighty God knows when we can imbibe the message of the Quran. And this is the last testament, last messenger prophet Muhammad. No other messenger will come after this. Hope this answers your question. That and I hope that you even accept, besides being my fan, you also accept my teachings, inshallah. Maybe next time when you come here. Maybe next time. Maybe. You tell me I'll come again tomorrow. I'm flying tomorrow. I'll come back <laughs> fast for you alone. There is something known as exhausting the alternatives. There's a concept known as exhausting the alternatives. The Quran says, this is from God. If you don't believe in it, you tell me what it is from. You tell me from where it is. The Quran says, this book is from God. This book is from Allah. If you disagree, you give me the answer. So someone will say, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he wrote the Quran, and we proved earlier he didn't write. He lied. Why did he lie? Because of material gains, and we proved it's not possible. Maybe for power and glory, and we proved that's not possible. Maybe for unity of the Arabs, and we proved that's not possible. Someone will say, okay, did for moral reformation, and we proved it's not possible. Guess, guess. Okay, he copied from the Bible, and we proved it is wrong. Guess. When all your guesses are proved wrong, that means the Quran requires to be heard. It requires respect. You have to believe in it that this book, Quran, is from Almighty God. And Quran says in several places that this book is a revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, including Surah Jasha, chapter number 45, verse number 1 and 2, where it says, Ha Meem, Tanzeelul Kitabu bin Allahi, Azizul Hakim. That Ha Meem, this is a revelation of the book from the Lord of the worlds, exalted in power and full of wisdom. The Quran says in several places that this book is the book of Almighty God. It's mentioned in Surah Anam, chapter number 6, verse number 19. Surah Anam, chapter number 6, verse number 93. It's mentioned in Surah Yusuf, chapter number 12, verse number 1 and 2. In Surah Taha, chapter number 20, verse number 113. It is mentioned in Surah Sajda, chapter number 32, verse number 1 to 3. In Surah Yasin, chapter number 36, verse number 1 to 3. It's mentioned in Surah Azumur, chapter number 39, verse number 1. In Surah Ghafir, chapter number 40, verse number 2. It's mentioned in Surah Jasha, chapter number 45, verse number 2. It is mentioned in Surah Rahman, chapter number 55, verse number 1 and 2. It's mentioned in Surah Insan, chapter number 76, verse number 23, that this book, the glorious Quran, is from none other but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is known as exhausting the alternatives. What you have, you give. You try it out. If you fail to prove it logically, then you have to agree with what is mentioned. As far as the scientists are concerned, they have a different philosophy. They have a different approach. This approach is known as the falsification test. 
the scientists, they are so busy. There are so many new theories coming about. They don't have time to analyze it. They say, if you have a theory, first give us a way to prove your theory wrong. If you come about with a new concept, first give us a way, show us a way how to prove your theory wrong. Albert Einstein, in the beginning of the 20th century, he proposed certain things. How does the universe work? Along with it, he gave three ways how to prove his theory wrong. The scientists, they examined for six years, and then they agreed it was right. Now, anyone who gives a falsification test, it deserves to be heard. It doesn't mean the person is great or the work is great. It may be right, may be wrong. But anyone who gives the falsification test, it deserves to be heard. There are innumerable falsification tests mentioned in the Quran. You want to prove the Quran wrong? It is very easy. You try it out. Very easy. There are some falsification tests which was meant only for that time when the Quran was revealed. Some is meant for today. Some it will be meant till the last day. I'll just mention about four or five because of lack of time. One very good example is about the story of Abu Lahab. Abu Lahab, he was the uncle of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and he was given this nickname, Abu Lahab, the father of the flame, and he was one of the staunchest enemies of the Prophet. Whenever he saw anyone speaking with the Prophet, he used to wait. Moment the Prophet left, he used to go to the man and ask him, what did the Prophet say? Did he say black? It is white. Did he say day? No, it is night. He used to speak the opposite. He was one of the staunchest enemies of the Prophet. He went out of the way. He even lied many a times just to prove the Prophet wrong. Now there's a surah in the Quran by the name Surah Lahab, chapter number 111, which all of us know very well. It's recited many times in the Salah, Tabba, Tada, Bilhab, Yuvatab, etc. In this surah, it is mentioned that Abu Lahab and his wife, they will burn in the hellfire, indicating they will never become Muslims. They will never ever accept Islam. Now, this surah was revealed about 10 years before the death of Abu Lahab. When this surah was revealed, only thing Abu Lahab had to do was accept Islam and the Quran would have been proved wrong. Not actually. Many of his companions who were his friends in the span of 10 years they accepted Islam. Abu Lahab, later on after 10 years, he died in the Battle of Badr. 10 years he had time. The Prophet was constantly reminding him for 10 years, you accept Islam? and the Quran will be proved wrong. So easy. Only thing he had to do was say, I am a Muslim. Finish. Not that he had to behave like a Muslim. Not that he had to offer Salah. Only thing he had to say, I am a Muslim, and finish. The Quran has been proved wrong. So easy. Very easy. He had lied many times against the Prophet. He had to lie once again, and the Quran would have been proved wrong. But he could not, because the author of the Quran is Almighty God. He knows that Abu Lahab will never accept Islam. Falsification test. Ten years. There's another falsification test. Many, many are there. It's mentioned in Surah Baqarah, chapter number two, verse number 94 and 95. There was a group of Jews who were having a confrontation with the Muslims, and they say that. The last home with Allah is only for us. So Allah says in Surah Baqarah chapter 2, verse 94 and 95, that if they say the last home with Allah is only for them, so ask them to call for death. If you say that surely the last home with Allah, Akhirat, is for you, then call for death. And the verse continues, they will never call for death. Never. Only thing these Jews had to do to prove the Quran wrong was say, I want to die. So easy. Not that they had to die. Not that they had to commit suicide. Not that they had to stab themselves. 
only thing they have to say is, I want to die. So easy. To prove the Quran wrong, you want to say, I want to die. Four words, Quran will be proved wrong. Allah continues in Surah Baqarah, chapter 2, verse 95 and 96. They will never call for death, even if a thousand years was given to them. So easy. So easy to prove the Quran wrong. Now, these two falsification tests were falsification tests of the past. Now you'll ask me, Brother Zakir, today I want to prove the Quran wrong. How can I prove it wrong today? Can I do it today? Yes, everyone has a chance. Allah says in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 82, that for the believers, the closest to the believers are those people who say that we are Christians. And the furthest away, the staunchest enemies are those who say we're Jews and pagans. The Quran says, the staunchest enemies of the believers are the Jews and the pagans. And the closest to the believers are those who say we are Christians. As a whole, the Quran is talking as a whole. There are many Jews who have accepted Islam. There may be few Jews who are better than the Christians, but as a whole, the Quran says, the Jews are the enemies of the Muslim as a whole. And the Christians are closer. Only thing to prove the Quran wrong, now all the Jews of the world, they get together and they plan. Okay, let's be good to the Muslim for a few years, or two, three years, better than the Christians. Quran is proved wrong. So easy. All the Jews of the world get together. For three, four years, we'll be good to the Muslims. And then we'll say this verse of the Quran, Surah Maida, chapter number five, verse number 82, is wrong. They will never do it. They will never be able to do it. Easy. There are other falsification tests. You will say, I'm not a Jew, but I want to prove the Quran wrong. How can I prove it? Allah has given everyone a chance. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 88, do they say he forged it? Try and produce a Quran like unto it. I mean, do you say the Quran is forged? Try and produce a Quran like it. The same challenge is repeated in Surah Tur, chapter number 52, verse number 34, Allah challenges. They try and produce a Quran like it, and you'll never be able to do it. Even if all the jinns and the humankind gather together, they will never be able to produce the like of the Quran without the help of Allah. It's a challenge. Now Allah makes the challenge easier. Allah says in Surah Hud, chapter number 11, verse number 13, do they say he forged it? Produce 10 surahs forged like unto it. Not the whole Quran, difficult. Forget it, that challenge is difficult. Produce 10 surahs like the Quran. And call forth for help anyone besides Allah. And you'll never be able to do it. Allah makes the challenge easier, much easier. In Surah Yunus, chapter number 10, verse number 38. Do they say he forged it? Produce one surah like it. One. Not the whole Quran. Not ten surah. One surah like it. And call forth for help anyone who you want besides Allah, and you'll not be able to do it. No response. Now, Allah makes the test much easier. Allah says in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 23 and 24, Allah says, in kuntum fi mimma nazzalna al abdina, and if you are in doubt as what we have revealed to our servant from time to time, fatu bi surati mimmisli, produce a surah somewhat similar to it. Mimmisli, it's not misli. Mimmisli means somewhat similar, not exactly like the Quran. Try and produce one surah somewhat similar to the Quran. Mimmisli. Call forth for help and witnesses. Anyone you want besides Allah. If you speak the truth. But if you cannot. And of a surety cannot. And be prepared 
for the fire whose fuel is men and stones. You will not be able to do it, and of for surety you cannot do it. And be prepared for the fire whose fuel is men and stones. This is a challenge. Try it and produce a surah somewhat similar to it. Now you'll tell me, but natural, if it is a test, you have to produce a surah in Arabic. So you'll brother Zakir, I don't know Arabic, so how can I take part in this test? I said, fine. If you have produced a surah like the Quran, it has to be in Arabic. It can't be in English, can't be in French, can't be in Hindi, can't be in Urdu. Many people tried, not that they didn't try. Many hundreds of people tried and they failed miserably. They were able to rhyme it, but went away from reality. Many people tried and many are available in the books, but all of them failed miserably. Now you'll ask me, the brother Zakir, I don't know Arabic. I'm not a Jew. How can I try and prove the Quran wrong? There are many falsification tests. I'll give you one more. Where anyone can take part. I started my talk by quoting a verse of the Quran from Surah Nisa, chapter number four, verse number 82, which says, Afala yadatakaroon al Quran, wala qana minindi gerilla, lava judu fiq tilafan kasira. Do they not consider the Quran with care? Had it been from anyone besides Allah, anyone besides Almighty God, there have been many contradictions. So if you want to prove the Quran wrong, only thing you have to do is take out a single contradiction in the Quran. If anyone takes out a single contradiction in the Quran, the Quran will be proved wrong. Not that people did not try. Many people tried. You go on the internet, you will find a thousand contradictions. But all of them, either out of context or mistranslation or illogical. So this is called as a falsification test. So Quran shows as a way how to prove itself wrong. If you think it's not from God, you want to prove it wrong, try it. Take out a single contradiction, the Quran will be proved wrong. This is called as the falsification test. Anyone who believes in God will immediately agree if he's unbiased with what I've said in the last one hour, he'll have to agree that the Quran is from God. But what about a person who does not believe in God himself? If a person does not believe in God, where is the question of Quran being a word of God? So now, we have dealt with the majority of the people, but yet there is a large percentage who are atheists, who do not believe in God himself. How do we deal with them? When I meet an atheist, and if he says that he does not believe in God, the first thing I do is I congratulate that atheist. Now you may wonder that why is Zakir congratulating an atheist? The reason I'm congratulating him is because most of the human beings, they are doing blind belief. Most of the Christians, the Christians, because the father is a Christian. He's a Hindu, because father is Hindu. Some of them are Muslims, because the father is a Muslim. They aren't thinking. This person, he's thinking. He may be coming from a religious background, but he may not agree that the God which his parents are worshipping is what to be called as God. The reason I congratulate the atheist is because he has said the first part of the Islamic Shahada, Islamic creed, La ilaha, there is no God. The only thing I have to do is prove to him, Illa Allah, but Allah, which I shall do, inshallah. To the other non Muslims, to the other non Muslims, first, I have to prove to him that the God he's worshipping is false. So half the time I waste in trying to prove that the God he's worshipping is false. Here, half my job is done, la ilaha. Only thing left for me is illa Allah and then Muhammad Rasulullah. But Allah and Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon the Messenger of Allah. Now this atheist, he rejects God because 
He has the wrong concept of God. Now, anyone who says he does not believe in God, first I'll ask him, what is the definition of God? For anyone to reject anything, he should know its definition. For example, if I say, this is a pen, for you to say it is not a pen, you should know the definition of pen. If you don't know the definition of pen, you cannot say this is not a pen. Is it clear? Do you agree with me or not? If I say this is a pen, for you to say it is not a pen, you have to know the definition of pen, otherwise, you cannot logically say it's not a pen. There was a smart person. He said, no, Brother Zakir. I know that's a book. So even if I don't know the definition of a pen, I can say it's not a pen. I know it's a book. So why should I know the definition of pen? So I said, fine. Do you know that's a book? He says, yes. I say, this, this is a kitab. He will say, no, it's not a kitab. He knows the definition of book, but does not know the definition of kitab. Kitab, in Arabic, and Urdu, means a book. If I say this is a pen, knowing definition of a pen is more important than knowing what is this. Same way, if a person says there's no God, I'll first ask him, what is the definition of God? The definition they give is when they see that a God tells a lie, a God can be defeated, the God, he can be killed. So when we hear all these stories of God telling a lie, a God can be defeated, a God can be killed, a God can die, a God requires to eat. So they reject the God. Who are they rejecting? They are rejecting the false gods, la ilaha. Similarly, someone, if he believes that Islam is a religion of terrorism, Islam is a merciless religion, Islam is an unscientific religion, Islam is a religion which does not give rights to the woman, and he rejects this Islam. I say, even I reject such Islam. Because I know that Islam is a merciful religion. Islam, it's a scientific religion. Islam has human rights. Islam has women rights. So what do I do? I tell him, the Islam you believe and you reject, it should be rejected, but true Islam is, then I present to him the true Islam. Similarly, when these people are rejecting the false God, we have to present to them what is the true God. And the best definition of Almighty God, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, given in the Quran, is from Surah Ikhlas, chapter number 112, verse number 1 to 4, which says, Kul hu Allahu ahad. Say, He is Allah one and only. Allah hu samad. Allah, the absolute and eternal. Lam yirid wa lam yulad. He begets not, nor is he begotten. Wa lam yakul lahu kuffan ahad. There is nothing like Him. This is a four-line definition of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Any person saying that so-and-so person is God, if that person fits in this four-line definition, we Muslims have got no objection in accepting that person as God. The first is, Kul wallahuad, says Allah one and only. Second is, Allah samad, Allah the absolute and eternal. Lam milid wa lam yulad, he begets not nor is he begotten. Walam yakul lahu kufanad, there is nothing like him. There are many people who say that Dajnish, he's Almighty God. Let us put this Bhagwan Dajnish to the test of Surah class. There's a person who asked me a question at the time, that Brother Zakir, we Hindus do not believe in Bhagwan Dajnish to be God. I never said that Hindus believe Bhagwan Dajnish to be God. I've read the Hindu scripture. Nowhere do the Hindu scriptures say Bhagavan Dajnish is God. I said some human beings, some people believe Bhagavan Dajnish to be God. Let us put this Bhagavan Dajnish to the test of Surah class. The first is, Qul hu Allah ahad. Says Allah one and only. Was Bhagavan Dajnish one and only? Was he the only man who claimed divinity? There are hundreds who have claimed divinity. And in this country alone, there are thousands who have claimed that they were gods. He's not the only one. But the Rajnish Bhakt will say, no, he is one and only, he is unique. Let's go to the next test. Allah Samad. Allah, the absolute eternal. Was Rajnish absolute eternal? We know from the autobiography of Rajnish 
he says that he was suffering from asthma, from chronic backache, from diabetes mellitus. Imagine Almighty God suffering from asthma, chronic backache, diabetes mellitus. Third test is lamulit valamulat. He begets not nor is begotten. We know Bhagavan Rajnish. He was born in Madhya Pradesh. And later on, in 1981, he goes to America and takes thousands of Americans for a ride. And in the state of Oregon, he starts his village called as Rajnishpuram. Later on, the American government, they arrest him and they put him behind bars. And Rajnish, he alleges that the American government, they slow poisoned me in the prison. Imagine Almighty God being slow poisoned. Later on, the American government, the king of the country, he comes back to India and goes back to the city of Pune, where he has a center, which is now called as Osho Commune. And when you go to the center, if you go to the Samadhi, it is mentioned there on the Samadhi, Bhagavan Rajnish, Osho, never born, never died, but visited the earth from the 11th of December, 1931, to the 19th of January, 1990. Never born, never died. But visited the earth from the 11th of December, 1931, to the 19th of January, 1990. They forgot to mention on a samadhi that he was not given visas to more than 21 countries of the world. <laughs> Almighty God coming to visit the world and he requires visas. And the Archbishop of Greece said that if you don't remove Rajnish out of this country, we'll burn his house and the house of his disciples. And the last test, Walam Kuffan Ad, that nothing like him is so stringent that no one besides the true Almighty God can pass. The moment you can compare God to anyone in this world, to anyone in the universe, he's not God. Walam Kuffan Ad, there's nothing like him. Suppose someone says that Almighty God is a thousand times stronger than Arnold Schwarzenegger. You may have heard the name of Arnold Schwarzenegger, the person who got the title Mr. World, the strongest man in the world, Mr. Universe, the strongest man in the universe. If someone says that Almighty God is thousand times stronger than Arnold Schwarzenegger, the moment you can compare God to anything in this world, whether it be Arnold Schwarzenegger, whether it be Dara Singh, whether it be King Kong, whether it be a thousand times or a million times, the moment you can compare God to anything in this world, he is not God. Walam yakulla kufanad, there's nothing like him. You know Bhagavan Rajnish, he wore white clothes, he had a beard, he had two eyes like the human beings, one nose, two hands. The moment you can compare God to anything in this world, he is not God. Walam yakulla kufanad. Otherwise, Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse 110. Say, call upon him by Allah or by Rahman. By whichever name you call upon him, to him belong the most beautiful name. You can call Allah by any name, but it should be a beautiful name. It should not conjure up a mental picture. It should be a name given by himself. And this message, besides being mentioned in Surah Isra, chapter 17, verse 110, it's also mentioned in Surah Araf, chapter number 7, verse 180, in Surah Ta'a, chapter number 20, verse number 8, as well as Surah Hashar, chapter 59, verse number 24, that to Allah belong the most beautiful name. Many of the atheists, they believe in science. All these arguments may not satisfy them completely. Many of the atheists, they say that science is the yardstick. They believe science is ultimate. So let's try and prove to this group of atheists also about the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if I know that this atheist believes only in science, after congratulating him, I'll ask him a simple question. That if suppose there is equipment, there is a gadget who no one in the world has ever seen, and if that gadget is bought in front of you, and if the question is asked, that who will be the first person who will be able to tell you the mechanism of this gadget? That atheist, he may say, after thinking for a while, the first person who will be able to tell you the mechanism of a gadget who no one in the world has ever seen, no one in the world knows about it, he will tell you 
that the creator of the gadget. Or he may say the maker of the gadget. He may say the inventor. He may say the producer. He may say the manufacturer. Whatever he says, it will be somewhat similar. Either creator, manufacturer, producer, maker, inventor, somewhat similar. Just keep that answer at the back of your mind. The second person is the creator, if he says to somebody else, he'll come to know, or a person who does research, but that is secondary. You ask this atheist that, how did our universe come into existence? So he will tell you that our universe was initially one primary nebula. Then there was a secondary separation, a big bang, which gave rise to galaxies, stars, moon, sun, and the earth on which we live. This he calls as the Big Bang. You ask him, when did you come to know about this creation of the universe, about the Big Bang? He will tell you about 50 years back, 40 years back. So you tell him, this thing what you're mentioning about the Big Bang is already mentioned in the Quran 1400 years ago in Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 30, where Allah says, Avalam yaral kafuru. Do not the unbelievers see anna samawati wal arda that the heaven and the earth were joined together and we clove them asunder. What you're talking about, the Big Bang, is already mentioned in the Quran 1400 years ago. Who could have mentioned this in the Quran? So he will tell, maybe it's a fluke. Somebody wrote it. No problem. Don't argue with him. Ask him the next question. What is the shape of the earth? So he will tell you, previously the human beings thought that the world was flat. It was in 1577 when Sir Francis Drake, he sailed around the earth that he proved that the earth was spherical. You tell him that the Quran mentions in Surah Naziat, chapter number 79, verse number 30, that Wal Ard ba dazalika dahaha. We have made the earth X shape. The Arabic word dahaha, one of its meaning is an expanse, and the earth is an expanse. The other meaning is derived from the Arabic word duya, which means an egg. And we know today that the earth is not completely round like a ball. It is starting from the pole and bulging from the center. It is geospherical in shape. It is somewhat similar to the egg. And the Arabic word duya does not refer to a normal leg. It specifically refers to the egg of an ostrich. And if you analyze the shape of the egg of an ostrich, it is geospherical in shape. Imagine the Quran mentioned that the earth is geospherical 1400 years ago. Who could have mentioned that? So he will tell you, Ah, your prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was an intelligent man. Don't argue. Continue. The light of the moon, is it its own line of reflected light? So the atheist will tell you, previously we thought that the light of the moon was its own light. But today we know that the light of the moon is not its own light, it's a reflected light. When did you come to know? He will tell you, we came to know yesterday, 50 years back, 100 years back, 200 years back. Quran mentions 1400 years ago in Surah Furqan, chapter number 25. Verse number 61. That blessed is he who hath placed the constellation in the sky. And therein, sun, shams, having its own light, and moon having borrowed light. The Arabic word for sun is shams. Its light is always described as siraj or wahaj, meaning a torch or a blazing lamp. And the moon in Arabic is called as kamar. Its light is always described as munir or nur. Munir means borrowed light, and noor means a reflection of light. And nowhere is the moonlight described as Vahaj or Siraj. It's always described as noor or munir. Borrowed light or reflection of light. Who could have mentioned this in the Quran 14 years ago? Now there'll be a pause. Don't wait for the reply. Continue. When I was in school, I had learned that the sun revolved but it was stationary, it did not rotate about its axis. The Quran says in Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 33, It is Allah who has created the night and the day, the sun and the moon, each one traveling in an orbit with its own motion. The Arabic word yasbahun describes the motion of a moving body. And if it's talking about a celestial body, it means that this sun and the moon, besides Revolving, it's also rotating about its own axis. And today science tells us that the sun takes approximately 25 days to complete one rotation. Imagine what I read in school. I finished my school in 1982. 
Sun was stationary 1400 years before the Quran says the sun rotates. And my science book said the sun was stationary. Today, it has been incorporated that the sun rotates. You ask him, that who could have mentioned this? There'll be a silent pause. Some critics will say, it's nothing great that the Quran speaks about astronomy because the Arabs were advanced in the field of astronomy. I do agree, the Arabs were advanced in the field of astronomy, but I'd like to remind them that it was centuries after the Quran was revealed that the Arabs became advanced in the field of astronomy. So it is from the Quran that the Arabs learned about astronomy and not the vice versa. In the subject of hydrology, when you ask the atheist, that you ask him about the water cycle, he will tell you that the water evaporates from the ocean. It forms into clouds. The clouds move into the interior. It falls down as rain, and the water will be replenished. You ask him, when did you come to know this? He will tell you it was in 1580 when Sir Bernard Palissy, he spoke about the water cycle for the first time, 1580. So you tell him, what you came to know in 1580, just hardly a couple of hundred years before, the Quran mentions 1400 years ago. The Quran says, the water evaporates from the ocean, formed into the clouds, the clouds move and join, the moon in the interior, and they fall down as rain, and the water will be finished. The water cycle is spoken in the Quran in great detail in several places. It's mentioned in Surah Zumur, chapter 39, verse number 21. In Surah Rum, chapter number 30, verse number 24. In Surah Hijar, chapter number 15, verse number 22. In Surah Mu'minun, chapter number 23, verse number 18. In Surah Rum, chapter number 30, verse number 48. In Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 43. It's mentioned in Surah Naba, chapter number 78, verse number 12 to 14. It's mentioned in Surah Araf, chapter number 7, verse 57. In Surah Raj, chapter number 13, verse number 17. It's mentioned in Surah Furqan, chapter number 25, verse number 40 and 49. It's mentioned in Surah Yasin, chapter number 36, verse number 34. It's mentioned in Surah Fatir, chapter number 35, verse number 9. It's mentioned in Surah Jasha, chapter number 45, verse number 5. In Surah Qaf, chapter number 50, verse number 9 and 10. It's mentioned in Surah Waqa, chapter number 56, verse number 67 to 70. It's mentioned in Surah Tariq, chapter number 86, verse number 11. I can go on and go on and go on, quoting only the verses in the Quran, we speak about the water cycle only. The Quran speaks about the water cycle in great detail. Who could have mentioned this in the Quran 14 years ago? No reply, don't worry, continue. The Quran speaks about geology. The geologists say that the radius of the earth is 3,750 miles. The deeper layers are hot and fluid. The upper layer is a thin crust, hardly one to 20 miles in thickness, and there are high possibilities it will shake. It is due to the folding phenomena, which gives rise to mountain ranges, which prevents the earth from shaking. Allah mentioned this in the Quran. It's mentioned in the Quran. In Surah Naba, chapter number 78, verse number seven, as well as eight, Allah says, Wal Jibal Autada, we have made the earth as an expanse and the mountains as pegs which science has agreed today. A similar message is mentioned in Surah Ambiya, chapter 21, verse number 31, that we have placed on the earth mountain standing firm, lest it would shake with you. In the field of oceanology, previously we knew that there were two types of water, salt and sweet, but the Quran says in Surah Furqan, chapter 25, verse number 53, that it is he who has let free two bodies of flowing water, one sweet and palatable, the other salty and bitter. Though they meet, they do not mix. There is a barrier which is forbidden to be trespassed. We knew that there were two types of water, but what does the Quran mean there is a barrier which is forbidden to be trespassed? Today we know that whenever one type of water flows into the other type of water, it loses its constituents and gets homogenized into the water it flows. This homogenizing area is called as a barrier, a barzakh in the Quran. Quran mentioned this 14 years ago. Quran mentioned about biology. It's mentioned in Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 30. We have created every living thing from water. Will you not then believe? Who could have believed in the deserts of Arabia that everything is made from water? Today, science tells us that every living thing is made from water. There is a theory known as theory of probability. That if you make a wild guess, the chances you'll be right 
is depending upon what are the options. For example, if I toss a coin, head or tails, whatever reply you give, the chances you'll be right is one upon two, ha, 50%. Two options, chances you'll be right is one upon two, 50%. If I toss a coin twice, the chances I'll be right both the times is one upon two into one upon two, it is one upon four, it is 25%. If I toss a coin thrice, the chances I'll be right all three times is one upon two into one upon two into one upon two, it is one upon eight, 12 and a half percent. If I throw a dice, the dice has got six sides. The chances if I make a wild guess it will be right is one upon six. Now if you apply this theory of probability that someone made a wild guess, for example, what is the shape of the earth? You can think of 10 things. Flat, square, rectangle, triangular, hexagonal, on and on, maybe spherical. The chances if you make a wild guess it is spherical, it will be right is one upon 10. If you ask a person the light of the moon, is it its own light or reflected light? If he makes a wild guess, chances he'll be right is one upon two. The chances that both are right, the shape of the earth and the light of the moon is not its own light, is one upon 10 into one upon two is one upon 20. That is 5%. All living creatures made of what? You can think of a thousand things. Sand, iron, tin, wood, on and on, maybe even water. Chances, you make a wild guess and one is right, is one upon 1,000. Chances, all three are correct. Shape of the earth is spherical. Light of the moon is reflected. Everything made from water is one upon 10 into one upon two into one upon 1,000. Is one upon 20,000. Is 0.005%. Only in three scientific facts, it's 0.005%. I've already mentioned several. And if you read my book, there are hundreds. There are many things. Quran speaks about botany. In Surah Rahad, chapter number 13, verse number 3, that all the fruits are created in pairs, in sexes, male and female. Quran says in Surah Taha, chapter number 20, verse 53, that the plants are made in sexes, male and female, which you came to know recently. In the field of zoology, Quran says the animals and the birds live in community like the human beings. In Surah Anam, chapter number 6, verse number 38, which we came to know recently. Quran speaks about the bee, that it can find its path, which we came to know recently. In Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 60 and 69. The Quran says that the worker bee is the female bee. Previously thought it was the male bee. Quran says in Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 69, that the worker bee is the female bee. Quran speaks about the lifestyle of the spider in Surah Ankabut, chapter 29, verse number 41. The Quran speaks about the lifestyle of the ant in Surah Namal, chapter number 27, verse number 17 and 18, which we have come to know recently. Quran speaks about genetics, that it is the male fluid, it is the sperm which is responsible for the sex of the child. In Surah Najam, chapter number 53, verse number 45 and 46, as well as chapter number 75, verse number 37 to 39, which we came to know recently. Quran speaks about embryology, that all the human beings are made from alaka, a leech-like substance, something which clings. In Surah Alaq, Surah Ikra, chapter 96, verse number 2, which we came to know recently. Quran speaks about the various embryological stages. Alaka, Mudga, Izama, Lahem. In Surah Mu'minun, chapter number 23, verse number 12 to 14, which we have come to know recently. There are various scientific facts mentioned in the Quran. I'll just mention Two more. There are people who say that after we human beings die and after we are buried and our bones are disintegrated, how will Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be able to reconstruct the bone on the day of judgment? So Allah says, it's mentioned in the Quran, chapter number 75, verse number 3 and 4, that when they say that how will Allah be able to reconstruct the bones on the day of judgment, tell them, Allah can not only reconstruct the bones, He can even reconstruct in perfect order the very tips of your finger. What does Allah mean by saying He can not only reconstruct your bones, He can even reconstruct in perfect order the very tips of your finger? It was in 1880 that Sir Francis Gold, he discovered the fingerprinting method and said that no two fingerprints, even in a million human beings, are identical. Today, the police, the CID, the FBI, the CIA, 
they use the fingerprinting method to identify the criminal. Quran speaks about the fingerprinting method 1400 years ago, and we discovered in 1880. Who could have mentioned this? I would like to mention one more thing before I end the scientific facts is that there was a scientist by the name of Prophet Takradakashan. Prophet Takradakashan hails from Thailand, and he was doing a great deal of research in the pain receptors. Previously, we human beings, we thought, and the doctors thought, that only the brain was responsible for the feeling of pain. Today, we come to know that there are certain receptors in the skin which are also responsible for the feeling of pain. That's the reason when a person of burn injury comes to a doctor, the doctor takes a pin and pricks it in the area of burn. If the patient feels pain, the doctor is happy. The pain receptors are intact. If the patient does not feel pain, the doctor is sad. The pain receptors have been destroyed. It's mentioned in the Quran, in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse 56, that as to those who reject our signs, we shall cast them in the hellfire. And as often as the skins are roasted, we shall give them fresh skin so that they feel the pain. Indicating there is something in the skin which is responsible for the feeling of pain. Imagine, Quran speaks about the pain receptors 14 years ago. And Prophet Taqrat Akashan, when he came to know this is mentioned in the Quran, in the ninth medical conference in Riyadh, in the conference itself, he said the Shahada and said, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. There is no God but Allah, and Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon the Messenger of Allah. So when you ask the atheist, who could have mentioned this in the Quran? The only reply I can give you is the same which he gave you earlier. It is the creator, it is the maker, it is the producer, it is the manufacturer, it is the inventor. This creator, this producer, this manufacturer, this maker, this inventor, we Muslims call him as Allah. That's the reason today science is not eliminating God. It is eliminating models of God. La ilaha illallah. Scientists today, they are eliminating models of God. This cannot be God. This cannot be God. They aren't eliminating God. And a famous philosopher and scientist, Francis Bacon, he said that those who have little knowledge of science, they become atheist. But those who have in-depth knowledge of science, they become a believer in God. I would like to end my talk with the quotation of the Quran from Surah Fusilat, chapter 41, verse number 53, which says, Sanurihim ayatina fil afakhi, wa fi anfusihim, hatta yatabayyira lom anna ulaq, awalam yakfi bi rabbika, anna wala kulla shayin shaheed, that soon we shall show them our signs into the furthest reaches of the horizons and into the soul until it is clear to them that this is the truth. Waakhra dawana, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Ask, let me ask Professor Kras a question. Why is, why is incest wrong? It's, uh, it's not clear to me that it's wrong. Okay. It's clear to me, it, there's, a, there's an evidence. No, no. <laughs> Listen, listen to me. L l listen to me. Wait, wait. Let's, let's give him. Let's okay. give him the respect, please. He's got a justification. You ask me a question, and if you want me to answer, I will. Yeah, of course. Okay. Do it. Okay. okay. The point is, most societies have, tab have a taboo on incest, and, and it's an empirical one. Generally, incest produces genetic defects. Yes. Okay. Uh, and so, the, so in 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 general, there's a physiological reason and a, and a societal one why incest is wrong. Yes. Okay. But if you ask me the question, is it, and this is an interesting question. We are in, by the way, it's an ingrained, there's an in, ingrained incest taboo in almost all societies for that reason. Sure. Because societies want to persist, so it, it works. But if you ask me a priori, for example, the question, if a, a brother and a sister loved each other and used contraception, is, is there something absolutely morally wrong about that? I'm, I, and that, by the way, and it was once, and they went off and it didn't affect anything else? I'd have to think about it, because I don't think there's any absolute condemnation of that fact. If they love each other and care for each other, and they go off and it doesn't affect anything else, okay. I, I, would I recommend it? No. Would I be particularly happy about it? But would I, would I be willing to listen to those arguments? If they were rational, maybe. Okay. Mm. Is rape wrong objectively, past, present, future, yes or no? 
Given, uh, yes. You shouldn't given, hesitate it's, here. It's an object. Why not? Because oh, I'm oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So so I should so. The, the, base, the base idea of ethics, right, the base idea of doing ethics, is that we reevaluate why we believe certain things and see if they're accurate, right? If there is a, a proposition that you believe to be totally true, as I thought, for instance, um, of something like not being a racist, right? If somebody asks me, why are you not a racist? And I immediately say, or, or are you not a racist? And I immediately say, yes, of course I'm not a racist, right? Whereas it pays sometimes, even if it seems ethically obvious, to sit back and think, well, why do I think that? Am I sure answer? about that? And the answer can lead you to other moral place. Sure, what's the answer? So the answer is this, right? It is objectively true that to allow people to rape morally would not be an achievement of the goal that we all share. That's not the question that's, I asked. That's, that's the objectivity in it. Yeah, but you're answering a question... What you want me to do... You want me to do wait one second. You're answering a question I didn't ask. I asked a very clear question which yeah. everybody, I think, understood here, right? I, I asked, I, is rape wrong? Ob is that objectively true? And you're just beating around the bush. But the reason why I have to beat around the bush is because I have to clarify that remember how I said that a base principle can be subjective but you can have objective derivatives from it? Right. So in terms of the objective derivative from our nature, yes, it is objectively wrong. Yes, is the answer to your question. Based upon the subject. But you're going to want to turn around then and say, but it's based upon a subjective principle. Yes. Yes, it is, right? Yes. But that doesn't mean that I can say rape is not objectively wrong. I say that if we agree on this subjective moral principle, which we do, then we can make the objective derivative No, but rape would, would a rapist agree to that? Of course they wouldn't. No, they wouldn't. But again, whether or not someone agrees with me is irrelevant to whether it's correct But look, look Alex, this is another jump Alex, you Alex, what you're doing is you're building a house on a sandcastle, yeah? Mm. You are trying to say, look, if, if, it, if you ask me the question, I would say it's rape is wrong. Yes, it's mm. wrong objectively. Yeah. But in your case, what you basically, you're basically you're, you're doing is you're saying, right, subjectively, mm -hmm. some people may hold this opinion according to that, then since they all subjectively... No, no, all, all people do hold that opinion. Okay, and look, from that, we objectively but, derive but that rape is wrong. A rapist wrong, yes. doesn't... Of course, doesn't hold that opinion. No, no. A, a rapist does value their pleasure and, and the avoidance. Yeah, of their they, they value their they pleasure, yeah, they right? right? So it's not wrong for them. Yeah, right. Okay. Because so they're maximizing their pleasure. No, but look again. This is the mistake we're making. I said. I, I remember. Not we're making. Earlier. You're I making said, because this is this is the man going into town and saying, "Let's paint the round yellow, the town yellow." This is what the rapist is doing, right? Just because they're saying it's all subjective. I want this to be yellow. I don't want it to be blue. It's like but you, you are being Alex, inconsistent. You are this, assuming this doesn't work. You, you are wrong. Right? You are incorrect. Even if it's based on a subjective base principle, yeah, but it is objectively wrong Alex, as your, a derivative to be saying Your entire argument is based upon the assumption that everybody likes the color blue. That's not true. And in look, no, look, of course that's not true, but by analogy. Look, me, by like, analogy me liking the color, me liking yeah. chocolate mm -hmm. or vanilla yeah. is as arbitrary for Alex mm. as someone committing rape or not committing rape. But it's not as necessarily see, see, true. Said, but it's not as necessary. Yeah, it's not as necessary. Do, do you see? So for him, it's just as subjective. Whether you like chocolate vanilla I, or, or something else, it's just as subjective when it comes to rape, murder, pillaging, all of these things. And behind all the sophisticated technical jargon and I'll take that as a compliment. Essentially, <laughs> essentially what it boils down to is the same thing which Richard Dawkins admitted to, the idea that rape is wrong is as arbitrary as the fact that we have five fingers rather than six. Good evening, doctor. Sales manager from shipping company. Is the hell and paradise are there? How as a common person I believe? I don't believe in any religion. Well, that's the question that, how do I know that hell and heaven? How will a common man believe? I don't believe in a religion. Brother, what is the definition of religion? Religion is a way of life. How you lead your life. Many people say that I don't mind, I'm just a human being, I'm born, I will do test and error, and I will know how to lead a life. For example, you go to a forest. You are going to a forest the first time. You don't know whether the fruits are poisonous or not. If you start eating any fruit, you may end up eating a fruit which is poisonous and you may die. What do you do? You ask an expert. Right or wrong? When you get sick, who do you go to, brother? When you are sick, who do you go to? Why? The doctor is an expert in treating sickness, correct? You can't say, I am a human being. I will treat myself. No. That's what the Quran says in Surah Nahal. The Quran says in Surah Nahal, chapter 16, verse 43, and Surah Ambiya, chapter 20, verse number 7, Fas alu ahal zikri in kuntula talamun. If you don't know, ask the person's expert. Similarly, to lead a life, we have to ask the expert. Now, who is the expert? Who is the expert? The person who created us. Who created us? It's Almighty God. So, we have to follow the commandment of Almighty God. 
if you do not believe in almighty god you should listen to my video cassette is the quran god's word where i have proved logically and scientifically the existence of allah subhanahu wa taala if you are an atheist are you an atheist brother are you an atheist pardon me are you an atheist no no not an atheist so what do you do you believe in god actually i believe in the power but fine that means you believe in god <laughs> you I want to call it power you want to call it supernatural you believe in god it's like i believe something something you don't is... know the name that name is god <laughs> you may call it power you may call it anything if you don't believe in god then you listen to my video cassette is the quran god's word if you don't know who that power is yet you listen to my cassette is the quran god's word where i have proven scientifically undoubtedly existence of allah subhanahu wa taala and the quran is the word of almighty god now coming to your question if you say about power that means you believe in a religion because religion by definition according to oxford dictionary religion means a belief in a supernatural controlling power power word is there that means you believe in a religion religion according to oxford dictionary means a belief in a supernatural controlling power a personal god or gods that deserve obedience and worship that means you believe in religion you don't know the definition of religion so don't say I don't believe in religion religion is english word brother religion is english word if you open the oxford dictionary it says religion means a belief in a superhuman controlling power and you believe in a power or a personal god or god that is a worship or obedience to know more about that power you see my video cuz it is the quran god's word now coming to your question basic question how will i prove that there is hell and heaven now if you hear my video cuz i have proved many scientific aspects in the quran if you use science to the quran what we come to know that whatever the quran has said today 80% can be proved to be 100% correct scientifically quran speaks about various scientific facts which we came to know recently books about astronomy it speaks about the spherical nature of the earth it speaks about the big bang it speaks about the light of the moon is not its own light reflected light it speaks about the water cycle it speaks about biology it speaks about botany it speaks about zoology it speaks about embryology all these things now today is the age of science and technology if we put this test of science to the quran what we come to know 80% whatever the quran has said is 100% perfectly correct the balance 20% is ambiguous neither right neither wrong out of the 20% not even 0.01% has been proved to be wrong by scientific fact it is ambiguous so what my logic says when 80% is 100% correct and not even 0.01% of the 20% is proved wrong so my logic says that inshallah even that 20% will be correct it's a logical belief I have been a medical doctor, Quran, speed of astronomy, embryology, genetics, everything perfect. Then you ask me, brother, you being a doctor, you believe in hell? You believe in heaven? You believe in jinn? You believe in life after death? So my logic says, inshallah, even the other twenty percent in the Quran, which science hasn't reached up to that level, science cannot prove it. Maybe science will prove fifty years later or ten years later, but today science hasn't reached that level. So in this way, I believe whatever twenty percent we science hasn't proved to be right or wrong, inshallah, even that will be right. This is one way to prove about hell and heaven. There's another way, simple way, without reading Quran, brother. I am asking a simple question: Is robbing good or bad? Robbing is good or bad? Robbing is bad. Bad. Yeah. Raping a girl is good or bad? No, 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 bad. 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 Okay, now. I am asking you a question. Logically, I suppose happen to be the biggest mafia. Hypothetically, I am a big robber. You prove to me logically and scientifically. I am a very logical person. I am a scientific person. I am a logical person and scientific person. You prove to me why robbing is bad for me, and I will stop robbing. Only one reason you give me. One good reason. Why robbing is bad for me, and I will stop robbing. It hurts others. It hurts people. It hurts others. What difference does it make to me? If it hurts, if I rob, if I rob a thousand real, it is benefiting me. I can see movie. I can go to a five-star hotel. What difference does it make whether it hurts others? Does it hurt me? 
I told you proof to me why it is bad for me, not for others. I am least bothered about the others. Why is it bad for me? When I'm robbing thousand, if it hurts him, no problem. What difference does it make to me? If it hurts somebody else, does it make a difference to me? I can enjoy, I can see movie. I can eat chicken biryani. I asked you, give me one logical reason why it is bad for me, not why it is bad for others. I'm a big mafia. I'm powerful. I'm a scientific person, logical person. Prove to me one good reason, logical, why robbing is bad, I will stop robbing. Come on, another try, brother. Another try. One more try. Why it is bad? No answer. No answer. Try, try. There are 20, 30 reasons, 100 reasons you can give. You know, actually, as you said, the religion means the way of life. Not religion. Why robbing is bad? Tell me. Don't go to religion. No, no. <laughs> I'm, I'm coming to the point. No, not point. First, tell me why robbing is bad. We'll come back to your point afterwards. I'll come to your point afterwards. When that yes. is the way of life. Not way of life. Tell me why robbing is bad according to you. Why it is bad for me, I will stop robbing. Up to me, you know, it hurts others. So, but you know, what difference does it make to me when it hurts others? Does it hurt me? Of course, you know. Why once it is bad for me, not why it is bad for others. Once we come to the society, you know, we have to face, face them. Okay, once we come to the society, you have to face them. I'm facing them. I'm facing them. What is what? Why it is bad for me? The society won't respect us. What difference does it make whether they respect or not? I can eat chicken biryani. I can go and see a movie. I can go to a five-star hotel. What difference does it make to me if society respects or not? Imagine someone respects society. The poor person doesn't have food to eat. He'll be happy? No. You require food to eat or not? You require food to survive? Only society respect in the person is starving to death. You know, in India, thousands of people are starving to death. What difference does it make? I must give me one good reason why robbing is bad. I stop robbing. Why it is bad for me? Can anyone else help him out? Why robbing is bad? Why robbing is bad? There are various answers. I'll help you out. You may say, Police will catch you. Good logical reason. Police will come and catch you. Correct? Right or wrong? Correct. Ah, but you didn't give the... I'm helping you out. <laughs> but brother, I told you I'm a powerful mafia. The police is in my pocket. Ministers are in my pocket. Big mafia. See, all the top mafia, the police is in the pocket. They are on my payroll. The police is on my payroll. What will they catch me? Small robber like you should not rob. You will get arrested. I'm a top mafia. The police is on my payroll, even the ministers are on my payroll, they are in my pocket. So small robber like you should not rob, big mafia like me can rob. Another reason, I'll help you out. Maybe somebody will come and rob you. Yes. No one can rob me because I've got 100 bodyguards. All of them hiding behind the stage. Bodyguards. Small robber robs, somebody will rob him. No one can rob me because I've got bodyguards. Hundreds of bodyguards with AK-47. So logically, you cannot prove at all why robbing is bad. With all your science and technology, you cannot prove robbing is bad. So shall I take it in that way, you know, it is to make people fear that, you know, if you do wrong things, then when you die. What wrong thing? Where is robbing wrong? First you prove it is wrong, na? Where is robbing wrong? You haven't proved to me robbing is wrong. When you prove robbing is wrong, then you can say don't do wrong things, na? Therefore, what is good, what is right, you require a creator to tell you. You require a doctor to tell you what food is good, what food is bad. This fruit is poisonous, this is healthy for you. Apple is healthy for you, wild berries are poisonous for you. A doctor tells you. There's no better doctor than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Logically speaking, logically speaking, brother, that mafia has got bodyguards. No one can harm him. And believe me, there are many examples. He dies a very comfortable death. But I'm asking a simple question now, brother. Don't you think that there should be justice. Brother? Yes. Justice. Someone should punish him or not? Law is there. But the law cannot punish every human being here. Why? There are many mafias in Italy. There are many underworld people in India. And the law can't do anything to them. The law is in their pocket. But yet, you as a common man, don't you think you should be punished? Raping is good or bad? There are many people who rape. They rape the girls. No, nothing. The law cannot catch them. So don't you think 
he should be punished. Yes or no? Yes. But there are many people you see in this world who are big mafias, they die comfortable, they are rich, they are millionaires. There should be some justice. The reply is given by the Creator. Sulay Al Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 185. Allah says, Kullu nafsin zaikatul maut. Every soul shall have a taste of death. But the final recompense will be on the day of judgment. This life is the mere chattels of deception. If there is no life after death, this life is of injustice. What we say that the total justice would be on the day of judgment. Our great almighty God will give justice. I tell the person, fine, you may be a big robber. For example, you are that mafia, now I am a Muslim. No one can harm you. Police in your pocket. Then I ask you, justice is required, yes. If someone robs you, no one can rob you, agree. But don't you feel there should be justice? There are many robbers, there are many evils, there are many criminals who go scot-free. Unless there is life after death. You cannot prove robbing is bad. You cannot prove raping is bad. Unless there is life after death, no humanity, no book on humanity. No Mother Teresa, no Mahatma Gandhi can prove robbing is bad without the concept of life after death. Because, I'm asking you a question. Hitler, history tells us Hitler insinuated 6 million Jews. How many Jews? 6 million. 6 million. Suppose the law catches Hitler. What punishment can you give Hitler so that you can compensate for? He has burnt 6 million Jews alive. Can you give him any punishment? Brother. We have to put him in jail till his life death. Okay, will it be equivalent to burning 6 million Jews? Is burning better or putting in jail better? It's burning is, of, of course. course. So maximum you can do is burn him alive. But that will be equal to 1 out of 6 million. What about the remaining 5 million? 999,999 people. What about that? What justice is your Lord going to do? But the Quran says in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, Verse number 56. As to those who reject our signs, we shall cast them in the hellfire. And as often as the skins are roasted, we shall give them fresh skin so that they shall feel the pain. If Hitler killed 6 million Jews, Allah says he can put him into hellfire and give him fresh skin again. 6 million times Allah can burn him. Not here, in the year after, in the hell. So only way I can prevent Hitler from killing 6 million Jews is tell him that here you kill 6 million Jews, Allah will burn you 12 million times in the year after. You can't give him that thing here. What you realize, without the concept of hell and heaven, you cannot prove robbing is bad. You cannot prove raping is bad. That's the reason our Creator Almighty God, who has created the human beings, He tells us what is good, what is bad for us. And He tells us the rules and regulations. This is called as religion. So first you have to find out which book is the authentic book which has been revealed by this Almighty God. And when you do research, you will come to it, that is the Quran. All the scriptures speak about Almighty God and all the scriptures they point out to the last and final revelation of the Quran and last and final message of Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. Hope that answers the question. Thanks. Hello, Dr. Zakir Naik. My name is Harris. I'm from Phoenix, Arizona in the United States. I'm an entrepreneur and a marketing manager. Two of my friends in America have converted uh, watching YouTube videos of you. Uh, one of them a Christian, one of them an atheist. One of my friends um, presented me with how to deal with an atheist DVD of yours, which I did watch. Uh, but that didn't answer my question. And I've asked this question to a lot of people with no satisfactory answers, a lot of intelligent people. Of all the scholars that I've ever watched on YouTube, in my opinion, you are the most rational, logical, easy to understand kind of scholar that I've ever come across in my life. And it is really important that this question is answered because I've never had a satisfactory answer for this question. Uh, my question is like a coin with two sides. The first side of it is this, and this is the question. I'm somewhere between an atheist and agnostic. I'm not sure where. Um, God has created this entire universe, and the Quran speaks a lot about how it has taken so many days and mountains and this and that, and life is going to be a test and whatnot. My question is, 
way before God decided to create this entire universe, before he decided to put human beings, before he decided to send Prophet Muhammad or Adam and Eve, way before he even planned about doing any of this, he knew the end result of it. He knows in the end he will be disappointed by certain people and he will throw them in the hellfire. He knows they will be burning. He knows they will be tortured and that is when they will be repenting for what they've done. Way before he created the entire universe, he knows the outcome is going to be bad. It may be good for certain people who are in heaven, but he knows that he can save those people from being in hell. Way before he even decided to go ahead with the creation. Yet he decides to go ahead with it, with all his godly logic. Why would he want to do that? The question, if I can just put it in this manner, how can God be so sadistic that he would actually go ahead with a plan which he knows is going to end up in that manner? That's the first side of the coin. The second side of the coin is, for some reason, if I believe that, okay, God is all, almighty and he understands everything is great, God is great. Why is God insisting in the Quran that look at the mountains, look at the protons, the electrons, this and that, everything is so synchronized, how amazing I am. Why is he forcing us to find his creation amazing when it is a piece of cake for God? I mean, he just had to say kun and it was done. Then why is it a big deal if God has made this entire universe which is so amazing? Because for God it's nothing. So I should not be really amazed at his creation. He can do much more than this. So I do not understand why he wants us to respect what he's done or find it amazing what he has done. The brother asked a very good question and a very intellectual question. It's a very good question. And he has seen some of my tapes on YouTube, even of atheism. And this question that is troubling him, he hasn't got the answer to. The brother asked the question that Almighty God knows everything before he created the heaven and the earth, before he created a human being. Even if one person goes to he could avoid hell, that. Hell, he could have avoided that. I mean, he could avoid being disappointed. Of course. I'll reply. The brother said, even if one person goes to hell, it is as though God would be disappointed. Now, coming to your question, I started a school. I started a school. And you may have heard Islamic International School. If a teacher takes an examination, if she's just, while she is giving the examination, she writes in the maths paper, 2 plus 2 is equal to how much? The student in front of her, or him, the teacher, writes 5. She can very well tell the student, change 5 to 4. Would it be just on the teacher, during the test and examination, to correct a student who's writing a wrong answer? Right, but if she has an option that the student doesn't need to do any of that and still no, just no, no, go no. I'm asking a simple question. I'm asking a simple question. The teacher has given the question paper. Right. All the students were informed about it. You're right. For that particular situation, for it's that fine. particular situation, the teacher can tell, dear student, change five to four. What will the other students think about? Unjust. But Correct. God can be just at the same time. He can create a complete, completely different condition. He doesn't have to go ahead with that situation. He's not bound by any situation. Brother saying, God, Almighty God can create something which is perfect and will not make mistake, correct? That right. God has already done, He created the angels. God right. created the angels, the angel never go against any commandment of God. But human being is a better creation than angel. The angels have got no free will of their own. If you have heard my tapes, if you have not heard, I'll tell you now. The angels are a creation of Almighty God, but not the best creation. Almighty God created the human beings. The human beings have a free will to go against God or to follow God. If you have chosen to be a human being, if you disobey his commandments, you go to hell. If you obey his commandments, you are superior than the angel. Because the angel doesn't have a free will of his own, then he follows God. It's nothing great. The human beings are the better creation of Almighty God. Almighty God has given a free will. That's a different question that Almighty God knows. Because he has ilme gab, he has knowledge of the future. He is more superior. So he has created such a creation which has a free will. The fault is of human being, not God. No, but God has created us with that fault. And he knows he not can avoid fault, that. Not fault. It's not fault, brother. It is free will. Why is he giving us a free will when he knows he's going to eventually put these many people in hell? Why is he doing something? That is a different creation. 
Like, would you want to create something which can think on its own, or would Why you want to? Why someone so compassionate be can yeah, also? Brother, that's what I tell you. Time. What you want, God has already created an angel. I am asking you, which is better, an angel following Almighty God or a human being following Almighty God? Which is better? For me, absolutely. If I get a second chance, I would want to be an angel. Why would I risk second going to hell? Second chance, correct. That's why Almighty God says in Surah Araf, chapter number seven, verse number one seventy-two, Almighty God bought all the human beings from the loin of Adam and asked them, "Is there one God?" All agreed. Almighty God says in Surah Hashar, chapter fifty-nine, verse number twenty-one, if Almighty God revealed the Quran on the mountain, the mountain would shut down. Almighty God says in Surah Azab, chapter thirty-three, verse number seventy-two, "It okay. is the human beings who were fools who said we want to be human beings. You and I, you and I were fools. Now you cannot backtrack. Once you said you want to appear for the test, once you read the test paper, nobody test, asked me. That they what? asked Adam and Eve. No, brother. Quran says every human being was asked, and then it is washed off. This memory is washed off. If the memory is away, the test." Almighty God says in the Quran, "Do you want to be a human being? If you become a human being, you can become superior to an angel, or can get inferior. If you don't want to become a human being, just pass." Even we, for argument's sake, even in that case, please let me complete. You ask the question. All right, go ahead. If you interject, how will I answer? Sure, go ahead. So Almighty God asks the human beings, and the Quran says, "We human beings were fools. You and I both were fools who opted." For the test. Now, once you undergo a test, if you follow the commandment after free will, you be superior to an angel. If you disobey Allah, you become inferior to an angel. We wanted to pass with distinction. You and I, you and I. You told I don't remember. Of course, you will not remember. And even I don't remember. But I believe in the Quran. On the day of judgment, Almighty God says, not a single human being will object to the justice of Allah. That we'll come to know on the day of judgment. Only thing we'll say: Please give us one more chance. Almighty God will say it's too late. Because if He wants to give you a new chance, then I'll have to come back in the world again. Again, everyone. So those who failed, He can't get only the failures. So the Quran says no one will ever object on the justice of Allah. They will request Allah give us one more chance. Almighty God says too late. Almighty God gives us chances in this world itself. You make a mistake, Allah gives you a chance to repent. You repent, Allah forgives you. Again, you make a mistake. All the once you die, it's only one. So as far as the first question is concerned, why did God create? Because it's a better creation. Any logical person, including you, has to agree that a person who has the free will is a better creation than a person who has no free will. Only your question you don't remember is perfectly right. When you die, when you are resurrected, that time you and I will meet. Then you will say, "I remember." Even I don't remember now. But I have faith in the Quran that Quran cannot be wrong because scientifically, if you heard my lecture, eighty percent of the Quran is hundred percent matching with science. Twenty percent is ambiguous, neither right, neither wrong. So my logic says, when eighty percent is hundred percent correct, and not even point one percent of the twenty percent is wrong, so my logic says, even this twenty percent would be right. I am a scientific person. I am a logical person. So I believe in the statement of the Quran that we chose. If we wouldn't have chosen, you could have questioned God. Why did you make me a human being? Then right. God would have been at fault. But God says in the Quran, He asked. The mountains were afraid. Everything else was afraid. We human beings opted for this. But do you so, remember being asked? I don't remember being asked. Brother, if you heard my answer, I mean I don't remember. But if you remember the very the test, imagine if a teacher teaches you something. Teacher teaches you something. Teacher gives you the book. The teacher has to take away the book for the test. If the teacher says, "Okay, take the book and answer," where is the test? Okay, but what? After the examination is over, you can go home and check or not. But even before the Bre exam brother, began, God brother, knows. Brother, 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 listen to me. After the examination is over, can you go and check home or not in the textbook? Absolutely. But during the examination, can you check? No. So now the examination is going on, brother. Once it's over, you can check. <laughs> If you tell teacher, teacher, I want to see the textbook. I don't remember. No. During the examination, you cannot refer to the textbook. It will be called cheating. Correct. So once the examination is over, if you don't remember, you tell God. 
What is this illogical? But Quran says not a single human being will object to the justice. Let the test get over. So today, I being a scientific person, I being a logical person, based on my knowledge of science, based on my logic, when I read the other scriptures, and when I read the Quran, I find Quran is the only book, only religious scripture on the face of the earth which passes this test. So therefore, I, being a scientific person, being a logical person, agree, okay, fine. This statement of the Quran also has to be right. I don't remember. That's the test. If I remember, where is the test? So that answers the first part of the question. First part, that saying that God was sadist. God is not sadist. For example, I start a medical college. I want the school students to go to medical. How many students who go to school enter the medical college? Just roughly, can you guess? Few. Surely less than 5%. Less than maybe 1%. So why did you make a college where only 1% can enter? Fine. It is for selected few. So same way God made heaven. Jannah, Jannat e Firdos. Everyone cannot go to Jannat e Firdos. Why not? Sorry? Why not? Why can't every why can't everyone go to medical college? Because it's human capacity. If if humans hey. were capable of being able to Correct. put everyone in medical college, they would. That's the way we are made. The same way everyone cannot become a doctor. Only those who have the capacity, same way everyone cannot go to Janati Firdos, the high levels of paradise. We have to strive. God has given you capacity. If you don't follow his guidance, you cannot. If you follow his guidance to go to Jannah is very easy. If you're intelligent, it's very easy. If you're intelligent. And if you're truthful to yourself. But if you're not truthful to yourself, even a non-intelligent man can go to Jannah. Only thing, you should be truthful. God has given you different options how to follow him. Some people think they are smart. I tell them they are extra smart. If they were smart, they would see it is crystal clear in black and white that this is the word of God. You have to follow it. That's the reason Francis Bacon said, little knowledge of science makes you an atheist. In-depth knowledge of science makes you a believer in God. So I wouldn't say God is sadist. I said we were fools who opted to undergo the test. Not God. God gave you an option. What do you want to be? We chose. So we are responsible, not God. God is not a sadist. We are fools. That's what the Quran says. On the day of judgment, you'll come to know, inshallah, you and I both. Inshallah, if I go to Jannah, inshallah, inshallah, I'll pray to God, I'll thank God. You know, I was a good person, I choose to be a human being. If you pass that, if you fail, then we will curse our own self. Hope that answers the question. The second part? Sorry, what is the second part? That even if I believe how almighty he is, how knowledgeable he is, why is he so bent on convincing us? Look at the mountains, look at the electrons, look at the That's protons. Right. The second part of the question was that why does almighty God give references of the mountain that he's created this? For him it is peanuts. So why is he talking? You know why is he saying? He's saying these peanut things, mountain, they would shudder. You human being who are superior, why don't you understand? Quran says in Surah Hashar chapter 59 verse number 21, had the Quran been revealed on the mountain, the mountain would have fallen down to utter ruin. But to us human beings it makes no difference. Giving these examples to show that these things which are so powerful, the mountains, etc., which has created, would have submitted the will. Why don't you human being do? He's trying to give an example that we are fools. He's not trying to praise himself. And whenever he asks us to praise him or when he says, for we say Allah Akbar, God is the greatest. Do you think it will change Allah? No. Whether you say a thousand times Allah Akbar or a million times, he cannot become greater. He's already the greatest. The reason we say these things is because it is our human mentality, our human nature that we follow the people who are famous, we follow the people who we praise. For example, your mother has a heart attack. There is unknown person on the street who gives you the treatment. And you heard that the best heart specialist in the world is Dr. X. Now will you follow Dr. X's advice? 
or the person on the street who you don't know? Dr. X. Why? Because Dr. X is famous. People know him. He's the best in the world. So the reason in our salah, in our life, we say Allah Akbar. Allah is the greatest. Allah is the most wise. Allah is the most intelligent. Why? If we say that, it doesn't benefit Allah. It benefits us. That if we praise him, we follow him. If we follow, we go to Jannah. To Allah, it makes no difference. Therefore, Allah says, will you not then believe? Will you not then understand? That means the Quran is revealed to the people for understanding. So he's giving this example not to make himself great. He's already the greatest. Whether you say a million times Allah is the greatest, it will not make a difference to Allah. He's telling it to you. Allah says in the Quran, Allah does not require you, you require him. So when we praise him, it is human psychology that the person you praise, person you talk great about, you tend to follow his advice. By following his advice, it will benefit you, it will not benefit him. He is already the greatest, he is already the merciful. So these are rules and regulations laid down. He is our creator, he knows our mindset. You are a student of science, correct? I am also a student of science. The moment I come to know, Allah mentioned these scientific facts which we came to know today, 50 years back, it increases my faith in Allah. Allah says in Surah Fusila, chapter 41, verse 53, Sanuri mayatina fil afaqi wa fi anfusim hatta yatabayna anna ulaq. Soon we shall show them our signs in the furthest regions of the horizons and into their soul until it is clear to them that this is the truth. So Allah is giving these examples so that it benefits us. For him, it makes no difference. It is benefiting us, so he is giving us a chance to follow him so that we can go to heaven. Hope that answers the question, brother. I recognize his power and I understand he's amazing in all that that he's done. But am I expected to be amazed at his achievements at creating this universe? Because for me, for him, it's like a one second job. Correct. Right. So for him, which is one second job, when he tells you not to have alcohol, if I you have alcohol, sure. But am I expected to be amazed but at his creation? No, see, the thing is that he's not there to prove himself better. If you believe that for him it is peanuts, so will a person lie? No. So if he says don't have alcohol, you will not question him. No. Don't have pork, you will not question him. Yeah, but I'm not amazed at his creation because for him it's nothing. Compared to us, it's amazing. For him it's nothing. Right. But compared to us, a person who can create the universe, when he tells me not to have alcohol, I immediately follow. Sure, Amaz I don't mind following him, but do I have to be amazed at his creation, as is said in the Quran? See, as you asked me the question, should I be amazed at the creation? Right. I would say, if I believe human being is a better creation, then yes, I'm amazed, and then I say, Alhamdulillah, he has made me better than that. So if I'm amazed, he made the mountains, he made the stars, he made the sun, ah, but he made Zakir Naik also. He made a human being. And we are the best of creation. So he gives these examples so that we realize what benefit he has given to us. All the favors he has given to us. Talking about the science, talking about the protons, talking about the mountains. Finally he says, human beings are the best creation. So in comparison, we have to agree that our creator has created this human body. The molecules, the DNA, the complex thing, which can never come by chance. So in this way, we are amazed at the creation of the human being. And then we submit to him. If you are not amazed, only by being amazed, we submit that he is our creator, he is worth worshipping. No one else can do that. This is so that we worship him and we pass the test and we go to paradise. Hope that answers the question. If Bill Gates gives me $100, should I be amazed that he has given me that money? Uh, I believe that the question has been answered and unfortunately we are very constricted for time. You are welcome to come back tomorrow, inshallah. As with all of the brothers and sisters, we have come to the end of tonight's session. So please, a very I just big give thank this you. Last, is that if Bill Gates gives you $100, should I be amazed? Will you get amazed? Brother, the question is, why should Bill Gates give you $100? If you tell me a Tom, Dick and Harry gives you $100, nothing to be amazed. Bill Gates gave me $100. It's 
something that he gave you, why did he give you, why not somebody else? Why? The question is, why did he give you, is the question. Okay. If some Tom, Dick and Harry gives you, if a man on the street gave you hundred dollars, Bill Gates. Got it. You got it, no? Got it. I got that. So now you're convinced, huh? Yes, absolutely. That is the answer. So inshallah, I hope that we'll come closer to Islam. So I should not be amazed at the fact that he's given me the money. I should be amazed it's him who's given the money. Alhamdulillah. Got it. So it was worth the time extending. Alhamdulillah. Another extremely common question is, hey Muslims, they allow polygamy, they allow marriage with more than one, one girl. You can have more than one wife. Okay, so what's the problem? The problem is that how can you have sex with more than one girl? Um, isn't everybody on the planet doing that already? Because essentially, tell me, what is the difference between a wife and a girlfriend? Because you're allowed to have as many girlfriends as you want in every country but you're not allowed to have as many wives as you want. So what is the difference between a girlfriend and a wife? The difference is, and get ready for this, the difference is when you're my girlfriend, I could do everything that I want, that I would do with a wife, except that you don't get any of my property legally. So you don't get any of my protection legally. You don't get any share of my wealth legally. Okay, that is what happens when you marry. Marriage is a piece of paper which you're basically telling God that I intend to share my life with her, my property with her, I'm going to make her family my family. That is marriage. That's what translates a girlfriend into a wife, that piece of paper, that little ceremony. Other than that, there's no difference. So if you don't believe in God, for example, I'm talking to the atheists right now, then marriages don't matter really. You could have a girlfriend or a marriage. Marriage is simply asking permission of God to be able to go ahead with whatever you want to do with your wife and vice versa. So that should debunk the idea of polygamy being bad because you're doing polygamy right now except that you're not signing the papers which is even worse right if you think polygamy is bad then polygamy with without papers without protection for that girl that you are having polygamy relationship with is even worse you would have to say anyway the idea that polygamy is bad the idea that having more than one girl is bad so yes and no yes it's bad if you're cheating on your girlfriend if you're cheating on your wife if you're cheating on your friend if you're cheating on your boss if you're cheating with your company cheating is bad so nobody would have a problem with that. That's pretty logical, right? But polygamy does not mean you're cheating on your partner. Polygamy means you're having a relationship with more than one partner and they're both aware of that relationship. Now, let's just say for argument's sake, there's only one in a million girls who are okay with sharing a husband. So what? So what? If it's consensual, it's okay. Is it not? Hence, this whole argument, this whole idea, the whole question is so incredibly stupid. So so moronic that why are you allowed to marry more than one well you are allowed to do the exact same thing without marriage so wow why, why would you even ask that question and secondly if you are marrying somebody that means you are sharing your wealth you are signing a paper you are talking to your first wife that you are planning to take another wife that is something to be commended because most people would not want to take the burden of a marriage and would simply want to do what you would see usually in the western world tiger wood shit most people prefer that as opposed to getting another person and being responsible for her. What is your problem with polygamy now that I've given you this answer? Anybody? My name is Lakshmi. I'm a journalist. Now, the second question is, Muslim men are allowed to marry four or five times, I think, and they don't uh, require their wife's permission, you know, the first wife's permission to marry, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, to marry more number of times. So I actually don't see any logic in this because I believe uh, it's one man, one woman. That's the institution of marriage. So please clarify. Thank you. Now coming to your second question. In Islam, men marry four times, five times, and they don't ask permission from the first five. Why? As far as polygyny is concerned, a man having more than one wife, Islam is the only religion and Quran is the only religious scripture on the face of the earth which says marry only one. There is no religious scripture besides the Quran. I am a student of comparative religion which says marry only one. There is no verse in the Bible, no verse in the Bhagavad Gita, no verse in the Veda which says marry only one except the Quran. If you read 
the Hindu scriptures in Ramayan, the father of Sri Ram, how many wives did he have? How many wives? More than one. More than one. Three wives. Fine. Sri Krishna, according to Mahabharat, how many wives did he had? Unlimited. <laughs> Not unlimited. You don't know your scripture well? No. Did you have four wives? No. I have no idea. Not four, not hundred, not thousand, 16,108 wives. How many wives they had? 16,108. So why can't we Muslims have four? What's the problem? When she Krishna can have 16,108 wives, why can't we have four? Further, if you read, the Vishnu Purana, chapter number 24, verse number 1, it says a Brahmin can have up to four wives. If you read the Jewish scriptures, it gives you permission to have as many wives as you wish. If you read the Christian Bible, it gives you permission to have as many wives as you wish. If you read the Bible, Abraham had three wives. Solomon, how many wives he had? He had 700 wives. It is later on, the church has put a ban that Christians should marry only one, not the Bible. It is the Jewish community married more than one wife. It was in 1950 that chief rabbi passed a synoid that Jews should marry only one. So it is the rabbi, not the Jewish scriptures. And according to Hindu scriptures, you can marry as many as you wish. It is the Indian government in 1954 passed a law called the Hindu Special Marriage Act. Hindu Special Marriage Act, which says Hindu should marry only one. It is not the religious scriptures. It is not Bhagavad Gita. It is not Ramayana. It is not Mahabharata. It is not Veda. It is the Indian Penal Code. The Indian government, which has passed a law in 1954 that Hindus should marry only one. But according to the statistics of the status of the women in Islam, if you read the government documents on page number 6667, it says that Muslims do polygamous marriages. You know what is the percentage in India? 4.3%. How much? In India, 4.3% of the Muslim men do polygamous marriages. The statistic between 1951 to 1961, Hindus, how many? 5.06. 0. 0.7% more than the Muslims in India. According to the Indian government, even though it is prohibited according to the Indian law, yet they do more polygamous marriages than the, than the Muslims. Why? Now, let's analyze what does the Quran say. Quran says in Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse number 3, marry women of your choice in twos, threes, or fours. But if you can't do justice, marry only one. This statement, marry only one, is only given in the Quran and no other religious scripture. It says, Marry a woman of a choice in twos, threes, or fours. But if you can't do justice, marry only one. So if you want to marry more than one woman, one of the criteria of the Quran is you should do justice. If you can't do justice, you should marry only one. Now, what are the reasons, logical reasons a person can think that why has Islam permitted certain men to have more than one wife? Many non-Muslims think it is fard, it is compulsory, for a Muslim man to have more than one woman, to have more than one wife. It's not compulsory, it's optional. It's not fard. It's not compulsory. How many Muslim men do you know who have more than one wife? How many do you know, sister? How many do you know? A few. How many? A few, again. Few means one, two, three, how many? Yeah, at least about three. About three. Have you heard of Dharminder? Yeah. How many wives he has? Two. Muslim or non-Muslim? Non-Muslim. Non-Muslim. Your previous chief minister, what's the name? Jai Lalita. Yes. Hindu or Muslim? Hindu or Muslim? Hindu. Hindu, fine. Now these are famous personalities. Fine. How many famous personalities you know in India who have got more than one wife? The three you know may be locality, fine? Yeah. Local, maybe friend in your neighborhood, maybe your colleague. 
In India, there are more non-Muslims having more than one wife than the Muslims. Now, let us understand what are the logical reasons. Come back to logic now. Now, by nature, if you ask any medical doctor, he will tell you, male and female are born in equal proportion. Girls and boys are born in equal proportion. But any medical doctor, any pediatrician, any children doctor will tell you that the female sex, the female child is stronger than the male child. That's the reason there are more deaths in the male children as compared to female children. So in children's age itself, the female children are much more than the male children. As life grows on, there are people dying due to accidents, due to alcoholism, due to war. There are more males dying as compared to females. Today, if you analyze in the world, there are more females in the world as compared to males. There are few third world countries like India where the male population is more than the female population. And do you know why? The reason is because of female feticide and female infanticide. According to an article, a program which came on BBC by the name Let Her Die, the program was assignment. There was a British reporter by the name of Emily Beckinen. She comes to India and she says that every year in India, more than one million fetuses are being aborted after they identified that they're females. She says more than 3,000 every day. You multiply more than a million every year. According to the Tamil Nadu government hospital report, she gives the statistics, out of 10 females born alive, do you know how many are put to death? Four. Sister, did you know that? Tamil Nadu, your state, your beloved state, according to the government statistics, out of 10 females born alive in the government hospital, four are put to death. There are billboards put in Rajasthan and here, which says that spend 500 rupees and save 500,000 rupees. You know what does it indicate? Spend 500 rupees, do ultrasonography, do amnio sentences, identify the child you're carrying as a female, abort her, and save 5 lakh rupees, 500,000 rupees. Maybe a couple of hundred thousand are bringing her and the remaining hundred thousand in dowry. If you stop this evil practice in India, our beloved country, stop the female infanticide, stop the female feticide, even in India, the population of female will be more than the male population. If you see the rest of the world, if you see New York alone, there are 1 million females more than males. In USA alone, there are 7.8 million females more than males. In UK alone, there are 4 million females more than males. In Germany alone, there are 5 million females more than males. In Russia alone, there are 9 million females more than males. And God alone knows how many millions of females are more than males throughout the world. Suppose I agree with your philosophy, sister, you said, one man, one woman. If I agree with you, sister, with your philosophy, one man, one woman. And suppose my sister happens to be in America, or your sister happens to live in America. And suppose the market is saturated. One man, one woman, saturated. Yet there will be 7.8 million females who will not find life partners. One man, one woman. Now the option for these 7.8 million females is either marry a man who already has a wife or become public property. You say, Dr. Zakir Naik, public property, such a harsh word. Sister, it is the most sophisticated word I can use. I cannot use a more sophisticated word than public property. According to the statistics of America, do you know, on an average, a man, before he settles down with a wife, he has eight different sexual partners. Do you know that? On average, eight. Some may have one, some may have 10, some may have 28 sexual partners before he settles down with one. So the only option remaining, so if my sister happens to live in America, or if your sister happens to live in America, and the option is given to her, and suppose the market is saturated, every man has found a woman for himself. And unfortunately, if my sister, or if your sister happens to be one of the women who has not found a life partner, the only option for them is either marry a man who already has a wife, or become public property. Any modest woman would opt for the first. Sister, what would you opt for your sister? Marrying a man who already has a wife or become public property? 
My sister is too young to be married. So when she grows up and if she happens to go to America, or if you happen to be in America, third choice. What would you prefer for her? You're the elder sister. Would you prefer her becoming public property or marry a man who already has a wife and get equal rights? In Islam, if you have a second wife, you give equal rights. In America, the public property has got no rights. She's degraded. She's dishonored. In Islam, she has an equal right. She gets honor. What would you prefer for a younger sister when she grows up? Sometimes it's difficult to speak the truth, sister, correct? Right? Especially in front of such a large audience. Anyway, I've got your answer, sister. Thank you. And your silence speaks for that. So that's the reason in Islam, sister, men have been allowed to marry more than one wife is to protect the woman, not to degrade her. Regarding a question, is it compulsory that the husband should take the permission of the wife? It's not compulsory because if she wants to protect, if that man wants to protect another woman, a normal woman, I agree with you, sister, no woman under normal circumstances would like to share the husband. We have to agree. This is human nature. But if the woman is a good Muslim, is a good Muslim woman, what she says, let a small loss take place to prevent a big loss. She will say, I know sharing my husband is a loss for me, but I would prefer letting a small loss take place for me to prevent my sister becoming public property. She's a good human being. So she would surely give permission to the husband to marry a second woman, if she's a good Muslim woman. But taking permission is not fard, it is preferable. But at least informing is a requirement so that he does justice between the two wives. Hope that answers the question, sister. Thank you. When I got older, I heard scientists had found evidence of the Big Bang. According to that theory, the entire universe burst out of a single point in an instant of fiery creation. And now that science knows so much about our cosmic origins, what place is there for religious belief in the beginning? I want to know about the Islamic story of creation, so I'm going to Cairo. Islam has deep roots in science. Muslim astronomers were charting the heavens soon after the time of Muhammad. Speak to me about the, the Islamic concept of creation. In Islam, the beginning of the story starts with this massive cloud of smoke. From which the heaven and earth are pulled from inside the smoke. And then the earth after that gets formed into what it looks like uh, before the beings are created. Uh, interestingly, that is very cosmic. Right. In Islam, the moment of creation exists alongside the scientific view of Earth's formation. This is do not the unbelievers see. These atheists, these agnostics, the people who deny the existence of God, can't they see? In other words, Allah expects them to see, to be able to see, to witness. That the heavens and the earth were joined together as one unit of creation. And he split them asunder. Who is he talking to? Who is he addressing? Kafir. Which Kafir? The Badwins of 1400 years ago? No, no. What can the poor man understand? Well, what did he know about the universe, about the creation of the heavens and the earth? What did he know? He only accepted whatever was said. If this was Allah's kalam, amanna saddakna. We hear and we accept. We believe. This was Iman that they had. They didn't have a grasp. Allah is not addressing those unbelievers of the times of Muhammad, or the unbelievers in the Congo, or among the Eskimos who might not believe in God. No, 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 no. He's talking to the men of science, men of learning, 
who are now expounding to the world the theory of creation, that these astronomers with the mighty telescopes, when they're looking into space and they're analyzing the, the movements in the heavens, such a person with his great learning, he says that this universe came into being with a big bang billions of years ago. Because he's watching the universe and he's noticing that these heavenly bodies are receding from a central place somewhere, is all going out in all directions, moving away, away, away. Like a balloon. When you blow it gets bigger and bigger, something like that is happening in the skies, in the heavens. These galaxies, they're receding from us at a faster and faster speed. At a faster and faster speed. So they say, that this universe came into being with a big bang. A big bang theory. Who says that? The most learned men of science, astronomers. They say, hey, where did you get these funny ideas from? This fairy tale about a big bang. So no, 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 it is not fairy tale. These are facts. Demonstrable facts. We can demonstrate it, show you what is happening. And from that we can conclude if we had a film and put in reverse gear, so we could see what is happening is all coming back again. With the way it's going out, the balloon, if we can deflate it, you'll see it all coming back to one central point. And there was a big bang. When did you discover this? He said yesterday. Because 50 years is yesterday in the history of man. What is 50 years? Nothing. As an, an illiterate man in the desert, a person who didn't know how to read or write, a person who couldn't sign his own name, he could have, couldn't have known this, could he? He says, no, never. Impossible. Man doesn't know astronomy. He hasn't got the instruments. He hasn't got a telescope. Nothing. In the desert. And among an only people, illiterate people. And he is now telling you, this man in the desert, 1,400 years ago, Huma, and he split them asunder. A new biologist, people who study minute life, microplotism, the amoeba, he says, you know, life originated in the sea, water. Without this water, no life. And they tell you, look, we look back in time, in space, they say, look, this is how life originated. There was a time when this earth was a molten mass, nothing could have survived here, everything boiling, boiling, and over a period of billions of years, you know, the vapors went up and came down, and the vapors went up and came down and started cooling this earth, it took a billions of years, and then started life, germs, plant life, and all these things started. At one time, there was nothing, and then it started. Where did life come from? He says, from the sea. Certain chemical action, the sun playing its part, and life started from there. Mm -hmm. When did you find this out? It's yesterday. Because 50 years is yesterday in the history of man. An illiterate man in the desert, he couldn't have known that, could he? He says, no, never. So, well, listen. So, وَجَعَلْنَا مِنَ الْمَاءِ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ حَيْءٍ And he has made from water every living thing. Say, will you then not believe? Who? You, men of science, you, men of learning, you kafir, you atheist, you agnostic, why can't you believe? Then there's of course the famous ayah about the heavens and the earth, which is the Arabic expression for the universe, heavens and the earth. The word ratqan in Arabic means something that is fused and inseparable. Fused and inseparable. The word ratq was used when a mother is carrying a child because the mother and the child are inseparable. And when she would start delivering, the other was, word was used, fataqa. Fataqa is the part, the time for her to start parting. Literally her body is parting up and she's parting from her child. So the ayah says the heavens and the earth used to be fused and inseparable and then we caused them to come apart. Meaning there was the universe in the, in origin in original in its original form was a fused united body, some sort of matter, and then it became and spread out, and then the words used later on it spread out far and wide. 
So it's close to, very close to, uh, interestingly close to the Big Bang Theory. Uh, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the beginning of the heavens. As if that is not enough. Look at the frontier project of NASA right now. They're looking for a sign of life on Mars. Spending about probably close to a billion dollars. Uh, 600 billion dollars on it. Or going, going one trillion dollars. What are they looking for as a sign of life? Are they looking for emails, furniture? You know, they're looking for water. Because you find water, you're going to find life. The same verse in Surah Al-Anbiya, chapter 21, that told us how the universe started, is telling us what is the source of life in the universe, the continuation of it, and out of water, we have created every living thing. How would Prophet Muhammad know that? And as if that is not enough, you go to Surah Fusilat, chapter 41, the scientists would tell you that massive explosion, the stars and the planets did not come out like that, it was in the condition of smoke, huge light years areas of smoke and then it got so intense inside it that the stars are born and the planets are born and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala settled to the heavens when it was in a condition of smoke and said to it and to earth come they said we come willingly how would anyone imagine that you know the hills and the camels and the, the planet were smoke but if it is the creator of heavens and earth, then, and that is being revealed to Prophet Muhammad then you know it. And then the third phase, just recently, scientists discovered that that Big Bang is still happening. That explosion, the edges of the universe are still echoing and expanding at the edges of the universe. In Surah al variyat chapter 51, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, بَنَيْنَاهَا بَأَيْدٍ وَإِنَّا لَمُوسِعُونَ and the skies, the heavens, we have created with our own powers and we are expanding them. This is the creator talk. Creator 1400 years ago in the Quran. And then subhanAllah the Quran is filled. Surah 51 verse 47. Mm -hmm. As for the, uh, uh, the sky or the heavens, uh, we have created it, we have built it, and we are expanding it. Uh, so this, this uh, seems to be very clear that God here is, uh, is doing the work. He is uh, the active participle here, Musi, we, we are expanding it. In fact, I may add here, if you allow me, that uh, uh, some of the classical commentators were puzzled by the verse. And uh, they said, well, it, it just means that it is large or that mm. God is uh, filling it with more provisions because they couldn't conceive like the universe is expanding fast as it is already. Uh, so they avoided the obvious meaning. But as Maurice Bouquet has uh, shown in his book, The Bible, Quran and Science, uh, that is the literal meaning uh, and that literal meaning actually makes sense to us today because we know today that the universe is expanding since the 1930, 1920s. Uh, this was discovered and it became a firm theory uh, and since 1964 uh, with the discovery of cosmic microwave background radiation uh, because that proved uh, once and for all that the universe is in fact expanding uh, from a big bang origin that occurred some maybe 14 uh, million years ago. Just a few decades ago, there was a conflict between our theology as Muslims and physics. Physicists believed in the steady state theory. They believed that the universe had no beginning. And in the Quran, it's clear the universe had a beginning. Now, the steady state theory has gone through a paradigm shift and we have the Big Bang theory now with 17 different models. And it's more in line with the Quran. But what would we as Muslims have done 50, 70, 80 years ago when the steady state theory was accepted by everyone, including people like Einstein? Would we just go around trying to argue with every single physicist that's wrong? No. We would say, well, this is a prevailing idea in physics and we accept it as Muslims and we accept it as a working model, working theory, working paradigm. But we don't believe it to be absolutely true. Maybe something will come in the future which will challenge it, which is actually what happened. The correct thing Islamically and the correct thing, even if you're not Muslim, is to understand science only gives you working models which can then change. And we need to understand we have a duty to be involved in science more than I would say other religious faiths or even people who are non-religious. Why? Because science as a method came from the Muslim world. The first scientist in history, according to even mainstream secular academics, historians like David C. Lindbergh, the first scientist in history and the first person who came up with the scientific method which we're using till today to make all of our technology is Hassan ibn Haytham, who lived approximately a thousand years ago, hundreds of years before Francis Bacon or Galileo or any of these characters. 
And he was not only a scientist, he was also a Quranic scholar. And he was the first person who actually, uh, and one of the things that he said was, in his biography, what drove him to do science was to become closer to Allah, become closer to God. That was actually his objective. And sadly nowadays, science is associated with atheism. But as we know, the more you discover about something, the more you discover about the human body, the more you discover about the universe, if anything, it should lead you towards God, not away from God. Science explains how God explains for us why anything exists in the first place. So discovering how doesn't challenge why. Good evening again, everyone. Uh, it was amazing to see how much uh, signs that the glorious Quran contained after your talk. But in most of the examples from the Quran which you gave, it is very difficult to comprehend what the Quran tells before actually the science discovers or invents that particular phenomenon. For example, you said, in the honey, there is healing of humanity in the Quran. And you mentioned it as it's about if a person is maybe say poisoned with a plant, the honey of the plant should be taken. So what is the use, say, of a almighty holy scripture talking about things which you are only able to comprehend after the real invention is made by science? So can you tell me now something from the Quran which will be invented by science later or yet to be invented? Well, that's a very good question that I've mentioned many things about science indirectly saying all this was already discovered earlier. And if Quran says something and after science has discovered, so what's the use? Can you tell me something which science hasn't discovered? Brother, that's the reason the Arabs were advanced in the field of astronomy. Why? Because they read the Quran. The Quran has a lot of information on astronomy. So when they read the Quran, they try and do more investigation. They do more research. And that's how they come to know. Quran is a telegraphic message. See, the book of science, only on one subject, in medicine, one subject only requires volumes. So if that way the Quran is, this Quran, most of the human beings, they don't like to read. Oh, such a big book. So if God Almighty wrote in detail, then even a big building, you will require thousands of buildings to contain the message of the Quran. Quran is telegraphic message. So in telegraphic message, many of the Muslims, they read the Quran and they made advances in science. That's the reason we find if you go back into history, the Muslims advanced in science and technology. But you pose the question, forget about the past. What about today? All what I've mentioned has been discovered earlier, but many of them were discovered by Muslims, some by non-Muslims, some by Europeans. What about things which science hasn't discovered? Fine. First, I'll tell you those things which science hasn't established, but yet there are high chances, which Quran has testified, and I believe in it. For example, Quran says in Surah Shura, chapter number 42, verse number 29, that it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who has created the creatures in the heaven and the earth and has placed creatures in them. So Quran says there is life besides this earth. Today science hasn't proved there is life besides this earth. Scientists say there are high possibilities that life will be there besides this earth. So they're sending rockets, spaceships, moon, Mars, Quran says there's life besides this earth, I believe in it. Science may discover it tomorrow, after five years, after 10 years, after 100 years, Quran says, I believe in it. Today, there are many hypotheses. How the world will end. It says that the sun will become big and the world will end. The mountains will fall down. The mountains will become smooth. The ocean will swell up. The world will enter into a black hole. Many hypotheses. Many of these hypotheses, not all, they match with the Quran. Quran says in Surah Qiyamah, chapter number 75, verse number 8 and 9, that the sun and the moon, they will join together. The sun will be buried in darkness. If you read Surah Takhvir, chapter number 81, verse 1, 2 and 3, it says that the stars will fall down and lose their luster. The mountains will fall down to utter ruin. The ocean will swell up. It's mentioned in Surah Infitar, chapter number 82, verse number 1 and 2 and 3, again the ocean will swell up the stars will fall down. Similar to many of the hypotheses. But Quran says, I believe in it. Quran further says, 
in Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 104. We have created this creation. We will destroy it and create a new creation. Science hasn't discovered that yet. Quran speaks about life after death. Science hasn't proved that yet. Quran speaks about heaven and hell. Science hasn't proved about that. Quran speaks about jinn. Today, psychologists say extraterrestrial power. There are some people who get possessed with jinns. Quran speaks about that. Quran speaks the first man on the earth, while Adam, peace be upon him. Science hasn't proved. There are high possibilities science will prove. Now, you may ask me, that brother, Zakir, you gave such a good talk on science and technology with 100% solid proof. You believe in life after death? You believe in jinn? You believe in heaven and hell? You a doctor? Isn't this unscientific? I said, no, brother. I believe that it is scientific. Suppose whatever the Quran has mentioned, 80% has proved to be 100% correct. I spoke about astronomy, about geology, water cycle, oceanography, botany, biology, zoology. So just hypothetically, 80% what the Quran has mentioned, suppose, has been proved to be 100% correct. The remaining 20% is ambiguous. Neither right, neither wrong. Not even 0.1% of that 20% which is ambiguous has been proved to be wrong. There is not a single verse of the Quran which can be proved false by established science. Hypothesis. So my logic says when 80% is 100% correct and the remaining 20% is ambiguous, but not even 0.1% of that 20% is proved wrong. So my logic says that even that 20% inshallah will be correct. If not today, tomorrow, after 50 years, after 100 years, after 1000 years, Allah alam, God knows, they will prove there is life after death. They will prove there is jinn. They will prove there is hell. There is proof there is heaven, and so on and so forth. I can give another lecture on things which science hasn't proved, but inshallah will prove. Hope that answers the question. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, doctor. Uh, it's my honor to uh, sitting here, uh, sorry, to stand here asking this question. And at the same time, I'm very sad to ask this question. If the Quran is uh, a book of the guidance and the Islam is, uh, is a religion of the, of the knowledge and, and all this, then why we are Muslim as a nation, as a majority? We are standing in the back among the nations. Uh, why when we compare uh, our nation with other nations, we see a big hole between, between us and them? The brother asked a very good question, very important question, very relevant question. <laughs> that if Quran has so much of information regarding science technology, it's a book of knowledge, book of guidance, then why are we Muslims backward? It's a very good question. The reason is, if we look back into the history from the 8th to the 10th century, we read in the historical books, the Europeans, they called it as the Dark Ages. Dark for whom? Dark for the Europeans. The Arabs, the, ad the advancement they made in science and technology was phenomenal. If you had to know about science, if you want to do research of science, you had to learn Arabic. Like how today we learn English. At that time, the Muslims were on top of the world because we were close to Quran and Sunnah. Today, the reason the Muslims are backward is because we are far away from Quran and Sunnah. So Quran is not to blame. You and I are to blame. If you read in the books of history and books of science, I said in my lecture, Ibn Nafis, Ibn Nafis, 600 years after the Quran was revealed, was the first to describe the blood circulation. In that textbook, we know about William Harvey, we don't know about Ibn Nafis. So two reasons is there. Number one, Muslims have gone away from Quran Sunnah. Number two, media. You know, media also plays a big role in it. In our textbook, in my school, I never heard about Ibn Nafis. After when I did research, I came to know. In my textbook was mentioned William Harvey. The first person who drew the world map of the world was Al Idrusi. In 1154, he was a Muslim. 
Do you know the numbers that we have? One, two, three, four. What's it called? What's it called? One, two, three, four. What is it called? Say loudly. Arabic numerals. How we have Roman numerals? One, two. Arabic numerals. Why? Because zero was first introduced by the Indian. The Arabs took it up, put a decimal point, and we have the Arabic numerals. If you know about Alaptusi, he was the one who discovered the Pythagoras theorem, which we learn in school. We learn Pythagoras theorem. We don't know the name of Alaptusi. The square of the hypotenuse is equal in a triangle. The square of the hypotenuse is equal to the sum of the other two sides of the triangle. Do you remember or you've forgotten? You remember, na? Mashallah, good student. Who was the person who discovered it? Now you came to know, correct? Better late than never. Alaptusi, Muslim. Trigonometry. We learn trigonometry. Who is the main person of trigonometry? Al Biruni. We learn chemistry. Who is the father of chemistry? We know Geber. Geber. It's not Geber. It is Jaber. Jaber ibn Hayyan. They want to, you know, change the name, westernize it. Geber. So Geber looks like a westerner. Sounds like a westerner. Correct? It is Jaber. Jaber ibn Hayyan. He is the father of chemistry. Wrote more than two hundred pages, two thousand pages. He was the first who distilled alcohol. Alcohol comes from the Arabic word algul. Alcohol is Arabic. Algul meaning evil spirit. He distilled it. How many people know about alkindi? At a time when Newton, who is the biggest scientist in the world history, Newton said all laws are absolute. Alkindi said no, all laws are not absolute; they are relative. Later on, Albert Einstein came. All have heard about Einstein. How many of us have heard about Alkindi? The two brothers, Muhammad Ahmed and Hasan Shakir, they told the area of the Earth from an angle at the Red Sea. At a time when we didn't even know sure whether the Earth was spherical or not. At that time, they told the area of the Earth, which was quite accurate. If you read about Ali ibn Abbas, he wrote two thousand pages on medicine. If you know about Ali ibn Sina, I've seen, I've seen a sound like a Western name. It's Ali ibn Sina, Aristotle of the East. You can keep on giving examples. Muslims on top of the world because we were close to Quran and Sunnah. Today we are far away from the Quran and Sunnah. That time, if you wanted to get advanced in science and technology, it was compulsory you learned Arabic. Arabic was the language on top of the world. Today, where is it? Who's to blame? We are to blame. So, my request to all the Muslim brothers and sisters: you go back to the Quran, study the Quran. Quran is the most positive book in the world. It's a proclamation to humanity. It's a fountain of mercy and wisdom. It's a warning to the heedless. It's a guide to the erring. It's an assurance to those in doubt. It's a solace to the suffering and a hope to those in despair. You can get all these benefits only if you read the Quran with understanding. If you don't know Arabic, read the translation of the Quran in the language you understand the best. Implement it, inshallah, it will be a guidance for you for your full life. And you see a life change. Hope that answers the question. Next question is from Shamir from Kerala, India. Sir, one atheist has asked that: Can God create a heavy rock that He Himself cannot lift? This is a common question that was asked to me also in my school days. And my college days, that can God create a rock which He cannot lift? To reply to this question, I normally ask that atheist, "That do you know how to drive?" And he says, yes, "I know how to drive a car. Can you take a left turn?" Whenever I tell you, whenever you tell me, I can take a left turn. You know how to drive a car? Yes. Can you take a right turn? Whenever I tell you, yes. Whenever you tell me, I can take a right turn. The person is expert. In driving a car, or if he's expert in riding a motorcycle, okay, tell him. Can you take a left turn whenever I tell you? 
When you come at a crossroad, yes, I can take a left turn whenever you tell me, whenever I come at a crossroad. If you come at a crossroad, if I tell you right turn, will you take a right turn? He said, yes, I can take a right turn. I said, okay, now, good. Now, when you come at a crossroad, take a left right turn. The atheist will say, what is a left right turn? Take a left right turn. He will say, I cannot take a left right turn. Just now you told me, you can take a left turn whenever I tell you. You can take a right turn whenever I tell you. Now take a left right turn. Then he understands what I'm telling him is illogical. Yes, he can take a left turn whenever he wants. He can take a right turn whenever he wants. But left and right are two opposing things. You cannot do at the same time. So if you ask, can God create anything? He said, yes, God can create anything. Can he lift anything and everything? Yes, he can lift anything and everything. Can he create a rock which he cannot lift? It is illogical. Yes, God can create whatever he wants. Yes, he can lift whatever he wants. Now you're telling, can God create a rock which he cannot lift? So I asked the atheist, why don't you take a left right turn? It's like telling that can God create a tall short man? Yes, God can create a tall man, he can create a short man. Can he create a tall short man? There are two opposing things that are meaningless. Can God make a fat thin man? God can make a fat man. God can make a thin man. God can make a fat man into a thin man. He can make a thin man into a fat man. But fat thin man, these are illogical things. So the question is illogical. The atheist doesn't know the qualities of God. Yes, this question can be asked to a human being, no problem. Because a human being cannot create everything. A human being cannot lift everything. So if this question is asked to a human being, it makes sense. But the atheist doesn't know the concept of God. That's the reason he's asking this question. So I asked that atheist, can you take a left turn? He said, yes. Can you take a right turn? He said, yes. Can you take a left right turn? He said, no. So now he's trapped. So similarly, this question saying, can God create a heavy rock which he cannot lift is an illogical question. So you can answer an illogical question by asking an illogical question back to the questioner. And this way, inshallah, he will realize his mistake. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is all powerful. He can do what he wants. But he will not do ungodly things. Hope that answers the question.